My childhood was spent in the frosty realm of the Arctic. In my hometown, if the night was clear, it was ordinary to witness a variety of peculiar lights dancing across the sky. The Arctic winters are long, affording us more time to admire the starlit expanse. It's a breathtaking spectacle, provided you can endure the biting chill. I often ventured a few kilometers outside the town on a snowmobile, powered it down, and laid on the snow, enveloped by the tranquility, the only interruption being the occasional whispering breeze. The northern lights, or aurora borealis, were also a frequent sight. Not a daily event, but they occurred often enough to become a part of our lives, unless they put up an exceptionally grand show. One particular night, I decided, without seeking my parents' permission, to take their snowmobile for one of my midnight jaunts. I navigated a few kilometers beyond the town, over the hills, seeking a spot untouched by the town's light pollution. Upon reaching the spot, I switched off the snowmobile and nestled into a comfortable position to gaze at the sky and reflect on life. The view was rather ordinary, satellites gliding across, an uninspiring display of magnetic field disturbances, and so on. That's when an odd clicking sound started to manifest. My initial assumption was that it was the snowmobile's engine cooling down, which in the cold contracts and expands quite a bit. However, the sound wasn't emanating from that direction. I then speculated it could be a nearby wild animal, which meant that I had to leave promptly. But the rhythmic nature of the clicking was too regular for any animal to make. The noise seemed mechanical, and more perplexingly, it was coming from above. Naturally, I looked up to identify the source. The scene was familiar. Stars, northern lights, a languid satellite, all ordinary. But before I could disregard it and return home, I noticed something unusual in the Aurora Borealis. There were three distinct points of light, growing increasingly brighter. Initially, I dismissed them as unusually symmetrical stars, but I was mistaken. The clicking sound in my head amplified from a soft pen tapping to the clattering of billiard balls. Then, it all ceased. The lights vanished, the clicking subsided, and except for being somewhat frozen and petrified, I was unharmed. I hopped back onto the snowmobile, wondering if I was losing my mind. It took longer than usual to start the machine, which raised my anxiety, but soon I was en route back to town. Various plausible explanations for the incident raced through my mind. A helicopter from the mine, peculiar behavior of the northern lights and such. I reached home to find it dark. This was odd since it wasn't that late when I departed. I quietly entered the house, shed my winter gear, and found the house eerily silent. With my parents being teachers, they were typically up late, grading papers or watching TV. My goal was to slip into bed unnoticed, which, to my relief, I managed to do easily. I was setting my alarm for the next day, when the reality of the situation hit me. The sluggish engine, the cold stiffness, the empty house during what felt like a brief ride. When I departed, it was nearing 11 o'clock p.m., but now I saw that it was almost six in the morning. I had been entranced by clicking lights for nearly seven hours. I didn't sleep that night, and I no longer embark on late night snowmobile expeditions. I've had many paranormal experiences growing up, and none can be compared to the other. But on this night, I saw something that I never thought I could see with my own eyes. I slept over at a friend's house one night, and that night as I laid on the floor next to her bed, 
my head by her feet facing the stairs, I closed my eyes to go to sleep. That's when I could feel someone staring at me. Their presence was dark, and something told me that I should open my eyes. And there he stood, at the top of the attic stairs. I couldn't see his face, nor his body, but just the outline of him, a completely dark shadow of a man. He stood over us, staring a hole through my very soul, it felt like, and I, completely unaware of how unreal he was, couldn't move, couldn't blink. I could only stare back. It wasn't until what seemed like minutes passed that I was able somehow to close my eyes again and fall back to sleep. The next morning, I had asked my friend if her siblings had one of their guy friends over, being that one of her sister's rooms was next to hers in the attic. She said no, nobody had been in the attic but us that night. I was confused. I told her about the man that I had seen. At that point, I still thought it was a real person. She turned pale white. She goes on to say how she felt like somebody was holding her down. She couldn't move, and she couldn't breathe. This apparently had happened in the night, but she didn't say anything because she thought I might judge her or something. Later on that day, her older sister, who we eventually told the story to as well, had told us about the man who had lived and died in that house years before their mother bought it. It was a man, in his early 30s. He ended up killing all of his children, and then himself. Since then, he's haunted the house and would always bother the females that stayed there. His children were all daughters. All she knew about that man is that nobody knows why he did it. I know that whoever this thing was, if it was the man or something else, it was paranormal in nature, but what I saw that night was tangible and real, and I will never forget it. An Aswang is a monster in Filipino mythology that preys on pregnant women. Unlike the grisly attacks usually shown in horror movies, however, these monsters apparently just prey on the life essence of the unborn baby until it dies and the mother miscarries. The scary part is that these monsters are also part human, meaning that during the day, they could literally be anyone. This happened in Metro Manila in around 2011. My cousin told me, the old man with the new neighbors asked me if he were pregnant. I was shocked. I never even told my family yet. I was 21 and worked nights in a call center. I never go outside when I'm home and I was only a few weeks along, so I know I wasn't showing yet. How did this nosy old man know? She said the neighbors were new in town, coming from one of the more popular provinces in the Philippines, where witchcraft and aswans are still the norm. They were friendly enough though, so no one really had anything bad to say about them other than the nasty rumors that they knew about Aswan. When I was about eight months along, I was watching late night TV with my brother at around 2 a.m. Something big landed on our tin roof, strong enough to rattle the windows. My brother and I looked at each other with wide eyes as we listened to the footsteps. Yes, footsteps. Stop right above me. I was never a prayerful person, but at that moment I called on gods and saints and angels and anything to protect my baby. Then I remembered my grandmother's story about how she escaped an Aswang attack by placing a pillow between her legs to mask the baby's scent. So I did just that. We had no idea how long we waited. Seconds? Minutes? But then we heard another jump and silence. Until this very day, I'm glad that my brother was with me to vouch for me. I still couldn't believe that it happened and that it happened to me. Then I remembered the nosy old man. Could it have been him? Was he really an Aswang? Something weird and mysterious and unfinished, I suppose, but all's well that ends well, right?
I have an attic in my house, and ever since I was young, I hated going up there. It was dark, as there was no light up there, and it was always absolutely freezing. It had a really bad energy, and my anxiety would skyrocket whenever I had to go up there with my dad. It felt like someone had set a timer, and time was running out, if that makes sense. Like I had to get out of there as soon as possible, or something really bad would happen. In 2016, my parents decided to convert the attic and make it their bedroom. After this happened, I noticed a lot of unexplainable things going on. The first. One day, I was off school, and I was home alone. I was lying on my bed watching the Jeremy Kyle show, with both of my cats on the bed with me. Then I heard what sounded like somebody walking down the stairs from the attic. It's a very distinct sound, and I knew what it was. I paused the video and listened. I didn't hear anything, so I continued watching, now a little on edge. Two minutes later, I heard the footsteps again. My cat's ears perked up, and both of them were staring at my door. Peanut, my cat, started hissing and meowing and went to the end of my bed to hide. At this point, I was tearing up. I somehow managed to get out of bed and pull my drawers in front of the door. I sat in front of the door and called my dad, sobbing. I explained to him what was happening, and he said to get out of my room and look. Hell no. I begged him to call my neighbors to come in and get me. It was only after I called my dad five times he kept hanging up on me, that he finally called my neighbors. When my neighbors came in, they have a key, I flew down the stairs sobbing and shaking. My neighbor checked the entire house, but nobody was there. I didn't feel safe staying home for weeks after this. The second. My best friend and I would hang out after school at my house most days, and whenever we did, we would always hear noises from upstairs. One time, in particular, we were in the kitchen making noodles, and we heard banging upstairs. I assumed it was my cat and didn't think anything of it. My friend then shushed me and told me to listen. From upstairs, I could hear the sound of someone opening and closing a chest of drawers, and slamming my wardrobe doors. Now, my cats are loud and clever, but how does a cat open a drawer? It's a very distinct sound. So we ended up waiting in my back garden, holding a paint scraper and a knife until my dad came home. The third. This is by far one of the scariest stories. My dad, my sister, and I were all home. My dad called up the stairs to me and said he was going to the shops. Once he left, I went downstairs to grab some food. I asked my sister if she wanted anything to eat and she said yes. She was in the front room, so I was talking to her from the kitchen. My dad knocked on the door, and I yelled at her to get it. She didn't. I went to get the door, telling her off for being lazy. When I opened the door, in came my dad and my sister. After months of noises, banging, hearing people talking, and walking around when I was home alone, I was sick of it. I felt anxious to be in my own home, and I had other things to worry about. So one day, I decided to try to talk to whatever it was that was in that house. I didn't use a Ouija board or anything like that. I just sat on my stairs and had a chat, I guess. I told them that I respected that they were in this house before, but that they were scaring me and stressing me out. I asked if they would be able to leave or, at the very least, to stop scaring me. After this, I've never had anything happen in my house. No banging, no noises, nothing. So, I'm currently 16 and this happened when I was three. I'm from New Zealand. 
We have this RNZAF Air Force Base called Ohakia. Apparently, a lot of really mysterious things happen around Air Force bases, so I'm not sure if this is common or what. But it may be 2.30 in the morning. My dad and mom and I are in the car driving back from Wellington. I have family there. And we're maybe 10 seconds past the base of this tree. Well, it's a tree-like thing. Those big, tall bush tree things that farms use for privacy. All of a sudden, there's a light slowly moving along the tree line. My dad thought it could have been a farmer out trimming hedges, but my mom says, not at nearly three in the morning. So we pull off to this rest area and watch this light. It's completely stopped moving and it's just spinning when another light joins it and spins in a counterclockwise triangle. Maybe two minutes later, another comes from literally thin air and joins the triangle, now having three points, and they just spin and spin and spin. Then they stop, and then they start again. After about five minutes, which seems like 10 years, they stop again and stay still for maybe five seconds. Then one flies straight up into the sky and disappears at warp speed. The other two lights just keep spinning when another flies off to the right and disappears. So now it's back to just one light spinning, it starts to move along the tree line again, and then it just flies off to the left and disappears also, never to be seen again. All this started and ended within 15 minutes. After that, we just drove back, but we're all looking around, amazed and terrified. To this day, we've never seen anything else like it. Over the course of two years, I've had weird dreams about a very specific creature lurking in the attic. It always felt malevolent. Now, I don't know if it's an actual thing or my subconscious messing with me, but it deeply unsettled me in ways that my dreams almost never do. As someone who is always aware that they're dreaming, even dreams where I'm being hunted down don't scare me, but this does. There have been so many dreams about it, but a few stick out in my head. The least threatening one was a dream where I'm playing video games in my room. I glance out of my bedroom door to see an arm dangling from the opening into the attic. The hand moves like it's beckoning me to come closer. I don't, because obviously, but I watch it. It never leaves the attic, but it keeps trying to get me to go to it. Another dream is that I'm in a house I've never been in. My sister and nieces are in this house with me, and I get the impression that it's threatening my family. I'm angry, so I get vocally aggressive and I get my family out of there, and I go back to confront the thing. I see it, for the first time in all the dreams I had. It looked like a woman with light purple skin and dreadlocks. I don't remember how this dream ended, but there were more dreams after, never including my family again, just me. The most intense encounter I had was a dream where the attic was right above the bed I was sleeping in. I was lying there, very aware that it was watching me. I figured if I ignored it, it would go away. Wrong. It slowly reached down and pulled the covers off of me. After a few minutes of lying there, cold, trying to decide if it was safe to pull the blanket back up, it grabs me by the throat and lifts me up about a foot off the bed and begins to choke me. I felt like my lungs were going to burst when it finally let go and let me fall back onto the bed, gasping for breath. I don't know how many dreams I've had since this one or if it was the last, but I know it's been at least six months since I've had a dream about it. I'm very uneasy around addicts now and I always expect to look up and see it again when I pass underneath one, awake or not. Even right now, I keep throwing glances at the attic door right outside my bedroom. Nothing's there, of course, but it's still on my mind.
If this thing is not my subconscious and it's an actual entity, I have no idea what it could be. In my limited experience with the paranormal, I've never encountered anything that felt malevolent before. My hope is that my brain just decided it wanted to be terrified of addicts, or that this thing got bored with me and left forever. When I was younger, about nine, my parents and all of my siblings went on vacation to Germany, while me, my sister who is three years older than me, and my brother, who was in high school at the time, stayed home. We had our next door neighbors babysitting us. I live out in the country on 18 acres, so nobody is very close to us besides them. Anyway, my house has always been a little bit creepy in certain parts but it comes and goes. The night before everything happened, my neighbor Fred fixed all of the locks in the house, specifically this one door by my parents' bedroom that we never use. I think I've probably used that door a total of 10 times, and I've lived here for 11 years. Their bedroom is on the first floor, and everybody else's is on the second. So he fixed all the locks and then latched them all shut. We only ever used the side door by the garage and the front door. So the next day we all went to school, and my sister and I went to our singing and dancing group after that. Rachel, who was watching us, drove us. Fred worked, and we picked him up on our way home, so just my brother was home. His room is right next to the attic. So we all get home from being gone all day, and my brother is freaking out. He said that while he was sleeping, the attic door, so to speak, fell onto the floor by his room. To get to the attic, you have to stand on a ladder, and you have to push the door up because it rests on a border on the wall. You have to slide the door up to sit on the floor of the attic, and this door fell down onto the floor, which is wild because to do that, it would have had to have been turned sideways and nobody was home. We all get home, and every single door in that house is wide open. There are five different doors on the first floor, so everybody's freaking out, wondering what happened, and we go upstairs and see the door sitting on the floor. Everybody goes into my parents' room, and I'm walking from the kitchen to their room. I hear my name being called very quietly from upstairs. I walked into the room, and everybody else was in the room too. Nobody was upstairs. Nobody could have been calling me. It could have been an intruder or somebody trying to steal, but nothing was missing. And that hasn't been the only scary thing that's happened in my house. Either way, it gave us all quite the fright. I'm pretty sure my roommate's house is haunted, but they don't believe in ghosts or souls much, so they don't think much of the weird things that happen around here. You can clearly hear footsteps in the attic. I used to live in an apartment, so you can tell what different sounds are when you hear them. With that, they are very distinctly the footsteps of someone pacing in the attic. There's only one way in or out of it, in my roommate's room so I know it's not some squatter or something like that. Things in the house move around on their own too. It happens in front of my friend and I a lot, to the point where we're kind of used to it. Even though we're used to it, I would be more at peace with it if I knew more about the spirits here. Any attempt to contact them has failed, so I assume they just don't want to talk. I haven't had any negative encounters with the spirit though. The worst I've had is probably knocking over some stuff from the couch. I would still like to know who or what else is here though, if that's not too much to ask. A 
I would like to preface this story by saying that I don't believe in the paranormal, but I can find no reasonable explanation as to what is causing this. Hopefully somebody is able to offer some idea of what it could be. Before my parents bought our house, the entryway to the attic used to be in what is now my closet. It got sealed up with a board and there's no way to get in there now through my room. Instead, you have to use stairs that you can bring down in the hallway to get up there. So there shouldn't be anything in my closet or in the area above my closet in the attic. Yet I can hear the distinctive sound of something scratching in there. I looked through the closet and it's not at all big. You can barely fit two people inside of it. And I can't figure out what's making that noise. The only way into the attic is through the stairs, and the stairs, like I said, are in the hallway outside of my door. I would have to have heard them being brought down, and I never do. Also, the attic is pretty much filled with insulation, making it virtually impossible to walk around up there. So what the hell's making that noise? I have no idea how an animal could get up there either, since it's basically blocked off from the rest of the house and nobody's been up there in years. The noise is very loud and it keeps me awake. I can hear it even when I have headphones on with the volume all the way up. It honest to god sounds like something is trying to get out of the attic. Edit. We finally had exterminators come and there were no evidence of rodents or anything else for that matter. I haven't been at that house in a month because I've been at my mom's, so I can't say whether or not the scratching has continued. This is unrelated, but maybe relevant. The fan in my room is disconnected from power. The circuit that powers it is an open circuit, so no electricity should go to the fan. The motor in the fan is broken as well, so it shouldn't be able to turn on. Yet sometimes at night, it will. There's no way to turn it off but to wait for it to stop on its own. I've also caught this happening with the kitchen fan, which can only be turned on with a remote, that has no batteries in it. This happened two summers ago. It's short, but confounding. I was with two friends in my truck. I was driving, and it was dark, but not necessarily late, probably about 10 p.m. We were traveling to Page, Arizona, Lake Powell area, from Durango, Colorado, and we had to pass through Cayenta, Arizona, part of the Navajo Reservation. Now, I had been to Cayenta before several years prior with a friend of mine who grew up there. We spent an entire day just having a great time with his people, but as soon as the sun started dropping, his mother and grandmother were insisting that we get off the reservation before dark. I knew it had a reputation for the weird, as many reservations do at night. At least that's what I'm told. Flash forward to this trip, and my two friends and I are in the truck. It's a long, straight, unlit, two-lane road with classic red desert on both sides in the daylight anyway. Not that we could see that at night. There's another vehicle coming the opposite way, and there's no crossroad in that stretch. That's important, because right before we go past each other, something I can only describe as metallic went streaking right between us, perpendicular, like feet away from both of our bumpers. It looked to be about the size of an SUV, no lights or discernible shape, but it seemed smooth. It's a weird comparison, but that speeding bullet in Mario Kart is actually what came to mind when it happened. All three of us saw it, and I think the other people did too, because I saw them hit the brakes in the rear view. It was super weird, and I still don't really know how to explain it. Before I begin, let me give you some background. I was about 13 at the time, 
not under the influence of any narcotics or medications, nor have I taken any mind-altering substances since then. I had just come back from a class trip to Washington, D.C. It was late, maybe around seven or eight at night. My father picked me up at the airport, and we began driving home on the highway. And that's when I saw it. It was an unknown distance away, and looked close and far at the same time. It was a gray steel color, and had... Well, it was honestly very stereotypical for the most part. It was in the shape of, like, ravioli. It was a round, perfectly circular, ravioli shape with a bulge on both sides of the middle and a ring of lights around it. The lights were all large and gave off a light that was very hard to describe. They were blue, yellow, and white, all at the same time. And yet they didn't give off any kind of flare or beam. And when the craft moved, they didn't give a typical trail that you would get when looking at a light moving out of a car window. Now, the craft moved so perfectly, it looked as if it wasn't moving at all. It matched the exact speed of our car, which, if you've ever driven down I-95, is really quite an impressive task. I tried to get my father's attention because I needed some confirmation that I was indeed seeing what I was seeing. In those days, things were a bit strained between us due to some issues at home. So he grumpily brushed me off and kept driving. It felt like this went on for a while, but after the event, I realized it couldn't have been more than a few minutes due to the time on the dashboard clock. Things got very odd very quickly. The craft, while keeping perfectly matched with our car, started moving on its side where it was nearly impossible to see except for the bulges. It then did something that I will truly never forget. It split in half, but in a way that was so mechanically perfect, I knew right then it wasn't man-made. The way it split was as it was moving, and there was no jittering or stalling or any evidence of anything mechanical that could have allowed it to separate, let alone be held together in the first place. After it split, for a few moments it kept pace with the car, then each half, while still on its side, shot across the sky at blinding speeds in separate directions. And that's the story. Make of it what you will, but I swear by this sighting. It was an amazing experience that showed me we truly understand nothing about our universe. My brother used to live in the attic of the house we grew up in. It had an extremely dark and suffocating vibe. My brother went crazy in there. He would hear voices and he would be paralyzed, unable to move. He got an EEG and they didn't find any issues. After that, he had major behavioral issues and he had to live in this boarding school place for kids with behavior issues. He ended up ending his own life. And this was 25 years ago, so I've been able to heal a lot since then, but still. One day, I was on the second floor, and I heard a dripping coming from the attic. I didn't want to go up there, but I needed to know what the cause of the dripping was. In the attic hallway, there was a hallway with three rooms connected to it. There was a random, big puddle of water. It felt wrong, and completely out of place. The ceiling above it looked totally normal. The dripping stopped once I came to the puddle, and I never heard it again. Nothing was wrong with the roof. My mom called a plumber, and there were no pipes near the area. That was one of many strange things to happen in the house, but it was definitely the strangest, since there was physical evidence of something, but no physical evidence to back up what put it there.
So I live alone, unless you want to include my cat and then I live with a cat. I have a house with an attic conversion, but since it's just me, it's basically an empty room. I think the previous tenant used it as a bedroom. Obviously when I first moved in, I did go up there to have a snoop around. There are two light switches for the room, one at the bottom of the stairs, and one that's a long string that you pull that's right in the middle of the room. There's a door at the top of the stairs that I always keep shut. I close every door behind me. An open door really bugs me. Now, after living in this house for about three months, I noticed that the door was open and the light was on. I could see the light on the wall opposite the door. No big deal. I obviously forgot to shut the door and turn the light off, I guess. I went and did it. Skip on about two weeks. I arrive home from work. It's early January and it's dark out. I can see the window to the room from outside and I can see that the light is on. My first thought is, shit, I've been robbed. I barge into my home and quickly sweep the first two floors expecting to find somebody. Nobody. Shit, they're still up there, I thought. I fly up my stairs and the door is shut but the light is still on. I swing the door open and nothing. I will say, I'm always very skeptical about stories when I hear somebody say they had a feeling of dread or felt like they were being watched, but I had these. I had this horrific feeling that I wasn't really alone up there, but it's a simple empty box of a room. I tried my best to shrug it off, turn the light off, and shut the door. I've been living there nearly seven months now, and since that day, I get the same feeling when I walk past the stairs to the attic, day or night. The light is on at least twice a week, but now it switches itself off after a while. Recently I've started hearing very loud bumps coming from the attic, which is right above my bedroom. The first time I heard it, I naturally assumed that somebody was trying to get in through the window. So again I ran up there, but nothing. Lastly. My cat, who is tiny and during the night stays downstairs, refuses to go up there and has actually done the whole arched back hissing thing at the door. It could just be his personality, but given the situation and the fact that he never hisses at anything, ever, it really freaks me out. So I just moved into a new house a few weeks ago, which I previously thought was completely empty and unfurnished. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, but I just got out of a pretty nasty situation in my old town and was looking for some seclusion. But from move-in day on, I have been hearing little knocks everywhere. I keep thinking it's kids playing in the woods, maybe throwing rocks at my house, but whenever I go look around outside, there's nobody there. I'm by myself out here, and I'm getting a little paranoid about people maybe following here from my old life. Always feels like someone's watching me. Last night, I heard a really loud thud in my attic, and I almost shit my pants. I was going to call the police, but then I started second guessing whether or not I really heard it, because it wasn't followed by anything else, and there weren't any footsteps or anything like that. I was telling myself that it could have possibly been a squirrel that got caught up there, but it sounded more like a wooden beam had fallen on the attic floor. It was really loud and sounded dense. So after nearly sweating myself into a coma, I decided to actually go up there and check things out. When I get up there, it's dark and there's nothing. I spent a long time feeling around for anything that could have fallen, and finally, I see this box in the far corner of the room. I took it downstairs with me where I could actually see it, and it was really heavy. It's basically a big wooden box with a bunch of stick figures carved into it. I know there's something inside the box because I can hear it rattle when I move it. it sounds like there's more than one thing. The weirdest part is though, there doesn't really seem to be a way to open it. There's no door or lid that I can open or find. There's no lock. 
It doesn't really have any crevices I can get my fingers in. There's just a bunch of carvings on it. Just stick figures, all doing kind of weird things. They look like they're dancing. Some look like they're holding hands. Does anybody know what this might be? I tried to Google some things, but I couldn't find anything. I kind of want to open it and see what's inside. I'm thinking of just breaking it, but I'm a little worried about what might happen if I do. What would you do? I live in England in a two-story flat, and I've always believed in the paranormal. But my dad does not believe in any type of ghost or anything paranormal. I never thought that this flat was haunted. However, as I got older, I started to feel uncomfortable by myself, and I would see shadows downstairs out of the corner of my eye. Now, there is an attic directly above our second floor, but there's no way for us to enter it, as you can't access it from the flat. The only way to access this attic is by having a specific key that can open the attic, as it is Council Flats, which is above all my neighbor's house. However, the attic above my flat is the one which is blocked off, and there's no way to enter it. I have the last flat on the end of these 18 Council Flats. There are no neighbors above us just the attic that nobody can access without that key, and they still wouldn't be able to get above our flat. One night, about two years ago, all of the family was in bed. It was about three o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden, I heard something crash above us. It was so loud that it woke the entire family up, and we all got up and stood on the landing together. After the bang, we heard three loud footsteps, and the sound of something being dragged behind those footsteps. It was so scary, especially since we knew that nobody could physically get up there. My dad was not convinced that it was a ghost. He thought that somebody, somehow, had gotten up into that attic. So he went outside to check to see if the communal attic door was opened. I followed him outside, and it was completely padlocked shut, with heavy chains around the lock. I tried to explain to him, how can there be anyone up in our part of the attic when it's blocked off and impossible to get to? We came back into the house and we were all pretty shaken up. My brother was quite young and was able to get back to sleep, but I was awake all night and found it very difficult to sleep. After this experience, I started to smell old cigarette smell every time I would enter the toilet area. It smelt so old and gross. After the event, my brother, my mom, and I were going away on holiday whilst my dad had to stay there and work. He told me that he slept with headphones on every night, as even he felt uncomfortable by himself. I have no idea what those noises were. As a family, we still can't figure it out. And ever since then, we've heard many more strange noises. For a brief time in my childhood, we lived in a redone train station in Buttcrack, New Hampshire. Small town with like 400 people in it, but still a few things to do, and a decent amount of wealth. So the bottom floor of this building is a super popular local sub and pizza shop. We lived right over them. I was nine at the time, and my bedroom had a very old, decrepit door. Cliché, I know, but it really was like rotting wood. That door had stairs behind it that led to the attic. The whole attic was pretty run down, as if they had just never redone that part. Old, creaky, some weird smells, all that. I got terrible vibes from the attic. I was terrified to be in my room alone. I was nine, so I could have just been paranoid because I was interested in paranormal things at the time. We lived there for one year. I heard voices of people I knew, 
knocks on the door from the attic side, and the door would frequently slam itself open. I eventually asked my mom to install a heavy lock on it because it scared me so badly. We got the padlock, not anything crazy, but it was the same kind that you would put on a locker. Now that I had that, the door would just shake and shake, like someone was stuck in there and desperately trying to get out. That continued for a few months with no escalation, just the door seeming to be alive. Our kitty had found a way to sneak up to the attic and back through a rotted part of the door. One day we hadn't seen her for a while, so we checked up there. We found my cat dead in the corner of the attic. We thought it was maybe rat poison that we didn't know was up there, but the vet didn't find any sign of poison in her and said it was old age, but she was only five. I guess it's possible that my mom didn't want to spend more money trying to find out why the kitty died and lied to me, but who knows. Things got a lot worse after that night that we found our cat. I started to hear my mom up there a lot, and I would just assume that she was up there cleaning. She would just say pretty normal things someone would say talking to herself, and it was definitely her voice. And sometimes she would ask me stuff, like if I wanted anything at the store, or what I felt like for dinner, if I was going anywhere this weekend, and things like that. Things she asked me pretty regularly. It was loud and clear and no different at all from her normal speech. And then I would answer the questions and get no reply. So I'd go up there and see that she wasn't up there. And sometimes she wasn't even home. I stopped checking after a while and I stopped replying too. My mom heard it herself twice, said she was cleaning my room and she heard someone in the attic. The first time she assumed it was just someone down in the pizza shop and there were weird acoustics. But the second time, it said my name in her voice and said, I'm back from the store, come help put stuff away. That's when my mom got scared because obviously she knew it wasn't her and that's when she finally believed me. It was like a recording of her talking. After we became more aware of it, it just stopped. But there was one more time that we felt it. My mother was cleaning in my room and I heard her yell, no. And then she had a seizure and I called my friend who called the cops. I moved out soon after. Still the weirdest and really the only undeniable experience I've ever had to this day. This happened when I was around 9 or 10. I was staying the night at my friend Catherine's for the first time. We met the summer before and we'd been inseparable ever since. Cat lived in this old two-story house, surrounded by woods and dirt roads. The house itself gave me an uneasy feeling when I first saw it. The shutters were falling off, the paint on the house seemed to be fading. It was an old piece of shit now that I think about it. But at the time, I was excited. I remember walking in after I stared out at the house for what seemed like 20 minutes. Surprisingly, the inside was a lot nicer than the outside, so I pushed that uneasy feeling down and just shrugged it off as nerves. I remember the smell of the house. I can't pinpoint it, but it was different, like walking into a musty room. I started to walk around just to explore my surroundings but I noticed Kat's mom watching me. I simply smiled and waved, but she just stood there, staring at me wide-eyed. I had never met her before, but I couldn't figure out why she was staring at me like that. Suddenly, Kat flew around the corner and tackled me. We both fell and started to giggle. I noticed Kat's mom out of the corner of my eye start to turn around and walk off. She was gone, just like that. Fast forward a couple of hours, Kat and I are laying on a beanbag in her room, watching Children of the Corn, which, by the way, was one of my favorite movies at the time. I grew up watching horror movies, mostly Stephen King movies or any movie my mom was watching at the time. Not her decision, mine, because I love the feeling that a good horror movie gives you. She felt the same way and that's why we clicked so much, but back to the story. 
Kat and I were sitting here watching this movie and suddenly the door opposite us slams closed. We both jumped, giggled and brushed it off because, well, we were kids. Until the second time, when it creaked open and slammed again, not even seconds after the first time. Now, I'm sitting there staring at this door, trying to figure out how the hell this door is opening and closing by itself. In the midst of all that, the only other person in this house is her mom, who, I had figured out earlier, was just a tad bit creepy. You think it's just your mom? I asked her, but she just shook her head. Are you sure? I asked again. But then she said something that gave me chills, and still gives me chills thinking about it now. My mom isn't home, it's just me and you, silly. I just stared at her while she was staring at me, trying to wrap my head around what she had just said. Who leaves their nine-year-old home alone with a friend they've never met in a two-story house? Where's your mom? I asked her. She's at work. I giggled, thinking that she was trying to trick me. She is at work. She only works for a couple of hours, so she leaves me here because she trusts me. At this point, I'm just looking at her and she notices the look of worry on my face. What's wrong? She asked. If your mom is at work, then who was the lady staring at me earlier? As I said this, we heard what seemed like footsteps at the time. But thinking about it now, it sounded more like shuffling in one spot. Above us. I'm completely scared at this point. Every hair on my neck is standing up, and I just want to leave. I start to get up when Kat pulled me back down and asked me if I heard that noise. I nodded. It was silent again until the footsteps were back, but louder and faster. We both stared up at the ceiling, and she grabbed my hand. This happens every day, she whispered. I look over at her, and I can truly see the fear on her face. The footsteps stopped and she looked at me, her face flushed white. Is there an attic? I asked. She pointed up toward the ceiling. Well, maybe it's just squirrels or birds, I kept thinking, over and over. You ever notice when you're really quiet, that's when you can hear almost everything around you? Imagine if you're sitting in a house with your best friend alone at 10 years old and you hear the giggle of a three-year-old child. Mind you, she has no younger brothers or sisters, and we're completely alone. Kat was just as scared as I was. I remember thinking that I just wanted to get out of this house, just grab her and run out the door. At least we would feel safer and less scared outside the house than in it. Want to hear a story? Kat asked, pulling my mind back to reality. I nodded. Well, this house used to be a daycare. There was this lady that would watch the kids, and one day she just locked them in the attic and then hung herself from a rope in the kitchen. They all died because the kids were hungry and thirsty, and no one found them for months afterwards. It was this house. My heart started to pound and my eyes were wide with fear. I just looked at her. It's true, she said. I've seen them, the little kids, every day. But I've never seen the lady. You have, though. Earlier. After she told me this, I don't remember much else except running out the door of her room and making it outside the house. Cat followed, begging me to stay, but I just had to get out. My stomach felt like it was in knots, like I'd walked into a horror movie myself, and I just wished the entire day had never happened. Fast forward years later. That day was the last day I had seen or heard from Kat. I remember her always coming to play outside my dad's during the day. I remember what she looked like. I never remembered meeting her parents or seeing them out in public, though. I'm now 27, and I can't seem to find any proof that she exists. All my friends that I was friends with then, I'm still friends with now, even after all these years. So why not her? I've driven by that house maybe 15 times, and I still wonder if maybe, just maybe, she was one of the kids that never made it out.
Tonight, August 4th of 2019, at around 10.15, my aunt and I were on the porch when my aunt saw something in the sky. It was like an outline of a circle, and part of it was gone, kind of like how an eclipsed moon would look at first. We noted that this was not where the moon usually is. Usually it's behind our house. So eclipse and moon were ruled out. The thing was bright yellow and had an orange-red tint to it. It almost looked like a fireball. It's night, and the sun is on the other side of the planet at this minute, so wasn't that either. We thought it was a shooting star at first, but it wasn't moving anywhere. It started, like, flattening out, like spreading. Then it started to shrink into a smaller form. It kind of looked like a star. Then all of a sudden, it disappeared. A few minutes later, it suddenly reappeared and got bigger and bigger. It looked as if the moon would have been over the sun and coming off of it, moving toward the way it came in the first time. The light around it kind of spread out again. Then suddenly, it started getting smaller, like the dark part of the eclipse was going back over. Then it split into two and completely disappeared. We waited to see if it would come back, but it didn't come back for the third time. I started doing some research and found nothing for solar or lunar eclipses that described what we saw. No meteor showers, no eclipses even happened in our area, no comets, Nothing of the sort for that night. After doing some more searching, two other people saw almost the same thing three days ago, around the same time. My aunt stepped back outside and called me over, fast. There was what looked to be a pretty low plane flying with two large wings. My aunt says it looked like it had four wings, two on either side, and I'm telling you this thing was big. One side was bright red, and the other was bright green. Planes in our area normally have a small light that flickers on both sides. It wasn't like this at all. This plane was coming from the same area that we had seen these mystery light things in. And when the plane got behind our house, I ran to look at it and I couldn't see it at all. It was big, like I said. It shouldn't have been out of view already. My aunt and I have been trying to come up with a logical explanation, but nothing makes any sense. I don't want to claim aliens, but I don't know what else it could have been. I can't definitively say that what I experienced was paranormal in nature, but here goes. When I was a kid, I lived in a one-story house that had a very small space that you could consider an attic. We didn't keep anything up there because it was so small. I don't even know where the entrance to it was, if there was one at all. But, and this started right when we moved in, after we'd go to bed, I would start hearing footsteps up there. I lived with my grandparents, by the way. I knew they were footsteps because they would move in a rhythm and go from one end of the house to the other. I lived in that house from when I was 8 to 12 years old and this happened every single night. I repeatedly tried telling my grandparents about this, but they always said it was just the house settling. I was never able to go to sleep or sleep very well as a kid. So while my grandparents would be asleep as soon as 8 p.m. fell, I'd be laying awake in bed, staring at the ceiling. It was always the most terrifying when the footsteps stopped right above me, like right over my bed. And then in a few seconds to minutes, they'd walk back to some other location up there. Nobody ever believed me that this was happening. My granddad had even found holes that had apparently been drilled in several of the walls one in the bathroom. He wrote it off as a previous owner running cables through the walls. I lived in that house for like four years, and I was convinced that someone was living in the ceiling above us, and would become active when they thought we'd gone to sleep. I will never forget that stuff. It always happened at the same time of night, too, right after we went to bed. 
And this was back in the late 90s to early 2000s, so I don't know if there could have been cameras or something that they could have been watching us on, but they definitely knew when we went to sleep. To this day, I'm still convinced that somebody was up there. Paranormal? I don't know. It's worth mentioning that one of the previous owner's kids did die in the house. They had a wolf-dog hybrid as a pet that mauled him in the living room. Anyway, I thought I'd share because literally nobody believed me, ever, to this day. But I know footsteps from houses settling, and these were footsteps. This would go on to the wee hours of the night, and I'd usually fall asleep when the footsteps had finally gone off to a different part of the house. When I was 13, I babysat a little girl named Emma, one of the sweetest kids you could think of. I was a regular babysitter for her, so much so that when I couldn't babysit for a few months, she called all her other babysitters by my name. This happened after I came back to being a regular babysitter for her. It was about 10.30 at night. I had already put Emma to bed and had been channel surfing. The house was set up so that the front half was open concept. The living room, dining room, and kitchen were side by side. In between the living room and dining room was an open doorway to the back half of the house. At one end was Emma's room, and the other end had her parents, with the bathroom connected to the parents' room. While I was sitting on the couch, I heard something run down the hall to the bathroom. Assuming it was just Emma going to the bathroom, I let it be. A few minutes went by, and I heard the feet heading back down the hall. I turned to tell her to go back and make sure she flushed, because I hadn't heard it, but I only saw the tips of black hair that ran past the open doorway. Here's the problem. Emma is blonde. I quickly jumped up and rushed to Emma's bedroom, throwing open the door. Her nightlight was bright enough to make her out as she sat up and looked at me, rubbing her eyes in confusion. I asked her if she had just gone to the bathroom. When she shook her head, I did a once-over of her room, checking under her bed, and a quick peek in her closet. I didn't see anything, so I told Emma I was just double-checking for monsters. I tucked Emma back in, saying goodnight, and as I headed out of her room, leaving the door slightly open, I stopped when I heard her speak. I thought she was going to call me back in and ask me something. But instead, I hear her say, You should have said something. Don't scare her. I really like her. I didn't say anything to the mom about it, and I continued to babysit Emma. Or I did until they moved away. I always made an effort after that to include the second child I didn't know I was babysitting. If Emma was drawing, an extra spot was set up. If she was eating, another chair and table setting was set up. It seemed to make Emma happy, and nothing ever startled me again. Still, weirds me out. I'm going to give a little background first before I get into my experience so you can all better understand. My partner and I are good friends with another couple that we often go over to hang out with. We'll call them Ashley and David. We go to their house about twice a week, and nothing out of the ordinary ever happens. We usually just hang out and talk for hours, with a few beers. David has mentioned a few times that he's seen Ashley's deceased brother around the house. Ashley always rolls her eyes and says she doesn't believe in things like that, Ashley took her brother's passing very hard, and she was very close with him. Fast forward to today. Ashley has a son that we'll call Adam. She called me and asked me to watch him since he was homesick from school while she went to work. I agreed and came straight over. Everything was normal. Adam was at the dining room table. He was playing a game on his laptop, still in his pajamas. He's a great kid. He never complains or gives anybody trouble. 
I went to the restroom, which is down the hallway past the living room. This bathroom shares a wall with the master bedroom's bathroom wall. As I'm doing my business, I heard the water turn on and off twice from that bathroom, followed by talking. I can hear what sounds like two people talking very fast, but it was muffled. I didn't think much of this, figuring that Adam must have wandered in there with the two dogs. He's nine, and he talks to the dog sometimes as most kids do. I came out of the bathroom to find him still in the same position at the kitchen table, and the dogs were sleeping on the couch. I said, hey buddy, did you go into your mom's bathroom and have the water on? He looked puzzled and said, no, I haven't left this table and I don't go in there. I then went to the kitchen sink and noticed it was dry. So the water I heard being turned on had to have come from the master bathroom. And what about the talking I heard? I chalked it up to maybe the next door neighbors. A few hours go by and Adam is on the couch with me, watching TV, and the dogs were there too. I start hearing things being moved in the master bedroom, almost like somebody was cleaning up, picking things up and setting them back down. The dogs then start to bark and run to the master bedroom door. This repeats every half an hour or so until David comes home. I explained my experience and he just smiled and nodded. I asked him what he was smiling about and he said, Ashley's brother's ashes are in the bedroom and she recently got the ashes of her stepdad from her sister. She mixed the ashes. That's the talking you heard. Her brother and stepdad. They used to sit in the garage together and just chatter all through the night. At this point, I'm creeped out. David is glad that someone believes him now. I told Ashley about my experience, but she refuses to believe any of it. I personally think she's in denial, and I don't really blame her. It's scary stuff, and it's hard to believe unless you experience it for yourself. I've never seen anything paranormal before or after that, and I hope I never do, because hearing that stuff gave me enough chills to last a while. My friend Monica has been babysitting for this family for the past two years. She has been taking care of these two girls, both at the age of two. Nothing out of the ordinary has happened in the past, but recently there have been some strange events taking place. One normal day, Monica was just doing her thing, putting the babies to sleep in their own separate rooms, all cribbed up for nap time. After making sure that the girls were asleep, she left the room at about 1.30. A couple of hours later, at 3 in the afternoon, she went to check on the girls. What she found in one of the girls' rooms was very unsettling. The room was a mess. Ripped up diapers and napkins were strewn everywhere. The kiddo was fast asleep as if nothing had ever happened. Above one of the shelves in the room, across from the girls' crib, hung a cross in a sealed box that the family had gotten from the Vatican. They were very specific in telling her to never open the box or touch the crucifix. She immediately noticed that the box was open and the crucifix was on the floor. Mind you, the crucifix had been hung three meters off the ground, much too high for the baby to reach. She also found some angel deck cards on the ground, each attributed to a different saint or angel. She quickly woke up the child and made sure she was all right and unharmed. Then comes the strangest part of the story. After waking her up, she took her into the other room for playtime. Then, playing pretend restaurant, the little girl approached Monica, holding a piece of paper in her hand, which Monica assumed was the pretend menu for the restaurant. But when Monica took it out of her hand, she noticed that it was a pamphlet to do with the Wiccan religion and basic instructions for how to practice witchcraft. Monica, now obviously on edge, asks the little girl where she'd gotten it from. The girl pointed toward a book laid open on one of the stairs, 
which was unusual because she knows not to play with the books from the bookshelf and is normally very well behaved. The book was Wicca, A Guide for the Solitary Practitioner by Scott Cunningham. Ever since then, Monica has been a little on edge, and she said that she's been having very strange and abnormal dreams. Some other important information to note is that the family is Catholic, and they live across the street from Eastern State Penitentiary, an old suspected haunted former prison that closed in 1971. If you have any ideas, speculations, or know anything that has to do with Wicca or the book mentioned, please let me know. Monica wants to know the best ways to keep herself and the baby safe from whatever energy is in the house, because regardless of anything else, she feels that they are definitely not friendly. About two weeks ago, my bigger brother and I started to hear random walking and running sounds from our attic. Our attic isn't accessed through a ladder or anything. We have a staircase going to the roof where there's a separate small room for the attic. At first when we heard the noises, we didn't care as we thought it could have been a random stray animal. A few days later, the walking turned into running and odd shuffling sounds. They mainly came at around 12 and 1 a.m. After we told this to our parents, they told us to investigate it the day after, and that's what we did. There was no one there, and we checked every corner, and everything seemed to be in its respective place. The next week, no event took place until Saturday. On Sunday, however, at daytime, we heard some running from across the rooms. The sound was from above and a few things dropping. My brother and I went up and saw nobody, and nothing was dropped on the floor. We were very confused, but not scared. Not even creeped out. Just confused. Nothing happened on Monday. At the moment that I'm telling you this, I just heard the same running and things dropping. It's a Tuesday at around 1.10 in the morning. I can't seem to find any evidence of anything paranormal going on other than we can't find the source for what we're hearing. Any ideas? About a year and a half ago, I heard some scratching coming from inside my wall when I was in bed. When you walk into my house, you have to go up these stairs to a landing, and then there's another door made of glass that takes you into the rest of the house. The attic is above the stairs. When you go in through the glass door, it's basically just a long hallway with rooms coming off of it. Anyway, I heard the scratching a few times, but nobody else did. So I just thought, whatever, it's probably just me. It stopped for about a week, and then it sounded like someone was up there, crawling or dragging themselves around. This freaked me out, and I told my dad. He said it was probably just rats, so we got people out to check. Nothing was there. They said if there had been any animals, they would have left feces and other signs of their presence. They even checked under all the insulation, too. It carried on after this, so we put a large range of food up there, figuring something would eat it. Nope. Took it down about a week later, and nothing had been touched. At this point, we were pretty confused, so we put up cameras and left them for a week. The whole time they were up there, no sounds happened, which was odd because previously you could hear them all day and night. It was after the cameras got taken down that things got a bit weirder. You could get up to use the bathroom and the noise would follow you around the house. It happened to my stepmom and my sister. My dad didn't hear it though. Then stuff started going missing. Some raw chicken, hot chocolate. My dog would always look down the hall to the door and make that confused dog look. And at night, my stepmom and sister and I 
had a sense of pure dread, like we were being watched. We got pretty scared at one point, thinking it could be an actual human, but we would have seen them. Has anyone else had a similar experience? I'd love to know. A couple of years ago, I went on a study abroad trip with my university to Australia for a couple of months. We started in Darwin and traveled south. The bus ride itself was pretty uneventful, except for my friend and I being accidentally left at Devil's Marble for a few hours, but that's another story. We stayed at a hostel in Alice Springs and got up before dawn to drive to Uluru. The rest of the students had decided to go back to sleep for the bus ride, but I was looking out the window at what little I could make of the scenery. It was that time right before dawn when you're first able to make out your surroundings. The bus slowed down to park and made a turn into an empty lot, and that's when I saw it. An extremely large shadow walking through the bush. I'm a bad judge of height, but it was taller than any human I've ever seen, perhaps ten feet tall, with extremely elongated arms and legs. Even though there was enough light to make out the details of the landscape, the figure appeared completely, well, void of detail. Like it was smooth, black, and featureless. The black was a stark contrast to the rest of the scenery, as there was a thin mist in the area. I've seen flashes of shadows driving before, or something out of the corner of my eye, but this was different. I was able to watch it for several slow seconds as it walked in this odd, swaying, dipping motion with a distinct grace, moving effortlessly across the bush. I felt like as soon as I saw it, I had been electrocuted. Every hair was standing on end, and my skin was prickling. I tried to wake my friend, but by the time she looked out the window, it was gone. I'm sure this could be explained away by possible sleep deprivation, or just seeing shadows, but I personally believe that what I saw was real. If anyone has any local legends about the area, I would love to hear them. My dad told me this story from when he worked in a nursing home in Australia. It spooked me a bit, and I have no idea how he lasted as long as he did in that nursing home. For the record, my family are all skeptics, as far as I know. But I think this is the one story that would persuade me that ghosts are real. My dad worked the night shift and he said that he had been told stories of deceased residents passing the front desk on the bottom floor. He said he even heard babies crying on the top floor. The nursing home used to be a maternity hospital. This crying would occur even though there was now no maternity clinic near it. There was a TV room on the bottom floor. It was on this floor where some of the residents who were kept in bed all night for their own safety were housed. He moved the chairs near the TV all the way back to the wall and locked the door. He came back an hour or so later whilst waiting for the porter, and the door was open and one of the chairs was moved back across to the television. The door hadn't been forced. There were no windows in the room, and even if there were, the chair was too heavy to be blown back across the room. All the patients were accounted for. The porter arrived, and my dad asked him about the occurrence. The porter said, Oh yeah, that's Bob's chair. He doesn't like it to be away from the TV. My dad said, There is no Bob at this nursing home. The porter chuckled and said, There used to be. He's dead now. That's my dad's one and only experience with ghosts, and it chills me to the bone.
Whispers in the Attic. So I've got to tell you about this eerie thing that happened at my place. I've always been a bit skeptical about paranormal stuff, but this incident, well, it was just weird. I live in this old house and there's an attic that I rarely ever go into. It's just filled with boxes and old furniture. One night, I'm in my room and I start hearing these faint noises. It sounded like whispers coming from above, the attic. Initially, I thought it was just the wind or the house settling, you know, the usual stuff you tell yourself. But the whispers kept getting louder and more distinct. It sounded like a conversation, but I couldn't make out the words. So I muster up some courage, grab a flashlight, and head up to the attic. The moment I pull down the ladder and climb up, the air gets colder. I'm telling you, it was like walking into a freezer. I shine the light around, but there's nothing out of the ordinary, just the stuff that I stored up there. The whispers, though, they're still there. It's like they're coming from the walls. I call out, asking if anyone's there, almost expecting somebody to answer back. But nothing, just more of the whispers. I'm not gonna lie, I was freaked out. I quickly checked if maybe there was a radio or something left on, but nothing. The attic was as silent as a grave, aside from those dang whispers. I headed back down, deciding that some things were just better left alone. But those whispers just didn't stop. For the next few nights, I heard them, always around the same time, always just as unintelligible. I even got a buddy of mine to come over and check it out. He heard them too, so I knew at that point I wasn't going crazy, but we could never find the source. He joked about it being ghosts, but I wasn't too sure if it was just a joke. Eventually, I just couldn't handle the creepiness. I called in a professional to check for any structural issues or animals stuck in the walls. They didn't find anything unusual. The whispers stopped after a while, and I haven't heard them since. It's still a mystery to me. Were they echoes of some past conversation trapped in the walls? I don't know, and maybe it's better if I don't. But every time I pass by that attic door, I just can't help but listen to see if I hear them again. I have quite a few stories I could tell, but I decided to start with this one because I think it illustrates a few things about me and my now husband. It was also the first time I really saw a ghost right in front of me, rather than in my peripheral vision. I think I may be a bit of an empath, judging by the experiences that I've had over the last 50 odd years. My husband, Jay, however, is a skeptic. He says he would love to see a ghost, but doesn't expect to. He once took part in a study at a university one of those classic guess which card I'm holding up experiments. This was in the 70s. Jay got so many wrong that it was statistically significant in the negative direction. He says that proves that there's no such thing. I think it indicates the opposite. I believe he actively blocks his own abilities to the point where he negates the paranormal around him. Being around him is like wearing psychic earplugs. It's very soothing. The following occurred in the early 80s when we were at university in northern New South Wales, Australia. Most of the students lived on campus and the university had its own radio station to cater to them. A friend of ours, Gail, was a DJ at the time and had a midnight till dawn weekend shift. She invited us up to the station one night to tape some albums from the station's record collection. The radio station was located in a faculty building about a 20 minute walk from the college where we all lived. Gail had the keys and locked all the doors behind us. The station consisted of two rooms, a large rectangular room housing an office area with two glass walled studio booths partitioned off on one long side and a storage room housing the library. 
The entrance door was in the long wall opposite Studio A. The door to the library was in the short wall next to Studio B. Other than the library, the entire area is visible from either of the two studios. Gail commenced her shift using Studio B, while Jay set up in Studio A with some blank cassette tapes and I headed into the library to pick some albums. The record library was fantastic. Four walls of floor-to-ceiling shelving, packed solid with classic rock LPs. I was standing on a chair, choosing some music from the top shelf, when I started feeling that there was someone, or something, behind me. Almost, but not quite touching me. I was telling myself not to turn around, that there's nothing there, and so on. But the feeling got so strong that I really wanted to get my back against the wall. I have personal space issues, and the sensation of anything being that close was just too much for me and I had to get out of there. I grabbed a couple of records, took them to Jay, and then I went to talk to Gail in Studio B. From where I was sitting, facing Gail, who had her back to the main room, I could see the entire radio station. Jay was in the studio to my right, and the main door was diagonally to my right. The one and only door to the record library was diagonally to my left all clearly visible through the glass walls of the studio booths. I watched Jay get up, leave Studio A, walk across the office space from right to left behind Gail and enter the record library. As he disappeared into the library, a figure in blue came out of the library door, crossed rapidly from left to right behind Gail, and entered Studio A. I turned my head to look directly into Studio A, but nobody was there. About 15 minutes later, Jay came out of the record library and walked back to Studio A. Immediately, the blue figure shot out of Studio A, crossed behind Gail, and went back into the library. Gail must have seen my eyes following it, because she said, quite excitedly, You saw it, didn't you? I knew if there really was something here, you would know. It turns out that Gail had been feeling like she wasn't alone up there at night, and having heard some of my experiences, she decided to try an experiment. She kept her experiences to herself and then waited to see if I picked up anything. Gee, thanks, Gail. It also turns out, I guess, that while Jay ain't afraid of no ghost, the ghosts seem to be afraid of him. I've never told this story to anyone before, simply due to not having any answers and thinking that there's nothing that can be gained from telling it, but eventually I figured, why not? Maybe somebody knows what I saw. Many, many years ago, at Wangi Campgrounds in Queensland, Australia, my father, my friend, and I were out camping for a couple of days. Usually it's packed, but we went during the week and got two days off school. I can't remember the reason. I think it was just because my dad had a few days off, but that's beside the point. Due to it being midweek, the grounds were empty. We've been here many, many times before, but never alone. However, we were excited due to having the whole grounds to ourselves. Cool, right? Now, we're no strangers to the Australian bush. We know what to look out for. We know how to play it safe. So at night, knowing that nobody was around to mess with our camp, we decided to go for a mini bushwalk to the other side of the river that runs along the grounds. When I say grounds, it's just a clearing in the middle of a bush, not a properly established grounds, and it's far away from all the roads. We got to the opposite riverside, and looking out to the river, we could see a bright light just near our campgrounds. Thinking it could have been the fire, I mean, we put it out, but they could easily relight, we walked back through the bush to our site, still able to see the large light. However, when we got to our side, we realized that it wasn't the fire. As we were able to be closer to the river this time, we saw that the light was over the river, not in it, but over it. We were somewhat scared, but thought that there had to be some explanation for it. 
Maybe a flashlight or a torch, something along those lines. Maybe a torch or something along those lines. But looking from where we were, there was nothing under it. The light was a good 70-ish centimeters above the water. And still, dead still, the light itself was flickering, sort of like a fire, but it was in no way attached to anything. It was just a large ball, like between a tennis ball and a soccer ball, floating and giving off a strong fire-like light, but more like a light bulb center. This went on for maybe 30 minutes as we tried splashing the water and trying to figure out what it was, but it didn't move. It didn't do anything. It just floated at that one spot, in complete silence, unlike the sound a fire would make. My dad decided to go get the torch and his camera, and of course, being the scared 12-year-olds we were, we went with him. As soon as we got to the campsite, which was maybe only a hundred meters away, the light was gone. We ran back with the torch, but there was nothing there, and no one there. No other campers. It was just gone. We didn't really talk about it because we didn't know what it was, or how it was there, or why it was there. Min Min lights are something that are very popular in the Australian outback, and that's the only explanation that I've got for it. But they have no explanation, so it's a dead end. Some friends and I ventured into an old abandoned hospital that's pretty securely boarded up. We climbed through a broken window that was maybe eight inches at most. It was nighttime and most of the large hospital campus is abandoned with welded doors and boarded windows. And though people had obviously gotten in before us, there was much less graffiti and damage than we're used to seeing in these places. The campus has several buildings, and we were clueless as to which one we were in, until we found a morgue in the basement, and medical equipment strewn about. We didn't hear anything or see anything out of the ordinary, except for the light in the attic. The building had no power, yet we could see from the top floor that a light was on above us. We couldn't get into the attic, as the only staircase up there had a chained and bolted door. It was a little odd, but I'm not sure if it was paranormal. Maybe there was a solar-powered light? Would the bulb ever go out? I don't know. It didn't scare us off. We did continue wandering around for a while, but nothing crazy happened. Still, sometimes I think about that light in the attic and I try to figure out what could have caused it, but I still haven't come up with a sufficient explanation. This happened to me about a year ago. I often slept at my father's house alongside my sister. When we slept over, specifically if we were upstairs, we would hear someone or something running in the attic. At first, it didn't scare us, and we continued to remain unfazed. We thought it must be pigeons or rats, but when we told our dad, he went to check the attic to see if it was animals, but there was nothing, and even if there could have been, there was literally no space for them to run. We have a very small attic. You can't even stand upright. Alongside some wooden panels blocking a straight path, there are boxes everywhere. Clutter is covering the whole floor, and there's no gap in between. It would have been completely impossible for them to run from one side to the other with such loud footsteps. So we still don't know what's up in that attic. And frankly, I'm not sure we want to find out.
there's this little access to the attic in the place that we currently live in. We never really noticed it, up until our roommate pointed it out, trying to mess with us and scare us. So my best girlfriend and I were doing laundry one day in the garage. This thing is located in the garage above the door. I was staring up at it as she was sorting laundry. It moved open slightly, and I told her about it. And then, it moved closed, and I told her again. She looked at it, and we laughed, kind of creeped out. You know, a nervous kind of laugh. We tried to go about our day, but then we got paranoid. So, we went inside, and we were talking about it, trying to figure out what it might be. I kind of creeped her out by talking about all those videos. You know, the ones you see online of people finding out that other people were living in their attics. Well, we turned the air off and waited for it to shut down. We stood in the garage looking at this thing for like five solid minutes. We were going to go inside because nothing was happening. I looked at my girlfriend and said, let's go, nothing's gonna happen here. When I said that, the door flung open, fast. We ran inside screaming. The boys swear that it's from opening and closing the garage door, but we weren't doing that when this happened, so we're still weirded out. I really still want to get it checked out, because even if it isn't paranormal, that could mean that there's somebody living up there. And if there's nobody living up there, well then, something's going on. Either way, I want to know. This is the first time I think I've encountered something related to paranormal activity, but if anyone can help me understand what this might have been, please tell me. I live in a duplex with my roommate and friend who goes to college with me. The duplex isn't that big, and neither is the attic. It's small enough to where an average-sized person would have trouble even crawling through it. I also have one camera on the front window and one on the back. A few days ago, I had suddenly been awoken at about 4.30 a.m. when I checked my phone. I usually wake up at around 7 to 8 so I can get to work on time. At first, I didn't really understand why I was awake, so I decided to just try and fall asleep again. But after a few seconds, I heard what sounded like very loud footsteps walking above me. I was too afraid to get out of bed, so I just laid there. My first thought was that it must have been an illusion, but now I know this isn't true. When I suddenly woke up a few hours later, I went out to eat breakfast with my roommate. We asked how each other's sleep had been, and I decided to bring up the fact that I had heard something at around 4.30. He responded by saying that he had heard something at exactly 4.34 a.m. At this point, we were both a little freaked out, so we decided to open the hatch to the attic. But, like I said before, there was no way that anybody could fit up there. It's just too small. We decided to have a look at the camera footage, but there were no signs of any motion out of the ordinary. Nothing besides leaves blowing around. Our only thought was that someone had come from one of the sides of the houses and climbed to the top of the roof. I asked my neighbors if they had seen anything, and they said no, so that kind of eliminated one side but I also knew that it wasn't the other side due to the fact that we sleep on that side and would most likely have woken up easily if there was a disturbance. Now we're stuck having to believe that maybe it was something paranormal. Since then, we haven't heard any noise, but it's only been a few days. Like I said earlier, if anybody can help us solve what this might have been, please do. Just a preface, I work nights, so I spend most of the time home alone while my brother is at work. Before I go to sleep in the morning, I'll lie in bed and browse Reddit for a bit. 
Yesterday, I'm in bed, just about to call it a day, when I hear something hit the counter in the kitchen. My aunt likes to walk in sometimes, but I checked the cameras. I'm lazy. And my car is the only one here. I immediately dismiss it and get back to my browsing. Maybe five minutes later, I hear solid footsteps coming down the hall. I drop everything and just listen. Unmistakable sounds of boots slowly walking up and eventually back down the hall. I text my brother to tell him, since minor stuff happens sometimes. My dog stares at the walls and closets all the time. Doesn't bark, but just stares. And my brother and I joked for a little bit. I get the idea to try and record it on the off chance that I actually catch something. And I got extremely lucky this time. I took about five whole minutes of footage from my bed since I was getting increasingly nervous about the whole thing, and I didn't want to get up, to be honest. I've trimmed the video and removed the empty film space. Included in this video, which starts off with multiple footsteps coming down the hall, boots. It cuts to a closer point of view with a single step and then a thud, ending with me looking out of my room door at the hallway. You can hear it on your phone if you listen closely, but with a Bluetooth speaker, you'll hear everything a lot better. Not going to try to speculate or rationalize anything. I just wanted to share the eeriness. Now that I was able to get this, I can include a couple of photos from months ago when my dog stared into the hallway for about 10 minutes. This will have some context now. When he didn't move for a while, I got a picture time stamped at 7.34 p.m. He eventually moved over and continued to stare at 7.48 p.m. It never really bothered me then, but now it makes a little more sense. Update. Since my last post about disembodied footsteps, things have gotten louder and weirder. I worked a half day last night, so I got home at about 1 a.m. I had to be quiet since my brother was sleeping in the room next to me. I finally got settled into bed and got a movie on Netflix. A while into it, I started hearing the same footsteps that I heard the other day, except this time it was a lot louder. Of course, I paused the movie and put all of my focus into listening. I stood by the cracked door for 10 to 20 minutes, trying to get a recording of it. I didn't get anything too special. A little while later, I heard them even louder and closer. It was coming from the attic. I stood on top of my bed and got the loudest recording yet. There is obviously someone or something in my attic. It wasn't long after that that my brother's alarm started going off and he got out of bed. I immediately went to him and he flipped out completely and grabbed his gun. I was going to tell him not to go up there, but he handed me his gun before I could. Screw it. I made it up the old ladder and looked toward my room. If there was someone up there, there's nowhere that they could hide when they heard me coming up. Thinking about heading up there again all the way to see if there's anything at all that could be making those noises. Happy birthday to me, I guess. In Ivory Coast, West Africa, my friends and I walked into the biggest hotel and palace in the capital at 3 p.m. And it was completely empty and silent. There were no cars, no taxis outside, no customers, no employees. This hotel is an enormous complex with a mall, dozens of shopping stores, pools, tennis courts, restaurants, conference rooms. It's always busy. 24 seven. I needed to withdraw money from the ATM and all the doors were open. So I walked inside. It was the eeriest experience of my entire life. It was like the place had been abandoned, but why the open doors and everything was okay. It was clean. Just all the people were missing. There were no lights on just the emergency lights. But since all the doors were open, the natural light was shining through. So at least it wasn't too dark. 
The only noise came from my steps on the marble, and there wasn't even an echo. My heart was pounding in my chest because the situation just didn't make any sense. At one point, I saw some light on in a store about 50 meters away from me, with people inside, and I breathed a sigh of relief. But once I arrived in front of the store, I noticed that I couldn't really distinguish the shapes or the faces of the people, even though it was clear glass. They were fuzzy, for lack of a better word. Panic started to kick in, but I still needed that money, so I hurried to the ATM that was closest. I was afraid the ATM would be dead, but surprisingly, it was functional. I withdrew the money and ran out of the hotel using the first exit I found. Still, no one in sight. After walking a few meters, I exited on another street, and suddenly everything got noisy again. It was full of people and activity. I came back later to the hotel on another day, and it was totally back to normal. It's been almost 20 years since this happened, but I will never forget this experience. I still think about it from time to time, and every time I return and I walk past it, it still makes me feel weird. A little background. I am from Glenmore, Banyawangi, Indonesia. I work at a busy chemicals and perfumes factory for laundry. The place is on a narrow street between large farm fields and oil refineries. Since my home is a long way, I sleep in the factory bunks. This is where I encountered a lot of paranormal things. First, I remember it was a sunny and very hot afternoon. There was nobody in the factory because it was a holiday. I was the only one there because I had to check machinery routinely to make sure everything was in order. Suddenly, I heard a very loud bang, like somebody had punched the tables in front of me. And when I looked, there was a white smoke emerging from it, almost like a vape smoke, but much thicker and denser. It disappeared after that. It wasn't from chemicals or any of the other things going on in the factory. It was very strange. It almost looked like the smoke was aware of my presence. Second, one time I was trying to sleep and I couldn't close my eyes, even though I felt very sleepy. I just couldn't close them. It was like I was waiting for something to show up and eventually something started to. I can only sleep like 2 to 3 p.m. And all the while, almost every time, there's this shadow-like figure. It flies through the machines, or it will crawl beside the bed. I feel afraid, but there's nothing I can do about it. My body freezes still every time that I try to stand to watch it. It's a terrifying experience, and it happened every single time that I would try to sleep there. Third, this happened like a month ago. It was raining on a Sunday night, I was still inside the factory, waiting until the rain stopped. I walked into the kitchen to make myself some coffee, and that's when I heard a whispering voice inside the women's bathroom. I know that it's only me in there, and everyone else has gone home, but it's very clearly a voice, just humming. It was raspy though. It almost sounded like a woman in pain, humming to soothe herself. The next second, it was whispering some kind of words that I couldn't understand. My body got really cold, and I started to shake. I wanted to run, but I couldn't. It was like something was holding my feet tightly. The whisper became louder. My eyes actually started tearing up. I kept thinking, I can't handle this, I just want to cry. 
but I couldn't even do that. Finally, after 20 or 30 seconds of this, I broke the hold and got out of there. I didn't care if it was raining. It was better than being in there. A lot of other things have happened at that factory, but those three were the scariest. I want to quit, but it has a decent salary, and so ultimately, I stayed. And I still do. I still work there, and I still have to spend the night there sometimes, too. Things keep happening, but so far, nothing as scary as all of those things. But I'm sure it's only a matter of time. I went to Sydney, Australia and tried the ghost tour at Q Station. Weird things happened there. Despite having a comfortable flight from Manila to Sydney, I still felt tired. After passing through immigration, I immediately went to the arrival hall, loaded my Opal card, and rode a train to my mate's flat in Burwood. It was raining when I arrived in Sydney. At only 18 degrees, the warm shower and the bed were the only two things that I looked forward to. It was still raining when I woke up. The overcast weather made the day bleak and gloomy. Then, I just remembered the things I watched online a few days ago, and one of them was the ghost tours in Sydney. I asked my mate about it, and the next thing I knew, he already booked us an extreme ghost tour on a weekend after my trip to Melbourne. Sydney was not a glamorous city back in the 19th century. Diseases such as smallpox, Spanish influenza, and bubonic plague were prevalent. To mitigate the spread of these infectious diseases, all ships entering Sydney Harbor must be checked by the doctors. Even if there was only one sick passenger on board, everybody was required to stay at the quarantine station for 40 days. Those who were sick were brought to the hospital for treatment. At least 16,000 people were brought here from the 1830s to 1984. 570 people died here. Today, Q Station serves as a hotel, a conference center, and a part of Sydney Harbour National Park. Our extreme ghost tour was scheduled at around 9 p.m. To beat the weekend traffic of North Sydney, we left Burwood at around 6 p.m. and drove all the way to Manly. We had our dinner there before heading to Q Station, located east of Manly Beach. We arrived at half past eight, way too early for the tour. So we went straight to the front desk and toured around. Some of the original relics like tombstones, luggage, and clothing are still there. It felt eerie upon seeing those personal belongings that once belonged to people who got quarantined here more than a hundred years ago. Disclaimer. We met up with the group at half past nine. Our guide, Bob, told us that we should not rationalize everything we would encounter during the tour. Jace and I are both air traffic controllers, and in our line of work, we rationalize everything. This time, we would have to leave everything behind and open up our senses. We were given EMF, or electromagnetic field sensors. This instrument detects an anomaly of the surrounding electromagnetic field. Experts believe that ghosts manifest themselves as a form of energy. First stop, the chamber. The tour started inside the chamber. There are two rooms. Both aren't that big with a floor area approximately 50 square meters. We were locked inside for at least five minutes just to observe everything. I didn't feel anything in the first room, except that it faintly smelled of hay. I didn't mind it because I thought it used to be a barn. But in the second room, I felt something. The surrounding air felt heavy, and I felt an unknown force pressing on my cheeks. It was quite difficult to breathe at some points. As we went out, Bob told us that it used to be a gas chamber. 
About 40 people were locked inside for sanitary reasons. Now, it all made sense as to why it felt so heavy inside, and why I felt claustrophobic inside the second room. The second stop was the hospital. It was quite a long hike to the quarantine hospital. During the early days, it was harder to get to the hospital. You would need to climb the steep walkways. Basically, when you're on top, you're completely isolated. The hospital is located near the cliff overlooking Sydney Harbor. There are several buildings around, including the quarters of the nurses and doctors. Hospitals, no matter how modern their facilities are, can get creepy at night. But this one was way creepier than I thought. We first entered the doctor's quarters. It was dark, but cold inside the room, and there were three bunk beds inside. As I sat and leaned on the lower bunk bed while listening to Bob's stories, I felt something was pinching my lower back. I shrieked, and Bob caught my attention. I told Bob that it was nothing. I lied. We went into the main hospital room. It was quite big, and there were six beds. Feeling brave, I lied down on one bed and tried to make some connections. I don't know how, but I just closed my eyes momentarily. I felt nothing, and honestly, the bed felt soft and comfortable. I transferred to an adjacent bed near the wall, and the moment that I lied down, it felt weird. It felt like something was pushing me, but not in a forcible manner. The room is connected to another room that had a darker history. Bob told us to open the door and asked if we felt something different. Everyone told him that it was colder in that room, despite the doors and windows being tightly shut. Some of our EMF detectors went crazy. According to Bob, there are four resident ghosts inside this room. Two children who love to play hide-and-seek inside the cupboard. A woman and the malevolent spirit of an old man. There were stories circulating around that one group who stayed overnight in the hospital decided to record themselves singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and they caught something on the recording. They heard children giggling, a woman saying, Wait, wait, and an angry voice of a male shouting, Get out. Jace had his EMF detector pointed near the cupboard, it went crazy. So what he did, he got his phone and started recording himself singing the same song. Actually, we were all at the center of the room, and we didn't hear him singing. After we went out, we played back his recording. Believe it or not, he caught something on his recording. There weren't disembodied voices from children or from the women, but in the middle of his singing, Someone was shouting in the background, F you, your singing stinks. Things got real. The third stop is the Gravedigger's House. The Gravedigger's House is one of the most haunted parts of the complex. It's so haunted that Bob won't dig deeper into its bloody history. It used to be the house of, of course, the Gravedigger and a doctor. Just a few steps from the house is the third class cabin. During that time, there were reports of missing girls and children. Eyewitness reports claimed that they saw some kids and girls entering the gravedigger's house. More so, the doctor was attached to the girls, especially the young ones. The house is a bungalow. It has two bedrooms with a small living room, dining room, and the kitchen and the bathroom are located at the back part. Bob left us in the house for at least 10 minutes. The first room to the right used to be the bedroom of the doctor. As I slowly entered the room, the atmosphere drastically changed. It felt cold and sad at the same time. I don't know, I just couldn't help but be sad in that room. I went out right away because I couldn't take the sadness any longer. The second room was rather weird. I was about to enter there, but something felt wrong. It felt like there was a force barring me from entering. Some of my groupmates checked their EMF and it went a bit crazy. I guess everybody was not welcome to come inside. 
The back portion, where the kitchen and the bathroom are located, was the scariest part of the house. It was dark, but that part of the house was faintly illuminated by the moon outside. I stayed there for at least three minutes, just to observe. I suddenly felt goosebumps all over my body. As I neared the bathroom, it felt sinister. I didn't go inside because my instincts told me not to. I managed to take photos inside the house. My phone didn't catch anything paranormal, but all the photos are super creepy. When everybody is outside, Bob confessed that the bathroom was the most haunted part of the house. Locals claimed that a girl was brutally murdered inside the bathroom and that she got strangled by barbed wire. Fourth stop was the morgue. Firstly, I never like going to a morgue especially if it's dark and abandoned. I was very nervous the moment that we entered the morgue. To add to the scare factor, they had a mannequin lying at the center, covered with a white cloth. I know it's staged, but it still creeps the hell out of me. While Bob was talking about history, it started to get cold, but weirdly only on my right side. No one was standing to my right. There was nothing there but a door that led to the laboratory. A cold breeze passed through the door. I wasn't paying attention to Bob's story because I felt like somebody was standing beside me. I whispered to Jace about it, so he scanned his EMF, and suddenly there was a spike of energy. He told me to calm down, but I was so close to breaking down. As minutes went by, I started to feel goosebumps on my right arm, and I could feel that somebody was actually touching my arm. It was like a gentle caress, but definitely not human. I became uneasy after we went out of the morgue, and Bob noticed. He smiled and said, The resident ghost liked you, didn't he? Really, Bob? The fifth stop was the shower block. The shower block is the most haunted place in the whole queue station. During that time, those who were sick had to take a shower of carbonic acid, not water, at the shower block. The acid killed fleas and ticks in seconds. Two days after, your skin starts to peel off. It was dark and eerie as we entered the shower block. The stench was still there, and I felt lightheaded. The same feeling when you just got out of a boat ride. Bob told us that there are shadows lurking around the dark corners of the shower block. For 15 minutes, we were instructed to roam around and observe. He told us to go to the corner where we felt the most uncomfortable. I had goosebumps as we passed by the center aisle and turned right, since we both felt uneasy on this side. As we were walking back to the center aisle, I felt that somebody was watching us from behind. So instinctively, we turned our heads slowly, and there we saw a dark figure peering from the corner of the block. I am pretty much sure that my mind was not playing tricks on me. The figure was tall, about seven feet, and it was darker than the dark. All of a sudden, it came right after us. I don't know what happened next, but Jace and I were back at the main door of the block in a jiffy. Whatever that thing was, it scared the crap out of me. The two were lasted for three hours. It was already 12.30 a.m. when we went back to the parking lot, safe and sound. I honestly don't know what to feel after the tour. I was physically and mentally exhausted. Nonetheless, it was a great experience. It finally validated that I am sensitive to the paranormal. I do believe in ghosts, and I don't easily get scared by them. But my experience at Q Station was overwhelming. A lot can happen in three hours. And this happened a few years ago, when I was around the age of 18. My group of friends and I were staying at this friend's late grandparents' house in a ghost town in the mountains of Italy. The house is built on two floors, with a small courtyard on the front, and stairs connecting the two floors on the outside of the house, accessible from the courtyard. 
When this happened, we were chilling out in the courtyard. Some other people and I were facing the entrance of the house, and we were able to see inside of the second floor, specifically the one central corridor with the door to the different rooms. Two people got inside the house and went to the bathroom, which is at the end of the corridor, on the right. A few minutes later, they got out and called out for us, asking if somebody had opened the trap door leading to the attic, which is located at the very end of the corridor, right outside the bathroom. That's where things got weird. There was no way for someone to open the trap door, as you would have needed a ladder to get up there, since the ceilings are quite high, and the only ladder could be found at the ground floor, locked behind the front doors. Also, all of us who were facing in the front of the house and looking directly to the inside should have noticed if someone or something was moving. And similarly, the two people in the bathroom should have noticed something too, as the bathroom has one of those opaque glass doors. As soon as we all realized that there was no way somebody in the group could have done that, we all got inside the house, but nobody had the courage to really go up into the attic. So we just closed the door and tried to go on with the day. But everybody kept feeling quite uneasy the entire time, seeing weird shadows or hearing steps coming from the attic. I reckon that could have easily been because of the suggestion, but still. I don't know how we managed to do that, but eventually we all went to sleep. And the morning after, some friends finally decided to go up and check the attic. The room was completely bare. The only thing they found up there was a hammer, standing on its head in the middle of the room. It's fair to say, that only creeped us out all the more, and it really didn't make us want to look into whatever had happened. So again, they just got out of the attic and closed the door. We were all very glad to go back to the city later that day. This just might be one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. My family and I just moved into a little house, nothing too fancy. We'd only been living there for a few weeks when paranormal things started happening as soon as we entered the attic. It was like we disturbed the demon or spirit when we went in there. Everyone who went up there had a bad feeling about it. At first, I was the only one who realized what was happening. I remember me laying in bed everything a silent stone. I was peacefully watching TV, and then I heard whispering in my closet, which was right in front of me. As I laid there, paralyzed, I remember thinking to myself that I could get up and slowly check. Keep in mind, I was only seven or eight. As I sat there negotiating with myself, I finally was persuaded to go and check. It sounded like at least five people whispering. But as soon as I opened the closet door, nobody was there. The only thing there was all my clothes, but they were swaying back and forth. And it couldn't have been the wind or anything like that, because I checked if the closet doors had made a little wind and the clothes didn't move. This went on every night for about two weeks. Then my family started to catch on. My grandma had been staying at the house visiting and had to sleep in my room with the dog. The next morning, my grandma tells me that my dog was growling at the closet all night and that something evil was in there. After that, the whispers stopped, but the weird noises, things being out of place, and things like that didn't quit. After a while, we got used to it, but that's when things just got worse. This one night, I had to take a shower, and I went to bed as usual. No whispers or anything, I just went straight to sleep. The next morning, I woke up with three scratches down my stomach. I thought it was the dog at first, but this is the weird part. My mom and grandma both described it as if it looked like something went inside me and scratched me from the inside out. At seven or eight years old, I got a little freaked out by that. After that occurred, we blessed the house, but things just didn't stop. My mom and I rode our bikes to the store. And when we got back, we saw a little girl standing in our backyard. 
So we searched for her, thinking she was lost or something, but we found nothing. Our yard was fenced in, too, so I'm not sure how a little girl would have gotten there. Then after that, things stopped. I mean, we would occasionally get a few things here or there, but nothing too serious. A few years passed, and we eventually moved out. I don't know what it was. A demon, a lost spirit. I'm just glad I don't have to deal with it anymore. Gold Coast Encounter by Lena. I've always been a skeptic. Ghost stories and supernatural tales were just that, stories. But my experience on the Gold Coast shook that skepticism to its core. I was vacationing in Surfer's Paradise, drawn by its beautiful beaches and lively atmosphere. I rented a small apartment near the beach, a quaint place that seemed perfect for a relaxing getaway. The first few days were exactly what I expected, sun, surf, and the bustling nightlife. But things changed on the fourth night. I returned to my apartment late after a night out. The place was dark and I was too tired to bother with the lights. So I stumbled into my bed in the dim moonlight. Just as I was about to drift off, I heard a faint whisper. It was so soft that I thought I had imagined it. I brushed it off as the wind or maybe a neighbor, but then it happened again. This time, the whisper was clearer, almost like somebody was in the room with me. I sat up, my heart racing, and scanned the dark room for any sign of an intruder. Nothing. Trying to calm my nerves, I got up to get a glass of water. That's when I saw it a shadowy figure standing in the corner of the room. It was human-shaped, but seemed to be made of darkness, darker than the surrounding shadows. I froze, not sure if I was seeing things or not. The figure didn't move. It just stood there, like it was watching me. I reached for the light switch, my hands trembling. The moment the light flooded the room, the shadow vanished. There was no one there. No way that somebody could have hidden or escaped without me noticing. I didn't sleep much that night, and the next day I asked the landlord if there had been any strange occurrences in the apartment. He seemed uneasy, avoiding my gaze. He mumbled something about previous tenants complaining about weird happenings, but nothing concrete. The following nights were restless. I would wake up to strange noises, whispers, and once, a chillingly cold breeze that seemed to come from nowhere. Each time I turned on the lights, the room was empty, but the feeling of being watched never left. On my last night, things escalated. I woke up to the sensation of somebody pressing down on my chest. I opened my eyes to the horrifying sight of the shadow figure looming over me. Its form was more defined now, almost like a person cloaked in darkness. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I just lay there, frozen in terror. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it vanished. I was left gasping for air, my heart pounding out of my chest. I turned on every light in the apartment and stayed up until dawn. I cut my vacation short and left the Gold Coast the next day. I couldn't shake the feeling of that shadowy presence. And even now, back in the safety of my own home, I sometimes catch glimpses of something out of the corner of my eye, or hear a whisper in the quiet of the night. Part of me thinks I'm not rid of that shadow, at least not yet. I've always been a big fan of ghost stories and spooky things, but I've never had a story happen directly to me. I've always wanted to or have been excited by experiencing these things. I've just never had an incident that has made me fully commit to saying I've had a ghost experience. 
However, I usually ask people that I'm comfortable with, do you have any ghost stories? Most of the time I hear some pretty great stories. I have a lot from family and some crazy ones from my girlfriend who I think is like the boy from the sixth sense. I'm generally quite a skeptic, but I have fun getting a spooky story nonetheless. Last night when I was at work, I asked my boss if he has any ghost stories. He said that he did. He told me this story whilst cleaning up the bar that he owns. I can only take it as truth as he admitted to me that he's still somewhat skeptical about it all, but the more he thinks about it, the more he thinks it was a ghost encounter rather than just a strange occurrence. This is a story that he retold to me while we both admitted to getting goosebumps. My boss Tom was living in the UK and was moving out to Sydney, Australia to work on a big project that required long round-the-clock hours. This included working primarily in front of his laptop. Tom's wife's stepsister owned a house here in Sydney that was located in a rather old-timey area near the ports and docks. The stepsister was going away for a while and offered her townhouse for Tom to stay in whilst he was working on this crazy busy project. So he flew out and stayed there by himself. The main bedroom was located on the top floor of the townhouse. At the far end of the room, there was a slant in the roof that only gave a small amount of distance to the floor and the roof. So the designers made a built-in wardrobe to make use of the awkward space. The bed was situated near the doors of these wardrobes, though I don't know how far. One night when Tom was asleep, he was woken up by the sound of deep sobbing. He woke up in a panic and was thinking that it was possibly a fox, as they roughly make the sound of a crying baby at times. The tone was kind of low and made him think that it was a man. He also noticed that the cries were coming from the wardrobe area, which also backed into the wall that was shared with the neighbors. Not thinking much about it, he thought maybe the neighbors were having a rough night and he tried to sleep again. This happened again the next night, and then the night after that. Eventually, Tom was woken up by the sobbing sound and started to get more suspicious of it rather than ignoring it. He sat up in bed and was looking at the wardrobe doors in the dark. He heard the cries for a moment until one of the wardrobe doors popped open right at the moment that he was sitting up paying attention to them. Tom jumped out of bed at this sight and raised his fist in the air, getting ready to punch or defend himself at whoever came out of it. But no one did. Nothing did. He stood there for a moment, then grabbed his bag and hurried downstairs. Tom, sitting in the lounge room downstairs, got his things and prepared for the day and decided to stay at a friend's house for the remaining days he had in Australia because he was getting too spooked to go and sleep there another night. Trying to be rational about it, Tom thought that maybe the things in the wardrobe were pushed up against the door and it just popped open. The more he thinks about it though, the more he thinks about how strange it was. He never spoke to his stepsister about it, out of embarrassment, I guess. Years later, they were at a family function and he was talking to her about the time he stayed there and asked her about her neighbors and who lived next door. The stepsister said to him that the next door house had been unoccupied since she bought the place. Nobody was living there. I have strong reason to believe that Tom was telling the truth in this story, as you just tell when people are trying to get a rise out of you, you know? Or tell the best story in town? This just wasn't the case. Either way, after hearing that story, I just had to share it. Last year, my husband and I were babysitting our niece and nephew. Their family lives about an hour and a half from where we live. On this particular visit, their parents were out late, so we didn't actually begin to head home until about one or two in the morning. The area that we live in is in the southeast of the United States, and it is very heavily wooded in most areas. The roads are pretty secluded, and houses are usually far apart from one another and can be miles back off of the actual roads themselves. When we left, my husband was driving and I was in the passenger seat. We'd been traveling down an empty road for probably 45 minutes. 
there were no houses off to the side, just guardrails and woods. It was slightly foggy as well, but not bad enough to impair vision. I'm not sure how to transition into the next part, other than saying that suddenly something really weird happened. I was staring straight ahead, also assuming that my husband was as well since he was driving, and a man just appeared partially in the road on my side. He wasn't fully in the road, but enough to alarm an unsuspecting driver in the middle of the night. He was a young man, blonde, and he was wearing a white tank top and brownish-orange pants. He had nothing with him. He was just standing there. I recall the weirdest part of this entire encounter was the way that he was standing and how he was looking at me. He had his back partially turned toward the car as if he was walking, but stopped in his tracks. His head was turned facing the car and his eyes were locked, and I mean locked, on mine. I know that sounds like bull, especially being as we were going 55 miles per hour with bright headlights on and it was the middle of the night. It's probably impossible that he even saw me, let alone locked eyes with me. But that's exactly why this freaked me out so much. We passed him as quickly as we came upon him and then he was gone. I looked at my husband and laughed and said, that was freaking weird. He just looks at me and says, what are you talking about? After asking him several more times, it was determined that he didn't see this person. From my point of view, it was impossible that he didn't see him. This person was almost in the road and was a striking contrast to the surrounding scenery due to the bright clothes he was wearing and how the headlights really displayed that. I didn't even consider this to be linked to a paranormal occurrence until after I realized that I was the only witness and also after I gave more thought into how the whole scenario made me feel really... off. Just how this person really seemed to be looking right at me. I just don't know what to think. If I was going to have a paranormal experience, I guess I should be thankful that it was just this, because I suppose it could have been much worse. This is a story that happened to me years ago that I never really talk about much. I thought it might be interesting to tell the story. When I was a teenager, I made money by babysitting. On this particular night, I was working at a house a few minutes from my home, so I had been able to work later than usual. The family had two little girls that I was watching, around four to seven years old. First, to give a bit of background on what the home looked like, which will be important later. The house had two floors and two staircases that led to the upstairs. One set was off the kitchen, and the other was in the foyer. This home had an alarm system that would beep three times when any door was opened, although it would not say which door it was. I was sitting in the kitchen at around 11 p.m. and coloring to pass the time at the kids' table. The parents had said they would be home between 11.30 and midnight, and I was starting to get antsy to go home. I heard the alarm for the door and got up, expecting to see the parents coming in. When they didn't, I went back to what I was doing. About 15 minutes later, it went off again. This time I felt a little creeped out, so I went around checking all the doors, which I all found to be shut tight and locked. I sat back down, figuring that there must be some kind of glitch in the system. Within about a minute, the door alarm went off twice, as if two doors had been opened in quick succession, and as I stood up, I heard a little girl screaming bloody murder. I raced up the stairs into the girl's shared room, and I found them both sleeping soundly. I checked all the nooks and crannies of their room, and I remember feeling that the only thing that seemed different was that the book that I had read to them was on the floor instead of on the bookshelf. I ended up checking the stairs and the other rooms as I felt pretty unsure of the girl's safety, but I found nothing and all the doors were still locked. 
I ended up sitting back down in the kitchen, feeling stupid. And not long after, the alarm beeped once, really loudly, which I had never heard before, and the panel didn't seem to give an explanation for what this meant. After that, everything stopped, and the parents came home not long after. I managed to convince myself at the time that I was just imagining things. But after all this time, I can still remember the fearful scream very clearly. Nothing too exciting, but something that I've never been able to forget. My parents own a sprawling three-story manor, built in 1912. This house has a finished bedroom in the attic, which is mildly weird on its own. But when I turned 14 and was going into high school, I begged them to empty the junk out and let me live there, because I thought it would be totally awesome, like having an apartment away from the rest of my family. They agreed that I could do it, and I got to paint it and put in new carpet and fill it with furniture that I picked out. All vintage, because that's how I roll. The place was awesome, but the door didn't quite fit into the jam anymore, so it would swing open on its own. I wasn't exactly cool with having the door open to the rest of the attic in the middle of the night. I shut the door as tightly as it would go, and before I went to bed, I jammed it shut with my desk chair, really wedged it in there, I even had my sister test, and the door would not open from the attic side. Cool. I went to sleep. The next morning, I woke up feeling refreshed, until I noticed something. The desk chair was tucked back under the desk. The door was shoved open all the way so hard it had dented the wall. To this day, all present family members swear that they didn't do it, and I think I would have heard them anyhow. I decided that the ghosts in the attic didn't like me shutting them out. I left the door alone for the rest of my time living in that room, several years since I stayed at home while attending college. Friggin' ghosts, man. I just want to mention a few key points before I share some of the things that happened. I am not looking for attention. Everything contained within this story is 100% factual. I'm an Australian, and these occurrences happened on the central coast of New South Wales. I am an avid outdoorsman with a keen interest and in-depth knowledge of Australian native fauna. Each of these occurrences have a witness apart from myself. I don't claim these events are paranormal, yet I am, to this day, still without a reasonable explanation. Occurrence number one. I live on the New South Wales central coast in an area that has houses in close proximity to Brisbane Water National Park, literally within meters from some back fences. Myself and my partner hold a keen interest which sees us venture into the bushland regularly. For argument's sake, let's say we are avid bird watchers. A few weeks ago, the local fire service commenced backburning in parts of the Brisbane Water National Park over two days or so, which was obviously for hazard reduction. Most of the fire was directed at burning off leaf litter and dry debris, which covers the ground, in an effort to reduce the chances of spot fires, which have in the past become large fires and threatened houses and caused neighboring suburbs to be evacuated. Because of the way the back burning was controlled, it completely burned off the debris, and basically 90% of flora that was over two or so feet seemed to have survived, except for some light charring, of course. Even some grass plants survived, while others were completely burned, including their underground roots, which left large round circles in the substrate. This meant that the canopy was fully intact. And this is an important point to the story. The fire was controlled so well that the left-hand side was completely obliterated by fire while the right-hand side was untouched. 
The path is about three to four feet wide at its widest points. Anyway, about 48 hours after the fire service had finished backburning, my partner and I ventured into a large patch of Brisbane Water National Park along a track that we have walked no less than 200 times in the last decade. The first thing we noticed, of course, was the lack of small shrubs and ground cover, which had been replaced by a three to four centimeter layer of ash. It was also hard not to notice the smell and non-visible smokiness, which irritated our throats and noses. But by far the most profound thing we noticed was just how quiet it was. Usually we hear birds chirping, snakes slithering into the underbrush, lizards scampering out of the way, and ducks splashing around in the creek that runs along the whole length of the walking track on the right. Across the creek, there are literally kilometers of bush in all directions, so it was a little odd that it was so desolate, even after backburning. We decided to press on, even though we were pretty sure that we weren't going to see any wildlife. We continued along the track for another 20 minutes or so, all the while chatting about nothing in particular, when all of a sudden we both jerk our heads to the left to see two vertical vines which stand at about six feet tall and four centimeters or so in circumference come toward us like they've been shook, held back and released, sort of like a slingshot. We immediately run over to the trees, four meters or so off the track because we thought it might have been caused by wildlife. My first instinct was to look up, as it may have been a large bird fleeing, but there were no birds at all in any of the trees, and we would have seen and heard the wings flapping and it breaking through the canopy. It wasn't any type of guanas, we've only had two types which occur naturally here, and both are arboreal and will take to the nearest tree when threatened. We checked every tree, every hollow log and any type of ground cover which survived the fire and found nothing. It definitely wasn't any type of marsupial because it would have been spotted when we checked the trees and surrounding ground cover. It also wasn't any type of snake as the only arboreal snake we have locally which weighs in kilos is the diamond python which I could spot from a mile away. We continued walking for another three kilometers or so along the track and the whole time felt like we were being watched. I was quite uneasy, but that feeling completely left as soon as we turned around and backtracked and headed toward home. Occurrences two and three. My partner and I went out on another adventure, but this time we were looking for nocturnal animals to photograph. We went to a waterfall, which was only about 15 minutes from our house, but is rather secluded and completely dead at night and on weekdays. Funnily enough, it becomes packed on the weekends during the day in the warmer months. The layout of the waterfall is basically a large parking lot at the stop of the waterfall, which has a small park with barbecues, tables, and a small block of toilets. From the parking lot, you can also access the very top of the waterfall which is basically a rock escarpment with water running through it. You can also access stairs that take you down to both the middle of the waterfall, which is just a huge rock platform, and the very bottom of the waterfall. It takes about 20 minutes to walk from top to bottom. We parked the car and I grabbed my gear, which included my camera. We start making our way toward the top of the falls, which has a two foot barrier you have to step over to access the rock escarpment. Right as I went to put my leg over the fence, I heard the most disturbing noise I've ever heard. It sounded like a human, moaning in pain, but to describe it the best I can, imagine having 10 different people with 10 different voice qualities, all making the same moaning sound at the same time. I'm not one to frighten easily, but I have to admit, it sent chills up my spine. I told my partner to hurry up and get back to the car, and I locked the doors as soon as we got in and left in a hurry. Now this place is pitch dark, there are zero lights, and there's no way in hell you'd be there without a torch. Not to mention, you would be able to tell if anybody was there by the cars parked in the parking lot, as this is not a place that you would walk to. 
When I told a close friend of mine, who also frequents the waterfall to photograph wildlife, he told me that he also had an experience the night before, which was the night after I was there. He had finished work late and thought he'd go for a quick walk around to see what he could find. This was in the Australian spring, when everything is out and about due to the warm and humid weather. He said he had parked his car and got about halfway down the stairs to the bottom of the falls when he came across a snake. He was photographing it when he heard the door of the toilet block being slammed repeatedly. He started running up the steps to get back to his car and said as he was running up, it sounded like something was going mental, slamming things within the toilet block. He got in his car and left. My friend and I decided to go check out the waterfall that night to see if we could find anything. We parked the car and went straight to the toilet block. We checked the block that he had heard the commotion from and found a reasonably large amount of blood inside the basin and a small pool in the basin's soap dish. We contemplated calling the police but weren't sure exactly what we would report. We left soon after and neither of us visited the place for over a month. Since then, we've been back to this place multiple times without any incident. Occurrence number four, the last occurrence. Now on to last night. We headed out along a road on the central coast, which by day is rather busy due to the high number of residences and farms that are along this road, but by night is usually very quiet, with a few cars using it sporadically. So I have my high beams on 95% of the time. We drove along this road for about 40 minutes in search of marsupials to photograph. This road intersects large masses of bush on both sides. I would also like to add at this point that this road is not straight or level by any means. There's a mixture of turns as well as slight to aggressive inclines and declines along basically the entirety of this road. After driving for 40 minutes without any luck, we decided to head back along the same route we'd taken. We were driving for about 10 to 15 minutes on our way back when we hit one of the very slight gradual inclines along the road. When we were about halfway up the incline, I noticed something in the distance, maybe 200 to 250 meters or so, which I initially thought was a shadow being cast from residual lighting of my high beams. All of a sudden it moved from the middle of the road to the right side. At this point, and while the figure was still in motion, I asked the passenger, and the person who's been present for the last three unexplained experiences, can you see that? To which they replied, yeah, what is that? We got to the top of the incline and onto level ground once again, and stopped in the location that we saw it. I stopped and I pulled out one of my torches and surveyed where we'd seen it. To my surprise, where it had crossed to was a small property which was essentially a house with a very small paddock with horses out in the front. But what caught my attention was that the horses were not startled in the slightest and could actually see one of them close to the fence, calmly eating. After about two minutes of surveying the area, I continued along the road and asked my passenger exactly what they had seen. They relayed exactly what I had seen. A tall, six-ish foot but with about two and a half foot wide profile but rounded figure. It was very hard to gauge an exact height because since we were on an incline, the perspective was a little off. For instance, say a person was to walk in that exact spot, we would only be able to see them from the knees up due to the blind spot on the summit. My passenger added another piece of information, which was that it was rusty colored. I couldn't make out a color, but I have to admit that I was not paying as much of attention to it as I was the road. I was going at about 70 kilometers an hour, so I really had to focus on driving while also trying to get to the summit as quickly as possible to see what it was. I would also like to add another detail, which I find is rather strange. While I couldn't see the figure's complete leg area, it didn't seem to be walking in a normal fashion. It's almost like it was gliding across the road. I know that seems odd. If I had to liken the body shape to a known animal, it would definitely without a doubt be an orangutan, but standing a fair bit taller and not as hunched in the lower back area. 
So there you have it. I no longer live in that area. I now live 40 minutes north of there, but I still visit often due to having family there. I would like to point out that all of these incidents happened within about a six week period, which all seemed to start with the hazard reduction backburning. Australian summers are harsh. I've not had any weird happenings since then and I still spend a ridiculous amount of my time out in the bush. I also work in a scientific field. I work with wildlife, so I know which animals are endemic to Australia, and I know that what I saw is not. My partner and I are good friends with another couple that we often go over to hang out with. We'll call them Ashley and David. We go to their house about twice a week and nothing out of the ordinary ever happens. We usually just hang out and talk for hours with a few beers. David has mentioned a few times that he has seen Ashley's deceased brother around the house. Ashley always rolls her eyes and says that she doesn't believe in things like that. Ashley took her brother's passing very hard, and she was very close with him. Fast forward to today. Ashley has a son, and we'll call him Adam. She called me and asked me to watch him since he was home sick from school while she goes to work. I agreed and came straight over. Everything was normal. Adam was at the dining room table. He was playing a game on the laptop, still in his pajamas. He's a great kid, never complains or gives anybody trouble. I went to the restroom, which is down the hallway past the living room. This bathroom shares a wall with the master bedroom bathroom wall. As I'm doing my business, I heard the water turn on and off twice from that bathroom, followed by talking. I can hear what sounds like two people talking very fast but it was muffled. I didn't think much of this. I figured Adam must have wandered in there with the two dogs. He's nine and talks to the dogs like most kids do. I came out of the bathroom to find him still in the same position at the kitchen table and the dog sleeping on the couch. I asked him, hey buddy, did you go into your mom's bathroom and have the water on? He looked puzzled and said, no, I haven't left this table and I don't go in there. I then went to the kitchen sink and noticed it was dry. So the water I heard being turned on had to have come from the master bathroom. What about the talking I heard? I chalked it up to maybe the next door neighbors. A few hours go by and Adam is on the couch with me, watching TV as well as the dogs. I start hearing things being moved in the master bedroom, almost like someone is cleaning up picking things up and setting them back down. The dogs then start to bark and run to the master bedroom door. This repeated itself every half hour or so until David came home. I explained my experience and he just smiled and nodded. I asked him what he was smiling about and he said, Ashley's brother's ashes are in the bedroom and she recently got the ashes of her stepdad from her sister she mixed the ashes. That's probably the talking that you heard. Her brother and her stepdad. They used to sit in the garage together and just chatter away through the night. At this point, I'm creeped out. David is glad that someone believes him now. I told Ashley about my experience, but she refuses to believe any of it. I personally think she's in denial, which I don't blame her for. It's scary stuff, and it's hard to believe unless you experience it for yourself. I've never seen anything paranormal, and I hope I never do, because just hearing things gives me enough chills to last a while. When I was a kid, I lived in Clinton, Tennessee. Both parents worked full time, so I was often sent over to stay with my grandparents, who had a plot of land in the vicinity of, but not right in, Mossheim, 
near Greenville. Both of them had been in East Tennessee for their whole lives and that area for a good many years. They had been established at their home for some decades before this story and remained there a good time after. Recently, I had reason to return to that area in Tennessee after having spent the majority of my adult life in Minnesota. Being in and around the area, driving the same roads, made me reminiscent about my lazy summer days tucked away at my grandparents, learning to shoot on the same 22 with which grandpa had taught mom, feeding fish at a neighbor's stocked pond, or spotting deer and bear with binoculars from the back porch. When I relayed this to my mom, she in turn told me a story about a time that I scared my grandpa half to death, then lied about hanging out with Bigfoot. At first I had no idea what she was on about. Then I remembered exactly what actually happened with startling clarity. New context given by the experience adulthood provides. And no, this is not about Bigfoot or a cryptid. Before we start, some information about my grandparents' land. Their house was on a small hill surrounded by a grass lawn. The lawn gave way to a smallish hayfield and then the wood line. Those woods lasted for a good half mile to either side of the home and a good several miles to the back. I hated the hayfield because it was too pokey to play in, but I liked to hang out in a creek that ran behind it. To get there, I would walk to the edge of the property, just in the wood line, to avoid the hay. While at my grandparents, the only rules were that I stayed where I could see the house, so the house could see me. I was to take a whistle with me anywhere that I went. I didn't take the whistle, seeing it as a badge of my regrettably young age, and the best part of the creek was out of sight of the house. That was the only stretch where it got deeper than my knees, and thus the only part where I could swim. Naturally, I spent much of my time in that water splashing around, skipping stones, and being a kid. One day, I was playing in the creek when I noticed someone. It was a man, a stranger, on the bank watching me. He had long hair, a beard, and pale skin so dirty that it was stained. I couldn't tell his age and simply thought of him as old. I have no better guess now, as he clearly went through long years of hard living. He wore no shirt, no pants, only a wrap of dirty cloth around his waist that I thought of at the time as a Moses dress, thanks to some illustrated Bible stories. Around his neck, there were multiple necklaces made from knotted tatters of cloth, fiber, and string. In those knots were various pieces of bones, flowers, a bit of dark glass, things like that. When I first saw him there by the creek, I was terrified, terrified, frozen still. The man, however, was smiling. He gestured from his squat with an outstretched arm, fingers down, in kind of a wave. I didn't react, startled and reeling. Then he splashed at me, still smiling. He did it again. I splashed back, and soon we were playing. We both threw water at each other. He jumped into the creek and stomped around with me, laughing all the while. He threw rocks into the water, and so did I. I pushed him, he pushed me back. We carried on for some minutes, until my grandma called for me. With her voice, a switch had turned off. The man stopped in his tracks, gaze fixed back toward the house. Then, as my grandma kept on hollering, he looked to me. He crept back to his side of the creek, barely disturbing the water, then slid into the brush, completely silent the whole way, holding my gaze. Once he was out of sight, I waited in the water until my grandma found me. She wanted to know if I was alone, and I said no. She became very tense, asking who was with me while looking around. I didn't answer. I didn't know how. Seeing no one, she pulled me back to the house without any more words, grip like iron the whole time. At the house, the real inquisition began. 
I didn't really have new words, the event and this reaction overwhelming my ability to explain. Such silence further irked my grandma and I was swiftly placed in a corner, held without bail, awaiting patriarchal judgment. Around an hour later, my grandpa came home from work. He was told about my churlishness and was ready to set into me again with talking. I told him about the man, hairy and old, dressed like Moses, about how we played and he disappeared. I remember that they digested this for a few minutes before sending me to my room, and I was happy to go, and happier still that Grandpa didn't yell like he usually did when I misbehaved. Later, I was brought out for dinner. I ate in the kitchen with Grandma, but Grandpa called me to the back porch. He was on the swinging bench, looking out over the hayfield turned red by the setting sun. He had kicked off his boots and put them next to his shotgun. I knew that that was odd for the gun to be out of the closet. Previously, we had used it to shoot bottles. Some I would throw into the air like they were clay pigeons. These escapades were accompanied with speeches about how the gun was dangerous and only for adults to use. He went through my story again, his tone deadly serious. Eventually, he asked me how hairy the man was really. I told him very, thinking that this was the right answer. He asked where, and I told him everywhere, like a bear. He ruminated on this, and I grew more nervous, worried that I was in trouble or causing trouble, just wanting the trouble, whatever it was, to end. So when he finally asked me to swear, in the name of Christ and on my mother, that I was telling the truth about everything, I said that I had been joking. He finally yelled then and sent me back to my room. The family memory became that I had hid by the creek and made up a tale about Bigfoot. At the time, everybody was upset with me, and I was forbidden from going back to the creek or anywhere out of sight. The enforcement of this rule, like the others, was lackluster. Even so, for a time, I didn't go there. In my memory, I stayed away for a very long time, but I'm sure it was only a few days that hiatus feeling interminable to my elementary-aged self. When I did start going back to the crick, I took a bucket of toys and a thick stick plucked from the woodlands on the way. I think I was conflicted about what to do if the man came back, imagining either impressing him with my toy collection or clubbing him, or both in turn. When he did show back up, he appeared next to me as I dozed under a tree on my side of the crick. I was once again gripped with terror. He was not smiling, his face expressionless as he lurked beside me, having watched for who knows how long before I smelled him. I scrambled away, leaving behind my stick and toys. Coming to my feet a yard out, I stood in the sun while the man watched me from the shade. Eventually, he crouched and started to look through my bucket. I remember becoming indignant as he examined my toys one by one, only to toss them into the dirt. It became too much and I started to lecture the man, telling him how he got me in trouble and he was a weirdo and he stank. At some point, he stopped looking through my things and calmly watched my tirade. Face still neutral, eyes analytic. Once I had concluded my lecture, I sat back under the tree to pout I remember the man made a noise, a grinding kind of snort, and when I looked over at him, he was chuckling while he inspected the last few figures in my bucket. I wanted to laugh too, but I was more determined to stay sullen. Once everything was out of the bucket, he put one figure, Ghidorah, back into the bucket. He then stood to his hunched fullest, took the bucket by its handle, began to make his way back into the woods. I stayed by the tree until he turned, said something, not a word that I knew then or know now, and gestured with a forward sweep of his hand. At first I didn't comply, despite knowing that he wanted me to follow. After a few moments, he yipped, clicked his teeth, and gestured again more emphatically. With this further prompt, I did get up and come along. 
the man making approving noises and putting on his smile again. We went into the woods. The man led, but he was naturally quicker and quieter, making it hard for me to keep up. Eventually he would stop where he lost me, knocking on trees with sticks and whistling arrhythmically so that I might find him in the vegetation. He never came back for me, opting instead to guide me forward with the noises. I became lost, having only a vague sense of my grandparents' place behind me. After some time, maybe 15 minutes, we came to a bald. The man had me wait there, indicated by patting the ground, before going into the tree line alone. He returned from a different direction, pulling a sled. It was made from half of a discarded plastic drum and lined with small pelts and smooth bark. On the back half, there rested the fly-covered carcasses of squirrels, possums, and other critters savaged into anonymity. On the pulling end, woven pouches were tied into place on it by the same eclectic cordage that made the man's necklace. He put my bucket on the sled and tossed Ghidorah in a pouch. He then called me closer with a glottal noise and a beckoning wave. I saw the sled's pouches held many odds and ends, dried salamanders, mushrooms, metal bits, glass fragments. From one, the man pulled a square made from bound together sticks just big enough to slip over my wrist. From another, he pulled a piece of fool's gold and a small shard of geode crusted with a bit of purple crystal. These he handed to me with an air of busyness and a few more utterings of nonsense. He then patted the ground for me to sit again. I did so without much bewilderment, understanding that we had traded the same as exchanging Pokemon cards at Rhesus. I did not much miss Ghidorah anyway, as he was a bad guy. The bucket was a loss. In retrospect, I think Ghidorah was chosen because its dull gold scales resembled something valuable. The bucket for its obvious ability to hold things. The man came back lapping his thigh. I did this readily. During the hike back, I tried to keep up and pay attention. I did so moderately well, having to be whistled over a few times. I did notice that our path was not straight. The man led me one way and then another, making turns unneeded by the lay of the land. We eventually came out by the creek, but from a different approach than we had left it. I could hear my grandma calling for me again, not from up on the hill, from far out in the field. The man would not cross the creek, but pushed me to do so. I did, but not to go to my grandma. Instead, I crept back to the house and around the opposite side. There, I laid in the shrubs by our front door, pretending to sleep when I was found. I swore that I had been there the whole time. When I was sent back to my room, I placed my fool's gold, crystal, and charm in my bedside table for safekeeping. The next day, I went back into the creek to pick up my toys. The man was not there. However, throughout that summer, he did visit me again, to sit under the tree or throw rocks at the water or yammer softly to himself. I would bring snacks and candy to share, and he would likewise give me stringy dried meat, which I ought not to have eaten, or honeysuckle blossoms, which I would still eat, taken from my old bucket. He seldom visited long and never splashed and whooped like the first time he did on that first meeting. At this point, you might be wondering why I've posted this to Backwoods Creepy and not Backwoods Weird but Wholesome, I guess. Well, that's because there are two more occasions that I want to tell you about. One gruesome, one awful. The eventful one occurred near the 4th of July. I had brought two boxes of bang snaps to the creek. The man was initially wary of the little fireworks but quickly came to appreciate their miniature pyrotechnics. He took the box I gave him gratefully, even taking the empty box, likely for the wood shavings, which are excellent tinder. During the use of the bang snaps, I had scared a turtle into the water and to the opposite bank. It sat there watching us from the far shore. If you're squeamish about animal stuff, this is probably a part you should skip. 
The man, after stowing the bang snaps in the bucket, noticed the turtle. With little thought, he scooped up a smooth stone and threw it with force and accuracy into the turtle. He then waded over to retrieve the slider, which struggled meekly in his grasp, one leg knocked off clean. On my side of the river, he took from the bucket a new piece of stone. One side was rounded and fit in his hand. The other came to a flinty cutting edge. Working with deft experience, the man began chopping the live turtle above its neck, pulling up on the shell top. I'll spare you the rest of the details, but the thing struggled and it was horrible to witness. The man rinsed the shell in the river and offered it to me. In wordless horror, I ran. That evening, I came back to shuffle the dead turtle into the flowering waters of the creek. The shell itself was nowhere to be found. This experience did not deter me from going to the creek or the man from visiting again. However, sometimes he would try to call me away from the creek with thumps and whistles. I would tell him I heard him and refused to move. On some occasions, he would join me. On others, he would leave. The last time we met, we were sitting under the tree sharing cowtails. From the woods, there came whistling and the staccato knocking of a woodpecker. The man looked up and whistled back. There were a few more such exchanges before he stood, collected his bucket, and beckoned for me to follow. I was curious, and I felt comfortable with the man as a guide, so I did as I was asked. He took me to the bald, a direct path this time, periodically stopping to call or respond to the other in the woods. Waiting for us at the bald was a woman and a child. The woman was dressed the same as the man, topless and wrapped around the waist. She was dirty, with long hair and a wiry frame. The child was in a similar state, wearing a sack that went to their knees. The man sat on the ground and the woman joined him, sitting in his lap but leaning forward so that her elbows rested on her crossed knees. She had dark brown eyes that were fixed to me. The other child would not look up. I didn't know what to do and I didn't speak. The other kid lifted their sack to wipe at their nose. The man made a noise and drummed on the woman's back. The kid looked at them, still hanging her head, hair covering her face. The woman yammered and swatted at what I now figured was a girl lazily. The man echoing her noises, slapping skin to skin once more. At this bizarre scene, the girl stumbled toward me, stopping close enough that I could smell her and hear her wheezing breath. She was thin but not emaciated and slightly taller than me should she have straightened up. The man and woman fussed some more and the girl leaned close and pressed her cheek to mine. Her hair was in between us, greasy and cold. She made no move to embrace me, no move at all, only pressing limply against me and breathing so loud that it was all I could hear. During this time, the woman had approached. She pulled the girl back by her shoulder with one hand and delivered a flurry of slaps to the crown of the girl's head. The woman then gathered the girl's hair into one hand, using the other to sweep back her bangs. The girl was then made to look at me, face bare. One side of her jaw was bulged out, smooth skin over a lemon-shaped bump. Her mouth was twisted by this deformity, her nose faced to one side as if affixed sideways and leaked a trail of clear snot. One eye was bulged and roomy, the other startlingly regular. It looked at me, blank and dark brown. The woman gave the girl's head a little shake, spat off to the side and then cooed like a dove as she smiled at me. I fled. There was commotion behind me. I think the girl was pushed to the ground. I did not look back and they did not pursue. My flight ended at my grandparents' house, my absence unnoticed. I chose not to tell anyone what had happened, wanting to forget and not wanting to get into trouble again, not thinking about the girl, the couple, and what might have been intended for me. I spent that August inside whenever I visited my grandparents, 
I begged not to be taken, claiming that it was boring and lonely. Sometimes when I sat on the porch or went from the car to the house, I'd catch a snippet of a bird call on the wind or the distant tapping of wood and hurry inside. My grandma could tell something was wrong and made an effort to entertain me in town. My grandpa cared in his own way, involving me in his errands as he never had before. Eventually, school started. Classes and friends eased me away from the thoughts of the dirty man and the people in the clearing. Time did the rest. I think now that all of the people in the clearing were a family, but their features, white skin, brown eyes, brown hair, are common enough that they all could have been unrelated. They knew each other's signs and signals. They used their own words. I know that the Smokies are full of tales of feral people, wild men, and superstition. I also know that they are full of people living in unlikely ways in unlikely places, and that those real people call others kin. And that, through the chain of human connection, even a recluse living in a rundown shack is someone's somebody. I guess I'm asking if the people in my story are somebody, someone too, or if they're known, if their behavior rings any bells, belies any known intention. I figure that wherever this tale goes, maybe somebody will know who they are, and hopefully you won't discount this tale out of hand. Either way, now that I've remembered everything about that time period, I doubt I'll ever forget it again. I know this story is probably the most cliche, horror movie plot sounding thing in the world, but I assure you that it's 100% real. For reference, this happened in 2013. There's this family that I babysit for. They go to church with my folks and are truly the nicest people I've ever met. They're devout, non-denominational Christians, and they don't believe in ghosts or spirits or even demons, really, just as a background. They also live in the boondocks of suburban Georgia. I mean, they're not too far away from civilization, maybe five minutes to the nearest 7-Eleven but they're far enough removed from society that you can't see their house from the nearest paved road. The dad's a contractor. He bought the land and built the place himself. It's actually really nice, but it's in the middle of the forest, which makes the place creepy from the get-go, but I digress. The house itself is a one-story ranch style. The front door opens into the living area and the bedrooms are off down the hall to your left. The kitchen and dining area is to your right, and beyond that, the garage. The first and only time I stepped foot into the place was August of 2013. Like I said, we live in Georgia, so it feels like Satan's armpit outside, but the house is freezing. Not air conditioning cold, either. It's that unnerving, bone-chilly kind of cold that no amount of blankets can rectify. I actually checked the thermostat a few times during my stay, and it was set on 76. My teeth shouldn't have been chattering. Something else that's weird, and I feel like it ought to be mentioned before we get started proper, it's dark in the house. Even with the lights on, it's hard to see into the next room, and that's in broad daylight. At night, it's even worse. I never really understood how they lived there. I'm not one for sunny days, but I do like to see where I'm going. Anyway, so the parents leave for wherever they were headed, and the kids, a boy about six and a girl about three, are fed, washed, and in bed by 8.30. Now I'm left to my own devices, and I end up channel surfing. For a while, maybe an hour, everything is hunky-dory, and then I hear the garage door open. A minute later, I hear the back door, the door that leads from the kitchen into the garage, open and shut, and footsteps wander around the kitchen. The kitchen floor is made of stonework, so it has a pretty distinct sound when it's trod upon, especially by dress shoes. 
My first thought was, oh, they're home early. Fantastic. So I turned the TV off, straightened up the couch where I had been lounging, and prepared to greet them. But I looked down the hallway, and it's dark. All the lights are off at that end of the house. Now, if you look down the hallway, you can see into the kitchen, but you're looking directly at the door that leads to the garage. There's nobody there. Nobody opened the garage door, and nobody is in the kitchen. Meaning that nobody just made a hell of a lot of noise that I can't explain. So I'm freaked, but I do the thing that everybody does. I go to check it out just to make sure. Except that uh, I flipped on light switches because I've seen enough horror movies to know that wandering around in the pitch darkness is no bueno. I checked everything out. Nada. Door's still locked. Garage hasn't budged. Now I know I heard what I heard. I'm pretty sure it wasn't something in the show that I was watching. I legitimately thought the parents were home. Whatever. I shake it off and settle back down again. Maybe my mind is playing tricks on me. Isn't that what everybody says the first time something weird happens? Another 15 minutes go by and I'm engrossed in one of the Harry Potter movies when, during a lull in the film, I hear it again. Garage door, back door opening and shutting, footsteps in the kitchen. Only this time it's accompanied by voices. I mute Harry and look over the back of the couch fully expecting to see Ma and Pa strolling into the living room. Of course, there's nothing there. After maybe a minute, the voices disappear. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but there were definitely at least two, and one of them was definitely male. Once again, I get up and go look in the kitchen, flicking on lights as I go. This time, I'm greeted by something new. The refrigerator door is standing wide open. They have one of those fancy stainless steel gizmos and the thing swinging back and forth like a leaf in the wind. Now this is haunting 101, right? Every ghost learns to stomp around noisily and open doors on their first day, I guess. But this thing had a childproof locking mechanism on it. Great. So now ghosts can not only open doors, they can solve complex tasks to accomplish the feat. I shut the fridge and wander back down the hallway again. But I don't get into the living area good before it sounds like all hell's broken loose in the kitchen. It's kind of hard to describe the loudness of this noise. It was as if every piece of china these people owned had been taken out of the cupboards and hurled to the ground simultaneously, ceramic shattering against stone. Well, great, now I'm in trouble. Casper's gone and destroyed the flatware and I'm going to be blamed for it. I run back down the hallway, but the kitchen is in order, not the remotest sign of damage. The noise wakes up the kids, and they come out of their rooms rubbing their eyes asking me what's happened. My skin is crawling, but I don't want to upset them. So I lie, and I tell them that I'm sorry, but it was just something on TV, and that the noise got a little louder than I expected. The boy buys the fib. He toddles off back to bed like a good little soldier, but the girl isn't so convinced. In fact, she looks directly past me, down the hallway to the kitchen, as if she knows exactly what it was that woke her up. She sees that I've muted the Chamber of Secrets and asks if she can stay with me for a while, just until she feels like she can go back to sleep. I'm freaked out enough at this point to agree, Having a three-year-old for company is better than none at all, right? So together we settle back on the couch. She ends up curling up right next to me and nodding off in a matter of minutes. For a while, things are peaceful. The movie ends and I'm sitting there watching the credits scroll and listening to the theme music when, for no apparent reason, the fireplace next to the TV bursts into flames. Reminder, these people live in the woods they don't have any newfangled, fancy pants, gas fireplace that you would expect to see in a house in a subdivision. They use actual wood and kindling and actual matches. So while there's always the possibility that they had lit a fire and just didn't put it out all the way, please also remember that we're in Georgia in August. 
Nobody in their right mind burns a fire in the dog days of summer in the South. It just doesn't happen. But here I am, staring at the roaring, cozy-looking fire, and about that time, I hear the garage door again. This time, however, it's actually the parents. They come traipsing in, jangling keys and dropping their crap on the counter, turning on lights and calling out for me. Dad makes his way into the living room and notices the fire. If you were cold, you could have just adjusted the thermostat, he says. Curious, but not upset that I've apparently decided to set up camp in his living room. I tell him that I didn't start it, and that it started all on its own. He just kind of looks at me funny and mentions that they haven't used the fireplace since the winter before, so there shouldn't be any reason for it to be lit, which I already knew, but ultimately just sort of brushes it off. I figure, whatever, he's obviously got bigger balls than I do if that doesn't freak him out. The mother comes in and picks up the little girl to take her back to bed. She's still half asleep, and I can hear her tell her mom, the old man lit the fire again. Now I know she's half asleep and could very well have just been dream talking, but I somehow doubt that. And I can guarantee you that there was no old man in that house with me, at least not one that I could see. I don't stick around to answer any questions about why the girl was out of bed or who the old man was that she was talking about. The dad pays for my time and I dip out as quickly as I can while still being polite about it. I never went back there to babysit the kids. And just four months after my experience, they moved out of the house that the father had built from the ground up. They said it was something to do with his business, taking him into another town. Funny though, they sold it to another couple in the church, who also moved out within three months of moving in. They wouldn't talk about why, just made vague excuses when my parents asked about it. I don't know who lives there now, if anyone. Something Told Me to Go by user Call My Bluff, posted to r slash backwoods creepy. I've debated posting this for a long time, but never got around to it, mainly because I try to keep this memory out of my brain. This might be a long one, but this is a creepy thing that happened to me about four years ago. For starters, I grew up in Southwest Saskatchewan, and I moved on to my aunt's farm in 2019 to live in the other house that is on their property. The house is fairly old, but I loved it. It wasn't long after I moved in, though, that I started to feel uneasy in the house alone. I would close every window when it got dark, as it felt like something was watching me through them every night. Eventually, I decided to get a puppy to keep myself company when my boyfriend at the time was at work or away from the house. It helped to have the company, but I was always dreading having to take her outside when it was dark. For a bit of scene setting, our house sat on the left side of the gravel road. At the back of the house, there was about 10 meters of backyard, and then there was the cow pasture and the cow barn. We didn't own cows, but in the summer, another farmer would rent our pasture space, and so we would have them on the property. It wasn't uncommon at night to hear coyotes surround the farm either, and there were tons. Every so often, when I'd go out with my puppy, we'd hear them all around us, too close for comfort. We had a farm dog, too, who would keep the coyotes away for the most part, as she was huge. But every so often, she would wander elsewhere on the property to scout, and the coyotes would get a little too close for comfort. They always tried to lure my puppy out to them, but luckily I kept her leashed. Now, one thing you should know about my pup is that it takes her forever to find a spot to go potty. This is still a problem today, four years later, but back then it was the bane of my existence. She would pace for at least five minutes, and that was only after finding a suitable spot. 
Sometimes we would be out there for damn near half an hour, just so she would go and not go in the house. Another problem of hers, huskies, am I right? On this particular night, it was raining pretty heavily. I was not happy to be out there, and she had decided that she wasn't going to go until she found her perfect spot. We had already been out there for 15 minutes, and at this point, she was also getting frustrated with the rain and wanted to go inside. But I really wanted her to go before we went in, since we'd already been out there for so long. So as any annoyed puppy mother would do, I started to get a little bit frustrated and I would repeat, go, go potty, every time she would get distracted from her objective. It was dark, I was cold and annoyed, and to make matters worse, the cows behind us were fussing fairly loudly. This was out of the ordinary for them. They were usually quiet and sleeping at this time of night. I was also hearing what sounded like a strange bird whistling, but I shook it off as probably being an owl. I tried to keep it off my mind as I kept shouting and pleading, go, go, go potty, through the rain to my small fuzzy white asshole. I was facing away from the pasture and suddenly in my left ear, I heard it, go. Now one thing you should know about me is I have a very strong flight response typically, but this froze me on the spot as I was mostly just confused at what I had just heard. I tried telling myself that I didn't hear it. I tried telling myself that it was just a moo from a cow that I had heard wrong. But again, as if spoken directly behind me, I heard, go, go. It sounded unnatural. It was like it came from somebody who had never spoken a word before, a raspy, deep monotone. It almost sounded like it was coming out of an old radio, but of course there were no radios out there. Every time it said it, it sounded the exact same as the first time it was said, and whatever it was had started repeating it, as though it had been taught a new word and now it was its favorite. At this point, I spun around to the pasture to find nothing there. Then, again from behind me, go, go. This had all happened in the span of about three seconds. And at this point, I remember shouting out loud, all right, don't have to tell me twice. As I picked up my little fur ball and made a dash for my front door, I swiftly locked both doors behind me and sat bewildered in my kitchen. Puppy went back to puppying immediately, obviously unbothered by it all, and happy that mum wasn't making her stay out in the rain any longer. I picked up my phone and called my aunt, asking her if my uncle had been out in the field with the cows. She said no, and I explained to her what I had just been through. She sent my uncle over to check the pasture, but soon after he told me he hadn't seen or heard anything. He said he would check the pasture again in the morning. I spent my night hiding from the windows, with the lights and TV on loud enough to not hear anything outside. The next morning, when my uncle checked on the pasture, he found two calves dead. I suppose that explains the colossal cow panic that had ensued the night before. I regret this, but I didn't push for more information, as at the time I honestly just didn't want to know. But they told me the other day that they didn't find anything out of the ordinary. A few months later, I moved off the farm. I just couldn't be in that house alone anymore, and my boyfriend and I had parted ways. A few months after that, I started going to therapy for the paranoia that this had caused me. I started feeling like people were watching me and were out to get me. Another few months after that, I moved out of the province for good, and I finally felt safe. I'm wondering if any of you have any idea what this would have been. There's no chance that it would have been someone in our field. We were pretty far away from town and neighbors, and we have cameras that would have seen anybody enter our property. Coyotes are common, but I don't think they're capable of speaking. Any ideas? The Yowie. 
by Indignant Sloth 023. For years, I had heard stories of the Yowie, Australia's version of Bigfoot, but I'd always dismissed them as folklore. That changed during a camping trip in the dense eucalyptus forests of New South Wales. I was exploring a remote area, far from the well-trodden tourist paths. The forest was dense, the air filled with the scent of eucalyptus. It was the perfect escape from city life, or so I thought. On the second night, something unusual happened. I was sitting by the campfire, the only source of light in the pitch black forest. That's when I heard it, a rustling in the bushes, too heavy to be a small animal. I initially thought that it might be a kangaroo or a lost hiker, but then the rustling grew louder, closer. Curious and a bit unnerved, I grabbed my flashlight and shone it toward the noise. The light caught something, or someone, standing at the edge of the trees. It was tall, easily over two meters, and covered in thick, dark fur. For a moment, I froze, trying to process what I was seeing. The creature was humanoid, but not human. Its eyes reflected the light from my flashlight, giving them a ghostly glow. It stood there, watching me, its chest rising and falling with deep, slow breaths. Then, as suddenly as it appeared, the creature turned and vanished into the forest. The underbrush shook violently as it retreated, leaving behind a heavy silence. I didn't sleep that night, and at first light I packed up and left. Along the way, I saw large, unusual footprints near my campsite, deeper and larger than any human could make. Later, I did some research, and I found the tales of the Yowie, how it's apparently been seen for generations in these forests. Most locals just take it as a mystery that was better left alone. And I decided that maybe they were right. I wanted to share an experience that still freaks me out just thinking about it. Just down the road from where I used to live a few years ago in southeast Australia is the opening into about a hundred acres of woodland and bush. I frequently went in there when I was younger to do the usual things, riding and camping, etc. I was out driving at about 11.30 p.m. with my girlfriend, and as we were in the area, I decided to show her the woodlands while we were there. She loves everything to do with nature, and it was summer, so it was extremely warm. I left my car with the lights shining into the trees as we weren't going in too far, and it was pitch black inside. The two of us just sat, having a smoke, chatting, and generally relaxing. She was sitting on a sort of map of the area that had been put in some plastic and I was keeping an eye on the trees as I had a feeling that something was just wrong. I've read stories before about people who felt like they were in danger, even though nothing around them was perceptibly off, and this was that same feeling. Every sense was almost reaching out, and my adrenaline was up, but there wasn't really anything in my eye line that seemed any different. After lighting another cigarette to calm my nerves, I scanned the tree line again and realized that it looked different from before. It was only after staring into the darkness that I saw that there was moonlight, which was now lighting up grass. Before, it couldn't reach the grass, and it dawned on me that that was because there was a black shape blocking it. I assumed it was a tree. The only way that I can describe it was that all sound just ceased and everything went dead silent. A few seconds later, this disgusting feeling of dread fell over me, and I saw motion in the dark of the path as this thing crawled toward us on all fours. I've seen nearly every animal in the outback here, and we don't have any large predators like in the United States or Europe, but somehow I knew this thing was a predator. 
and it wasn't hiding itself from us, just slowly crawling toward us. I don't know if my girlfriend saw it or not, as I couldn't look away, but just as it reached the line that my car lights were able to illuminate, it reared up onto two legs and just sat, staring at us. I'm 6'4", and this thing was about another meter taller than me, with arms that were far too long, that reached down near the ground. All I could make out was an off-white, almost yellowish fur on it, and in the dim light, could make out the silhouette of its head as being that of a dog or a wolf. I wasn't able to move as it stared at me, but it was at this point that my girlfriend gasped, which seemed to break me out of whatever was stopping me from thinking logically. I grabbed her by the arm and we sprinted to the car, slammed the doors and tore out of there as fast as I could. Both of us were too scared to speak until about a half an hour later. We've both discussed it many times, and the feeling that we had was what I imagine a rabbit sees when it catches a wolf or a fox looking at it, that this is something that would be able to end us with absolute ease if it chose to. Neither of us have ever been able to come up with any explanation for what it was, but it has definitely changed the way I view the woods and bush when I go camping or hiking now. Every time I go out, I think back to that day, and I wonder what it was, and if I'll ever see it again. The Haunted Outback Station by Outback Packer 93 I've traveled through the Australian Outback several times, but my last journey left me with an experience that still haunts my dreams. It happened near an abandoned sheep station, a place where the sunsets paint the sky in fiery hues and the nights are as dark as pitch. I was on a solo road trip, following a dusty trail that cut through the heart of the Outback. I planned to camp near this old sheep station that I'd heard about from a local in town. They said it was abandoned decades ago, left to the mercy of time and the harsh outback elements. I arrived at the station as the sun began to dip lower, just below the horizon. The place was a crumbling relic, its once busy yards now overtaken by the wild. I set up camp, cooked a simple meal, and settled in for the night. As twilight deepened, I noticed something odd. There was a figure standing near the old water tank, a silhouette barely discernible in the fading light. Thinking it must just be another traveler or a local, I called out a greeting. No response. The figure just stood there, motionless. Curiosity overcame me, and I grabbed my flashlight, heading toward the figure. As I got closer, the air grew inexplicably colder, a chill that seeped into my bones. The figure became clearer. It was a man, dressed in what looked like old-fashioned shepherding garb, his face obscured by the shadow of his hat. I stopped a few meters away, unsure of what to say or do. Then, the figure slowly lifted its head, and I saw its face, or rather, the lack of it. Where features should have been, there was only an empty void, a darkness deeper than the night around us. Fear gripped me, rooting me to the spot. The figure took a step forward, and as it did, it began to fade, becoming more and more translucent until it vanished altogether, leaving nothing but the cold night air and a lingering sense of dread. Obviously, I didn't sleep that night. Every sound seemed amplified, every shadow a potential specter. As soon as the first light of dawn broke over the horizon, I packed up and left, not stopping until I reached the bustle of a nearby town. Later, I learned that the station had a tragic past. Decades ago, a young shepherd had vanished while out in the fields. His body was never found, and it was said that his spirit still wandered the outback forever bound to the land he once tended.
The Great Ocean Road by Macy L. It was during my time as a backpacker in Australia when I stumbled upon something I still can't quite explain. I had been traveling along the Great Ocean Road, soaking in the breathtaking views and the sense of freedom. One evening, I decided to camp near the Twelve Apostles, those magnificent rock formations that rise majestically from the Southern Ocean. I set up my tent on a secluded patch of land, away from the usual tourist spots. The night was clear, and the stars were particularly bright, adding to the sense of serenity of the place. However, as I settled into my tent, an uneasy feeling crept over me. It was a sensation that I couldn't shake off, a sense of being watched. Around midnight, I heard a strange noise outside my tent. It wasn't an animal. It was a soft, rhythmic tapping, like someone gently knocking on a door. I thought it might be another traveler, perhaps lost or in need of help, so I unzipped my tent to look out. What I saw was baffling. There was a figure standing near the edge of the cliff, silhouetted against the moonlit sky. It was tall and slender, and seemed to be looking out at the sea. I called out, asking if they needed help, but the figure didn't respond. It just stood there, eerily still. Curiosity overcame my initial apprehension, and I decided to approach. As I got closer, the figure turned toward me. That's when I realized this was no ordinary person. Its features were indistinct, almost like a shadow, but with a faint luminosity that seemed to be from somewhere else. I stopped in my tracks, my heart pounding. The figure didn't seem threatening, but its presence alone was intimidating. It then raised what seemed like an arm and pointed out toward the sea, before turning back and vanishing into thin air. I was left standing there with my mind racing. I looked toward where it had pointed, but I saw nothing unusual. The sea was calm and the Twelve Apostles stood silently in the distance. I didn't sleep much that night. In the morning, I asked around in the nearest town, but nobody had heard of anything like what I had described. Some locals did share tales of ghostly sightings and strange occurrences along the coast, but nothing matched my experience, and to this day, I don't know how to explain it. When I was 18, I found myself residing with my boyfriend and his family while I was searching for an apartment of my own. In exchange for my lodging, I was entrusted with the care of his three-year-old nephew. A communication barrier existed between us. He was a French speaker and I only knew English, which presented a unique challenge. On one occasion, he was murmuring something in my direction and I had to ask his mother to interpret. Drawing closer, she discerned that he was repeating my little duck over and over. In another incident, he gently pushed open my door, clutching a butter knife in his hand, cast an unnerving smile my way, and then silently disappeared. During one of our TV sessions where we conversed in English, his mother commented, Sometimes, it's as if he comprehends us. In response, he rotated his head toward us, uttered a simple, Yes, and then refocused his attention on the television. Upon my departure, he performed a bizarre act of placing his blanket in the fire and then dragging it out, causing a fire to break out in the living room. What added an even stranger layer to this tale was that my boyfriend's mother was an avid follower of voodoo, to such an extent that his father refused to consume her cooking or wear any clothes that she had laundered, just in case, I guess. He took it upon himself to roam the house each night. 
carrying a church incense burner to bless each room. Three years ago, when I was 15 and living in my village, something happened that I rarely speak about. People often think I'm making it up, but I've thought about it a lot this week, and I want others to know. My village is nestled in a rural area protected by the government, considered a natural paradise for the past 30 years. As a result, exploration is challenging since cutting trees is forbidden, which leaves a vast forest. I spent my summer there, and hiking was my favorite activity. Although I had never ventured into the woods alone, I usually stuck to populated roads, my grandma informed me that cleaning services had opened a path, long covered by trees and bushes, for an upcoming race. Normally, I would go to the nearest town about an hour's walk away by the road, but on my way back from visiting friends, I took this newly rehabilitated path alone, which turned out to be a mistake. The first part of the path was relatively easy, with obstacles and landslides, but nothing compared to what awaited. The second part was a rock-strewn hill that required me to climb like a dog on all fours. Upon reaching the top, I noticed some animal bones, but thought little of them, considering the area's known wolf and bear population. I hastened my pace, relieved to find a stretch of plain floor where the woods truly began, only to encounter a dead end. Some massive trees had fallen in a row across the path, blocking passage. Oddly, beside these trees stood a small, seemingly abandoned barn in a clear field, devoid of trees, bushes, or large plants. It shouldn't have looked like that if it was truly abandoned. I grew concerned about the coincidental location of the fallen trees, the suspicious barn beside the clear field, and the fact that the path had been closed for 30 years. Something seemed really off. Continuing on, I approached the last hill my grandma had described, which led to the village. Suddenly, a silence fell, allowing me to hear branches cracking behind me. At first, I thought it was a bird, but the sound grew closer resembling footsteps. Trying to convince myself it was an animal, I quickened my pace, and so did the footsteps. Terrified, I began to run, and so did whatever was behind me. I then heard incredibly loud grunts, my heart pounding as I sprinted towards safety. I reached my village in a minute or so, bursting into the patio of a relative's house and closing the door behind me catching my breath for 10 minutes or so before returning home. Even now, recalling the place, the lack of a signal, and those haunting grunts chills me to the bone. I can't shake the feeling that something was following me, that the barn and the trees were merely distractions to slow me down. Needless to say, I never ventured into the woods alone again. When I was four years old, I was living in Australia, Gold Coast to be exact. I don't remember much at all about that age, which is pretty normal, but there is this one thing that keeps coming back into my mind to this very day. This wasn't just some nightmare the kids usually have. I was wide awake, and I remember I felt everything that happened. I was put to bed by my parents sometime during the night. They left the room and I was all by myself. I remember trying to fall asleep, but I was suddenly interrupted by some creepy figure. I remember being pulled off my bed and dragged underneath the bed by my arms. I couldn't move at all and I was unable to speak. 
I remember seeing this very dark figure with bright eyes holding on to me. From that point on, I can't remember what happened. I don't know what that was or how it even happened. I'm pretty sure it was some kind of sleep paralysis. But if you have any idea, let me know. I want to share a few things that have happened to me since moving to the land down under. I moved to Australia in 2018, built a home with my partner in far north Queensland. The area where we built is part of the Daintree Rainforest. We are surrounded by rainforest and the Coral Sea is about 50 meters through the dense bush. Things were relatively quiet until about five weeks ago. Now, we are seeing Min Min lights, or spook lights. Little balls of light that are far too big and bright to be glow bugs, moving through the trees and about the property. We hear booms and bangs against the outside walls of our newly built home. We grab a flashlight and go out to see what's going on. The noise is so loud that if it had been a bird or a bat, the poor thing would have broken a neck or at least stunned itself. The property is fenced in, gated, and locked. There are no rocks or clouds of dirt on the concrete, nothing on the sides of our house as if kids were pulling a prank. It literally sounded like hands banging against the walls. We get up to go see, then come back in, get back in bed, and it happens again. It's like it's toying with us, being mischievous, the locals and aboriginals have told me about Yowie, which is similar to the United States version of Bigfoot. They've also told me about Bunyip and other dreamtime creatures that reside in and make the Dane Tree their home. It is one of the oldest rainforests on the planet. We are surrounded by the beauty of nature, and now it's like every night is a new adventure. We don't know what might happen next. Nothing happens inside the home just on the property. I've done research online and at the local library. Can't find anything other than the occasional yaoi sighting. I've gotten in touch with a few ghost hunting teams and asked my questions. I'm waiting for a response to see if they might know anything. My partner's sister said that we may have built our home on a gravesite, but I doubt this. Not everything is built on a gravesite. It may just be the land itself. I know the Dane Tree is very special to the Aboriginal. It's sacred, in fact. Why is it that when things like this happen, I never have my cell phone in hand? It's like I'm so caught up in the moment, all I can do is experience it. But I'm going to try to capture something on film. I'd really like to know what's going on. My grandpa was born in the last years of the 19th century and spent his entire life living in rural Idaho as a farmer and rancher. He has tons of old cowboy stories and he would always tell us grandkids. Most of them were funny, some were cautionary, but a few were downright creepy. When my grandpa was six years old, he, along with his older brother and a gang of kids from the nearby farm, decided to go ice skating for the day. At that time, my great-grandpa was working as a ranch hand and the family lived near Chesterfield, Idaho. Now it's mostly a ghost town. It was a bright and sunny January day in 1902, and though the temperature was low, the sun kept things somewhat warm. They had hitched sleighs to their horses and headed down to the Portno River to ice skate. There were eight kids all together, and they were excited to show off their new skates for Christmas. Along with my grandpa and his brother, there were the three Robinson kids, Tommy Bear and the Gooch twins. 
The best spot to skate was next door to the Gooch's ranch. The river there was broad and shallow, so the ice tended to be thicker. And if they did fall through, they would just get their legs wet. The kids spent a couple of hours skating when a loud scream came from a willow bush on the riverbank opposite them. The kids could only watch as a giant man, covered head to toe in thick black fur, came lumbering out of the bushes. It was carrying a large tree branch and was screaming in rage at the kids. They had fled toward the sleighs trying to scramble up the riverbank in their skates. My grandpa, being the youngest, was at the back of the rush. He couldn't get a good foothold because of the skates and he fell backwards toward the ice. The giant was now crossing the river toward them, screaming and swinging his branch. My grandpa was sure that this creature was going to eat him. As my grandpa tells it, Lady Luck smiled down on me that day by the river because as the giant was midway across the river, the ice gave way. It only submerged to its shins, but it slowed down considerably as it tried to get back on top of the ice. This gave my grandpa's brother enough time to jump down and cut the laces off my grandpa's skates. They left the skates and dashed up the riverbank and jumped onto the sleigh. As they looked back, the giant man was cresting the riverbank. To their relief, it did not chase the sleighs. It just stood there, hollering at the kids and swinging its tree branch. The kids were able to make it back to the Gooch Ranch where they told their encounter to John Gooch, the twins' grandfather. Word spread quickly in the tiny farming community and soon a posse was formed to hunt down the wild man. Where the kids had been skating, there were footprints, almost two feet in length that the group found. My grandpa's skates were found near the tracks. They had both been bent in half like horseshoes. The tracks headed west into the nearby mountains. The hunting party followed them as far as they could, but deep snow prevented any further travel. The creature was never sighted in that area again. The story captivated the small community and soon word traveled across the country of the Idaho wild man. That spring, my great grandpa decided to buy a ranch in the little lost river valley farther north in Idaho. My grandpa had many other weird and creepy backwoods stories, but he always said that this encounter frightened him the most. He was sure that he would have been killed if that giant hadn't broken through the ice and given his brother a chance to cut his laces. This story happened many years ago, around the months of June and July. My family and I often go up and vacation at a cabin in Yungaburra, Cairns, Australia during the winter. We do this as we miss the cold days that we would get from our hometown of Toowoomba during the winter as Cairns is tropical, so it's summer 24-7. Yungaburra is a very, very small town that resides on top of a hill. It's one of those towns that if you blink, you'll miss it. However, it's quaint and friendly. It's historical, with about 150 or more years of heritage. As usual with rich heritage and small towns, local folk legends from over the years accumulated. One of these legends ended up coming true. We rented this cabin that was on the brink of bushlands, and it was next door to an old farmhouse that has quite a bit of land including some of the bushland the cabin backed onto. To get to the cabin, you had to walk up a somewhat steep dirt road that also leads to the aforementioned farmhouse. The dirt road also had a medium-sized pond that ran along it. This dirt road came off one of the main streets of Yungaburra. Anyway, on our last night staying there, I went to the pub to see one of my good friends who lives in Yungaburra. I had to drive early the next morning, so I didn't have a drop of alcohol. He, on the other hand, did not have anywhere to drive the next morning, so he pretty much drained the pub. 
It got to about 11.30 and I decided that I'd better get back to the cabin to go to sleep. The cabin was only a 15 minute walk. So after saying my goodbyes, I started to walk back. As I was walking, I realized that not driving was a dumb idea as it was about five Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit. I had a very thin jumper on and that was it. As I continued to walk on, it grew colder and I started to shiver big time. I finally reached the entrance to my driveway and God did it look ominous. There were no street lights leading along the dirt road, so it was pitch black. I decided to get out my phone and turn the flashlight on. It was at this point that I knew something was very wrong. After I turned my flashlight on, fog started to roll in. At first it was only light fog, but it continued and developed into heavy fog. And then it surpassed heavy fog, and then I could barely see my shoes below me. All I could see was white in front of me. I said to myself, well, here we fucking go, something's about to happen, get it over and done with. My flashlight was now rendered superfluous. I decided to stop walking as I knew that there was a steep ditch with a pond at the bottom, and the last thing I wanted was to fall into it. As I stood there, only getting colder and even more terrified, I saw a lantern in the distance, a small amber light coming down the driveway. Then I heard, son, is that you? Come here out of the fog, follow the lamp. It was my mom. I couldn't yet see her, so instead I followed the light. I continued to follow it for about three minutes, safely walking up the dirt driveway. I saw the light climb up the steps and I heard the door open, so I knew that I was near the cabin. Then the light went out. I continued to walk in the direction that I had seen it last. I was calling out for my mom to turn it back on, and there was no reply. I finally ran into a wooden guardrail, literally, and some steps. I walked up the steps and instantly my knees felt weak. They had turned to jelly. I wasn't home. I was on the doorstep of the old abandoned farmhouse. The door was there, swaying open in the gentle wind, making a sinister creaking noise along with it. There are three things you do in this type of situation. The three F's, if you will. Flight, fight, or freeze. And I was frozen to the core. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't turn around and find my way back. I was definitely not stepping foot inside that house. I was stuck. I then heard a voice coming from inside the house. My son, welcome home. Nasty weather, hmm? The voice no longer sounded like my mom's. It had a prominent British accent. It was then that I realized I would rather be out in the fog than standing on the doorstep of this house. I quickly walked down the stairs. I heard the voice now yelling, my son, where are you going? I started to sprint, but as I was running, I smashed my foot and leg against some sort of stone and fell flat onto the ground. It took a chunk out of my knee and I had cuts all along my hands. I still have some scars from it. I turned around and realized that I had not tripped over a stone. Well, not any stone. I had tripped over a tombstone. At this point I screamed, got up and started to run even more. I was screaming for my parents and started to slow down to a jog. I stopped. I thought that I got far enough away from the house. Until little amber lights, at least six of them, started to surround me. They started to come closer. I found a gap between them and ran for it. Yet again I felt like I was sprinting for my life. It was like I was in a race, but the metal at the end was just my life. Before I knew it, slam, I ran straight into a wall with my head being the contact point. I blacked out, and from what I can remember I was woken up by my dad who heard something smack into the cabin. Apparently when he went out to get me, he saw one little amber light flickering near the farmhouse through all the fog. That was the end of my night and any vacation near that cabin. We decided not to leave early the next morning to give me some time to rest. 
This also gave me time to ring up my friend so he could come over, and perhaps give me some insight into what I had experienced and what my dad saw. He and I sat out on the patio. I could see the farmhouse, only about 500 meters away. It looked old and desolate. This is the folk legend, according to him. Apparently, back when the small town was first being founded, that farmhouse was one of the first ones built, late 19th century, during the 1910s or something. A well-known mother, Anne was her name, had let her son play with some of his mates down on the main stretch of town one day. It started to get late, and as it got later, Anne grew more worried. Then, heavy fog started to roll in. She decided to get her kerosene lamp and go looking for him. As she walked down, she could hear his footsteps, and she told him to follow the lamp. When she made her way back to the house, she was not accompanied by her son. It wasn't until the next morning that they found him dead in the bottom of the pond. He had hit his head hard and died instantly. The grave is apparently that of her son's. The mother apparently searches for her son on winter nights and lures males from the pub on late, cold, dark nights, mistaking them for her own lost son. The young Abura fog is one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. I've gotten used to generic things, stuff moving, stuff missing, shadows, all that sort of thing. So I wanted to share something truly unique that happened to me. This story happened about four years ago. I'm in my late 20s and so is my friend. It was around June in Toowoomba, Australia. My friend, let's call him Mark, asked me to come pick him up from his college, Downlands. June is when it gets coldest in Toowoomba, and that night I remember it reaching negative four degrees Celsius, or about 25 degrees Fahrenheit. It was around 6.30 when I reached the college. Mark is a teacher there, and apparently his car had stopped working. I wandered through the dark trying to find the admin block. I finally reached the block, and Mark was inside. He looked shaken up. I asked him what had happened. He said in a shaky voice, He's here. A ghost. We're at the school too late. He's been moving stuff. Now, as you can imagine at this point, I started to absolutely freak out. Dallin's is a boarding school, so I knew there was a small amount of people still there. However, the boarding block and admin block are far, far apart, and I was not about to wander through the dark pathways with Mark spouting the stuff that he was. Instead, I decided to go back to the car with him. So we locked up the office and cautiously walked out. We were blindly walking the concrete path in our thick jumpers. The wind was making an eerie, howling noise as it started to blow gusts. Then I saw a flickering light, an orange light, coming from behind us. All of a sudden it got really warm, and I mean a quick, sudden boost in temperature kind of warm. We were about halfway down this hill, so Mark and I turned around to see what was at the top of the hill. This still freaks me out when I think about it. It was a man on fire. He was standing there watching us. When we turned around, he stared at us for about five seconds, although it felt more like five hours. He then let out the most horrendous scream and started to run at us. Mark and I ran and fell over the side of the path. The man on fire ran past us, down the hill and into the forest. I got up and I looked down toward the oval. He was still running. He just came out of the forest and was running toward the road, until both he and the fire vanished. At that point, we decided to run to the boarding block to find another member of the faculty. We reached the block, and we found one of Mark's colleagues. He let us stay the night. We were told that it was a really common thing to see if you stayed in the admin block too late, or if you were walking those paths at that time of night. Even from this block, Everyone can hear his screams, at least once a week, they say. Apparently he terrorizes the school grounds at dark. The faculty member, who was also a teacher, said that he had only seen the Burning Man once. 
When I asked Mark the next morning what he had seen in the admin block, he said, All the drawers started to open, and I heard a voice say, The fire has been lit. When I first started to work here, the office ladies warned me that I shouldn't stay late near the building. Now I know why, he concluded. Before we left the next morning, we went to the admin block and asked the office ladies if they had ever seen him. We went in and saw a younger lady in her thirties. She asked, do you have an appointment, Mark? No, he said. We just wanted to ask if you've ever seen... Then an older lady, maybe in her late sixties or early seventies, came out from the back and said, You two saw the Burning Man, didn't you? Mark replied, Yes, we did. We saw him last night. The old woman came closer and said, Yes, all the drawers were open. I've seen him many a time. Not a pleasant experience. Try not to stay late, and if you do, don't come anywhere near this building. The younger lady spoke up. I've seen him twice. I hated it. I've never stayed late again. We both left, and Mark got the day off. I never stepped foot on those school grounds ever again. This is by far the spookiest experience my family and I have ever had regarding the paranormal. I'm currently living in Australia, and this all started when I moved into my current house around three years ago. In my culture, we believe that whenever a family moves into a new home, a priest should come to perform various prayers to bless the house. However, when my mom bought the house, we immediately went on holiday for three months, so we were unable to perform the rituals. Everything started when we first came back to our house. Just some background. My mom raised me on her own, so it was just the two of us staying in the house at the time. I was still in high school and my mom worked in the city, so we both took the train every morning. My mom always left home earlier than I did, so it was my job to lock up every morning. My mom worked late almost every day so I would get home first and be home alone for at least five hours every day. One morning as I left home, I began to feel paranoid that I had not locked the door. So I went back to check it. The door was locked. Later that day when I came home from school, I walked up my driveway to find that the door was standing wide open. I freaked out, but because I was brave enough, I went inside. Our kitchen is pretty close to the entrance, so I grabbed a knife and searched the entire house. There was no one there. I decided not to tell my mom because she was already really stressed with work, and I didn't want her to freak out. Over the next few days, other strange things started happening. For one, our garage door would randomly start opening whenever we were home. My mom was kind of scared, but then we thought maybe our neighbor's garage remote functioned at the same frequency or something, and it was activating our door too, so we dismissed it. It had been about two months since we were living in our new house, and everything seemed to be normal again. Until one day, when I was awoken in the middle of the night by my mom. She looked super scared and asked me if I had come to her room to wake her up. I said no, I was half asleep and I had no idea what she was rambling on about. She didn't believe me and made me swear that I hadn't. I always play scare pranks on my family so I can kind of see why. I swore I didn't and I asked her what was going on. My mom is a super light sleeper and so while she was sleeping, she heard somebody prop her door open. She looked up and saw the figure of a boy and thought it was me. So, she asked it what was wrong and blinked, and there was nothing there, but her door was still open. She called my name a few times, and there was no response, hence why she came into my room. I have to admit, given the stuff happening with the doors, I was kind of scared, but I convinced my mom that she was imagining things, and she went back to sleep. Ever since that night, up to this very day, my mom still sleeps with her door open and the living room light on. 
and I don't blame her, especially after what happened next. Two weeks after this incident occurred, my mom's best friend and her son and daughter, they were both around my age, came over from our homeland, Malaysia, to visit us. I was really excited, as I've always been close to them. One thing you should know about my aunt, she's had many experiences growing up with the paranormal, so she's super scared of ghosts. For this reason, her kids and I always used to play pranks on her. One day, the four of us were playing poker on the dining table while my mom was taking a nap in the living room. Suddenly, my mom rushes out of the living room, her eyes wide open, and she looked really scared. She asked who had woken her up from her nap. The four of us were completely dumbfounded as we'd been playing cards the entire time. She then told us that she felt someone tap her shoulder while she was asleep. When she opened her eyes, there were two feet on the floor, but when she blinked, the feet were gone and nobody was there. My mom was full on freaking out now, especially after what had happened the other night. Then my aunt, given how afraid she is of ghosts, started to freak out too. I didn't want her holiday to be ruined, so I managed to convince them that my mom was probably in the middle of a dream when she woke up, and she was probably just hallucinating. I know it sounds stupid, but hey, it worked. But then the next day, something else happened. My mom had gone to the shops to get groceries. The kids and I were playing video games in the living room while their mom was having a shower. Suddenly we heard the bathroom door burst open and out runs my aunt wrapped in her towel. She screamed at us, telling us to stop trying to scare her and that it wasn't funny. The three of us were super confused and her daughter asked her what had happened. She told us that she knew that we were the ones knocking on the bathroom door, even after she told us to stop three times. I know it probably seems like she was overreacting, but I cannot emphasize how afraid of ghosts she is. I exchanged a concerned look with her kids and then told her that it genuinely was not us and that we'd been playing video games the entire time. Soon my mom got home and we told her what happened. Let's just say that my aunt started sleeping with her room lights on for the rest of the trip. Soon my aunt and her kids had gone home and it was back to me and my mom again. We were back to our regular routine. My mom was finally at peace and she hadn't seen anything for a while, apart from the same thing with the garage door every once in a while. The same, however, could not be said for me. It seemed that it had come to be my turn to be tormented. As I mentioned before with my mom at work, I would be home alone for a few hours every day. I began to start hearing things. The strange thing is, it would never occur while I was in the living room. Whenever I went to use the toilet or went to sit in my room, I would start hearing things coming from the living room and kitchen. It started out small, just the sound of some panting, like if you'd just run a long distance. But the minute that I entered the living room, nothing. There would be no sound at all. It soon started to get worse. I would hear footsteps pacing around outside my room, and spoons and pots falling in the kitchen. But every time that I stepped out into the living room, the noises would stop and everything would be just as I had left it. There was even a time when I thought I heard a kid laughing right outside the door when I was using the toilet. I decided not to tell my mom yet because she seemed to be getting over her experiences and I didn't want to scare her again. But one day I felt that I needed to tell her and we decided that that day it was time we contacted our priest to perform the prayers for our house. It was the day that my best friend and his parents came over for dinner. It all started as an innocent dinner. My best friend and his family were Malaysian too, and we were having a great time talking about home while having a signature Malaysian meal. My friend's dad was telling us a story when all of a sudden his face just froze and his eyes widened. He honestly looked like he was having a stroke. His face contorted into a frown and he just stared down at the table. My mom and I shared a worrying look, but my friend and his mom just continued eating like nothing was happening. Suddenly his dad seemed to return to us and he continues telling the story as if nothing just happened. 
He could see, though, that my mom and I looked worried. Suddenly, his wife tapped him on the shoulder and said, Just tell them. He frowned at his wife and just kept eating. There was an awkward silence for a few minutes, and then he finally decided to address the elephant in the room. He apologized for scaring us and assured us that there was no need to worry. He then went on to tell us about his life. Since he was a child, he'd been very religious, and from a young age, he felt a very close connection to God. He regularly meditated and was very spiritual. He was so spiritual that when he came into his mid-twenties, he had awoken a gift. He was able to see dead people. I kid you not. When he said this, I immediately looked at my friend, waiting for him to start laughing at some prank. But my friend's face was dead serious, and he continued looking at his dad as he told the story. He told us that he could see them everywhere, when he was walking his dog on the street, when he was sitting in the park, in people's houses, and even sometimes sitting on people who had been possessed. He said the spirits were drawn to him because they knew he could see them, and they would stalk him, begging him to help them reach the afterlife. He said there was simply nothing he could do, because these people had died before their time, and that they would simply have to wait on Earth until it was their time. Back home, he was regularly contacted by people having paranormal experiences to perform a cleansing to drive evil spirits away. He told us about some of those experiences, but I don't feel like it's my place to share them here. He then asked us something that gave me chills. Have you guys performed the prayers for your house yet? My mom refused to answer the question until he told her why he had asked it. He said that he didn't want to worry us, and that if we hadn't, we probably should. My mom continued to ask him why, until he finally conceded, and this is what he said. Remember when I had that moment, just now while I was talking? I had a visit. I won't tell you what it was, but it was the same spirit I saw standing at the front door when we came here. That's when my mom told him everything that had been happening. It's during this time that I decided to tell my mom about the things that I'd been hearing in the house. My friend's dad then told us that he didn't think it was a malicious spirit, but to be safe it was time for us to conduct the prayers for the house. Before he left, he asked my mom if he could see our altar in the prayer room. My mom took him, and we all followed him. As he stood in front of the altar, his body suddenly shook, as if he had just had a huge hiccup or something. He then put his hands together and bowed his head. Before leaving, he said, I can see why the two of you have not been hurt. You are both protected. And that concluded their visit. A week later, we arranged for a priest from our local temple to cleanse and bless our home. I promise you that since that day, nothing strange has ever happened in our house. Even the garage door has stopped opening on its own. I'm not a particularly religious person, but I've learned my lesson. I will never move into a new house without performing the rituals that my culture demands. Something in the Outback by Roger L. I've never been one to believe in the supernatural, but what I experienced during my trip to the Australian outback changed everything. It started as a typical adventure. I was camping in a remote area, miles away from the nearest town. The first few nights were peaceful, filled with stargazing and the sounds of nature. But on the fourth night, things took a bizarre turn. I was awakened by an eerie, pulsating light outside my tent. Initially, I thought it was someone with a flashlight, but the light was too bright, and it seemed to hover in midair. Cautiously, I unzipped my tent and peered out. What I saw was inexplicable. A luminous orb-like object was floating a few feet off the ground. It wasn't any drone or aircraft I was familiar with. The orb was emitting a soft humming sound, and its light pulsated rhythmically, casting strange shadows on the ground. Frozen in fear and curiosity, I watched as the orb began to move. It glided effortlessly over the terrain, pulsing occasionally, 
as if it were surveying the area. My mind raced with questions. Was this some kind of unexplained natural phenomenon or something more otherworldly? The orb then started to approach my tent. As it got closer, I felt a strange sensation, like a static charge in the air. My skin tingled and the hair on my arms stood on end. I didn't know whether to run or stay put. Suddenly, the orb stopped, hovering just a few feet away from me. I could see its surface now. It seemed to be made of some translucent material, and within it, I could discern faint, swirling patterns of light. And then, as quickly as it appeared, the orb shot up into the sky and vanished into the night. I stood there, in the silence of the outback, completely baffled by what I had just witnessed. The rest of the night was uneventful, but I couldn't sleep. My mind was filled with questions. What was that orb? Why did it come here? Why was I the only one who had seen it? In the morning, I packed up my gear and headed to the nearest town. I inquired with locals about what I had seen, but nobody seemed to have any explanation. To this day, all I have is questions and an experience that I will likely never forget. The basement door at my house never shuts unless you push it closed. It opens up if you don't close it all the way. And sometimes I've had dreams of a person that had a blue aura or something around it and an old military uniform coming up the stairs and opening the door. The same with my cousin. Independently, she saw the same thing. A few days ago, I came up out of the basement and as I was about to close the door, it slammed shut all on its own. I freaked out and then I heard noises from down there, like somebody was walking on the stairs. I didn't check because every time I got close to the door, there was a weird noise, kind of like somebody clearing their throat. It freaked me out. A couple of years ago, I babysat for a family friend. She and her husband lived with their two kids, a girl about seven who we'll call Kay, and a boy about 12 who we can call Jay. I babysat these kids so much that we became very close, brother and sister type deal. They weren't difficult kids. They had a hard home life because their parents were borderline abusive, but they were still good kids. I tried my best to be a positive adult I was only 18 or 19 during this experience. The family moved around a lot. I've known them now for over six years and they have moved every single year. This experience happened in 2015. I was halfway through my senior year when the family moved into this house. It was really nice. It had just been built in 2013 or something like that. It was a nice neighborhood, but rent was really low. The mother often bragged about the steal of a deal she got for the house. To put it in perspective, the average rent in this area is about $1,200 a month just for an apartment. These guys got a whole two-story house, three beds, four baths, freshly built in a nice neighborhood for $650 a month. I thought it was weird and asked if there was anything wrong with the home, to which she replied that the inspection had come back clear. I didn't think much about it beyond that. I started babysitting, and I immediately felt something was off. I have anxiety, so going to new places really puts me in a funk. So I just figured that's what it was, at first. The way the home is set up is important. On the bottom floor, they had a living room, a dining area, and a kitchen with some other rooms. I spent most of my time in the living room, working on things for school while the kids were upstairs playing games or hanging out with friends. 
while you're in the living room, there's a wall that blocks you from seeing the stairs. Upstairs, there are bedrooms. Immediately off the stairs and above the living room is the parents' room, which was off limits to the kids. Then there was a loft area that looked down over the front door to make a grand foyer feeling. There's a light that can be on which can be seen from downstairs because of the loft. Then the kids' bedrooms were down the hall. So nothing really happened at first that was too mind-boggling. Little noises here and there, knocks on the walls, things being misplaced, lights flickering, but nothing that made me think ghosts. I figured they got what they paid for and my memory was garbage. After a couple of months, things started to pick up and I could no longer blame it on a bad memory or a faulty electrical system. The kids, who were usually very sweet and kind to each other, started becoming noticeably more snappy to everyone, especially Jay. He complained about having nightmares, about somebody standing in his doorway watching him. His parents wouldn't listen, though. Their behavior grew even worse as time went on. It was a weekend, and the parents were going to be gone for a while. The kids were upstairs just doing their thing. I was downstairs in the living room, looking at pizza to order for lunch. Out of nowhere, I hear really loud footsteps coming from above me in the parents' bedroom. Thunderous, even. Thinking that it was the kids being little dingus meats, I immediately headed upstairs to tell them to get out. But I was greeted with the two kids standing in their doorways, staring at the closed door to their parents' room. The footsteps and bangs were still going on inside. At this point, I thought it was an intruder. I instructed the kids to get into their rooms and lock their doors, and I called emergency and explained the situation. As I stayed on the phone, the footsteps continued to walk around the room. I could hear them moving in different locations. Two officers arrived, so I grabbed the kids and we waited outside. The banging still went on as one of the officers escorted us out. They came out empty-handed and said that there was nothing there, and that there may have been something with the door because the banging stopped as soon as they opened it. I had felt the shaking of the floor moving around the room, so I knew that it wasn't a door, but I guess in my denial I ignored it. I took the kids out for ice cream and tried not to think about it. Another time, the kids and I were sitting in the dining area eating dinner. It was just us three in the house. From the dining area, you could see the light upstairs was on, and it cast a shadow onto the floor. I was making a joke about how I'm the only one who knows how to turn a light off around here, and that's when I saw a shadow of a hand from upstairs on the front door. And I think that's when it really started settling down with me, that the house was haunted. The kids didn't see it, and I didn't tell them. I figured it would just add stress that they really didn't need. I told the parents that night when they came home, but they brushed me off, saying they've never experienced anything at all. This continued on for a while. I would experience something, the kids would, but the parents wouldn't believe any of us. It was summer, just after I graduated high school. I remember it vividly because I was awake, reading articles about a huge thing that happened in my town. That's when the banging from upstairs started happening. I was used to it at this point, but what I was not used to was the banging footsteps coming down the stairs. These steps were methodical and menacing. I felt terrible energy in the room, and it was cold, despite it being in the middle of summer in the south. I counted the seconds between steps, and it was five, every single time. I called out to the kids and told them to stop joking around, but... I knew it wasn't them. I was terrified. The footsteps stopped at the bottom of the stairs, and I couldn't see who was there. Then I saw an apparition of a little girl. She had brunette hair and a red dress. She looked innocent enough, but the energy in the room was so heavy I almost threw up. She looked at me, and I looked at her, and she didn't move. I thought I was hallucinating, so I started to rub my eyes. But when I finished rubbing them, she was still there, right in front of me. 
no longer at the foot of the stairs. I never heard her move. In that situation, I couldn't move or do anything. My mind just went to kid brain, and I hid under the blanket I was using. I called the parents crying and told them to come back immediately. When they came, the energy in the room lightened, and I finally came out from under the blanket. She was gone. They asked what was wrong and what happened, and I told them, but of course it didn't matter, because they wouldn't believe me. I then informed them that they needed to find another babysitter, because I would not be returning. I still wonder about the kids. I hope they ended up okay. They moved out of that house at the end of the year, but I'm not sure if what I saw was attached to them or not. I'm still not sure what I saw. Anyway, I still have nightmares about the girl, and it's still a really frightening event for me. About 13 years ago, my sister lived in a house in a not-so-great neighborhood. You'd come through the kitchen and then the dining room and turn left into the living room. Behind the living room was a hall to the main bathroom and all the bedrooms. The couch was positioned with its back to the hallway. At the end of the hall was a bedroom that always creeped us out. We didn't ever go in there or in the half-bath that was inside of it. She mostly has boxes in there. Well, my niece's nursery was right beside that room, and we always had weird stuff happen in there. One time, my sister was asleep and heard a voice scream one of my niece's names in her ear. She got up and ran into the nursery and saw a dark figure over the crib. My niece had gotten tangled in the crib bumpers. The figure looked at her and disappeared. Now, that was the least creepy thing. Whenever I was over, I used to have nightmares about the main bathroom being covered in blood. I have a lot of nightmares, though, so I never thought anything of it. Until one night, I was supposed to be babysitting while she went out on a date night. I was laying on her couch, and she was in the bathroom taking a shower. I'm just hanging out, and I hear her call my name. I called back, What? and she yelled back, nothing. I just shook it off as her being annoyed, and it happened three more times. Finally, I got up and stormed to the bathroom door and knocked as loud as I could. I said, you're gonna wake up the girls, why do you keep calling me? She was quiet for a second and said, I'm not calling you. I was pretty creeped out, but I went to sit back on the couch to wait for her to be done showering. Then I heard the door of the back bedroom creak. I turned around, looked down the hall, and saw the door open by itself. And then, in my sister's voice, I heard something say, Hey, come here. Nope. She moved out soon after. All kinds of crazy things happened there. We later found out that a man killed his mother in her bathroom and then killed himself, just a few years before my sister lived there. We couldn't remember the address when we found the news story, but it was on the same street and it looked like the house. It would also explain the nightmares I had, so I'm pretty sure that it was definitely that house. I was around 12 when I had gotten a babysitting job with a family across town. This family was new to the area and just recently bought the house next to my best friend's place. My first day over was to get familiar with the kids and the house. The parents stayed and evaluated me and of course answered any questions I had. I spent my time playing and keeping the children occupied. A boy named Devin, age four, and a girl named Cameron, age seven, so I had my work cut out for me. Cameron wanted me to go to her room so she could show me her toys. 
I followed her up the two flights of stairs, but as we came to the top of the stairs, I felt strangely light-headed, and the hair on my arms rose up. I had an intense feeling of being watched, like there was someone else up there with us. I tried to ignore this sensation and continued with my duties of finding Cameron's favorite doll so we could go back downstairs. At the end of the day, it was decided that I was a good match and I was to come back on Saturday morning. As I headed home, I couldn't shake that feeling that I had gotten upstairs. And I told myself, nah, it's nothing. And I brushed it off to just being in a new place with unfamiliar surroundings. That Saturday morning, I showed up to a busy home as the parents tried to get out the door and show me the last minute things I needed for the day ahead. The kids were up in their PJs eating breakfast and already talking to me about all the fun things they wanted to do today. After the parents left, I ushered the kids off to get changed. As I was cleaning up the breakfast dishes, I heard a loud bang coming from the dining room. I ran into the room and found one of the false ceiling tiles had fallen from its place. Puzzled, I tried to put it back up, but it was not an easy task. After some struggling, I managed to fit it back in. I thought, how could this thing have fallen out by itself? The day went on, and now it's close to lunchtime. The kids are watching TV, and I'm in the kitchen making something for lunch, when again I hear a loud bang coming from the dining area. I look, and sure enough, that tile has come out again. This time, I leave it for the parents to see when they get home. I figured maybe they could fix it. Now the kids wanted to play hide and seek. We started off with Cameron seeking and myself and Devin hiding. As Cameron started to count, we scurried around trying to find the best hiding place. I found the downstairs bathroom to be the best place for me. It was easy enough for Cameron to find me and I hid Devin close to me so I could keep an eye on him. As I entered the bathroom, I closed the door quietly behind me. I walked a few steps into the room and was now facing the mirror. As I was looking at my reflection, I also noticed something behind me, moving. It was the closet door directly behind me, slowly opening. The closet door opened halfway and then slowly closed again on its own. I had that same feeling come over me, the one that I had when I was upstairs on my first day. Wide-eyed with fear, I turned the bathroom door and ran out. All I could think was, what just happened? I was really starting to worry that this house was haunted, and I now had every horror movie I ever watched playing through my head. Now I'm finding that I'm really uncomfortable, but I decide that it's best to just keep occupied. I break out a board game for us to play in the living room floor. Hungry Hungry Hippo, I think it was. We were playing for around 20 minutes before I noticed something out of the corner of my eye, moving. I turned my head to see what it was. A child's shoe was tumbling across the floor, all by itself. The kid stopped and watched in utter confusion. I was in disbelief. Cameron let out a scream and she ran for the door. I grabbed Devin and followed. We went to my friend's house next door and told her mom everything. I'm not sure if she believed me, but we stayed over there until the parents got home. When they showed up, we told them what we saw. I don't think they believed me either. I showed the panel that had fallen out, apparently it's been an issue since they moved in. And as for the rest of my accounts, they chalked it up to a child's excessive imagination. I know what I saw and what I felt. I wasn't imagining. I later found out a bit of history about the house. Apparently, a man died in that house of a heart attack upstairs in a room above the dining room, right above where the panel kept falling out. Sometimes I think it was his spirit still in that house. Maybe he was just trying to play with us.
This happened when I was 12 and had just started babysitting our neighbor's three-year-old girl. I am a twin, so at that age my sister and I did everything together, even babysitting. The house next door was built in the 1800s and brought a lot of history. My grandparents actually owned it at one time before inheriting the house next door, the house we lived in. I grew up in an all-female household. My grandfather passed away when we were young. So at the current house, it was my grandma, my single mother, my twin sister and I, and our younger sister. I attribute some of the experiences to poltergeists due to the family makeup. I've read several hypotheses where poltergeist activity happens a lot around young females. Anyway, back to the story. My twin and I are at the house built in the 1800s. It's our first night ever babysitting, and it's the parents' first night away from their three-year-old daughter. The daughter screams and screams at the top of her lungs due to the separation from her parents. This goes on and on. My sister and I had tried playing with her, talking to her, singing to her, but nothing worked. This was in the mid-90s, so we, as 12-year-olds, did not have cell phones. We used our neighbor's house phone to call my grandma and mom to see what we might do to calm her down. It ends up that they have the answer. Put in a VHS of Barney. It worked like a charm. The kid calms down and goes to bed as scheduled at 8 p.m. with no further issues. My twin and I are sitting on the couch watching TV when at about 9.30, the entire house starts shaking and there's this loud pounding noise. It seems to be coming from the entire house and not one area. We had no idea what to do. We were pretty responsible at that age, so we ran upstairs to check on the baby. She's sound asleep, not even phased with what's going on. We pick up the cordless phone to call my mom and grandma, but the phone is just static. No dial tone and no other phone in the house. This is New York, so there are no earthquakes and no quarries in the area. My sister and I have seen too many horror films and we aren't separating. So we huddle at the top of the stairs where we can keep an eye on the baby, but also be in the hallway light. After 10 full minutes, the pounding and shaking finally stops. We try the phone again and it works this time. My mom and grandma didn't hear or feel anything. Both my sister and I were sure, with how loud it was and how violently the house was shaking, that it had to be felt next door and that it had to be something going on in the area, but no one else felt or heard anything. It was such a bizarre experience. We stayed the remainder of the evening with no issues, and we didn't mention it to the parents as we didn't want to come across as crazy as our mom and grandma had already made us feel that we were. We never again experienced anything like that when babysitting. We even returned to that house again, but had no further issues. I've been hearing knocks coming from the attic and from the walls for a while now. Recently, they've been happening coincidentally right under me. I'll move to one area and it will happen there. And then, on a separate occasion, I'll be in an entirely different room and still, it will knock above me or below me. I've had a history of sleep deprivation, anxiety, and depression. I've heard my name whispered in my ear, and something whisper, help me. It sounded like some kind of zombie. Recently, I've been having terrifying hallucinations. As I'm about to cross into the first stage of sleep, I always feel or hear something that wakes me up immediately, back and forth from being awake to the entering of the first stage of sleep. I feel something tug at my pillow and the mattress moving as if somebody's trying to lift it. Eventually I figured all of this was a hallucination for multiple reasons. I've recorded when I felt something push the pillow behind me and there's nothing there. 
On other occasions, I have felt tremors caused by my body, and shaking that felt exactly like what I thought something else was causing. But the noises and seeing things move on their own has been happening for a while now, way before my hallucinations. And those happened out of nowhere. I usually only have motion hallucinations, rather than seeing or hearing things. The knocking is really freaking me out. Could it be possible that I'm hallucinating all of this? Or is it actually real? Either way, it doesn't matter. I've told my parents about the experiences I've had, but they keep denying that it's real. I'm tired of living in fear. If anybody has any idea how to ignore it or get rid of it, I'd love to know. It was the year 1995, and I was a 20-year-old woman. I worked as a dining room manager at a popular breakfast restaurant. All of the employees would meet once a week at a local bar to hang out. I had to use my older sister's ID because I had just turned 20. I was excited this particular night because the manager that I had a huge crush on was coming. That night, I had decided not to drink too much, and that would probably be the main factor in my survival. The guy that I had a crush on chose not to drink either. When closing time came, we all decided to go over to another co-worker's house because we were still having fun. As I was leaving to get in my car, the guy that I had a crush on asked me if I wanted to ride with him. He said that he would bring me back to get my car in the morning. I happily agreed and I jumped in the car. As we were pulling out, he decided to do a huge burnout to show off. We got about two miles down the road when we saw police lights behind us. He pulls over and the police officer makes him do the whole, are you drunk dance. He wasn't drunk, but the police officer searched him and found a single pill that was not in its prescribed bottle. They decided to arrest him and take his car. I had told them that I was only 20, but they didn't seem to care. They told me to walk to the gas station and call somebody to pick me up. This gas station was the only place open being that it was the middle of the night. I didn't want to wake my family up, so I decided to walk the two miles back to get my car. I was afraid though, because I was aware that there was nothing open in between that gas station and the bar parking lot that my car was in. I started walking, keeping my eyes open for anything creepy. It wasn't too long before the typical abductor's vehicle pulled up. It was a big, black, windowless van. I was walking northbound, which made the passenger side closest to me. A man who was about 30 asked me if I needed a ride. I, of course, said no and continued on. He continued to ask a few more times, but he realized that I was not budging. I had that gut feeling you get when you know that something is just wrong. He just continues driving at my walking pace. He's looking around nervously. I had no doubt that he was trying to figure out how to get me. I was thinking of what I would do if he tried. I decided that if his car stopped, I was going to run to the other side of the road back towards the gas station. At this point, I was about halfway back to my car. After keeping at my pace for a while, he drove off. For a minute, I thought he had given up but he just went down a little bit and then turned around and drove past me. I watched him turn around again and head back toward me. He pulls up to me again and asks me to get in. I said, no, I don't need a ride. He just drove at my pace again. He would pull off every time another car drove by, but would come back after. Then, as we were getting close to where my car was, I was trying to decide how I could get to my car safely. The bar was in the corner of an L-shaped small shopping strip. There were about five stores on each side of the bar, with the bar being in the corner. My car was right in front of the bar, which was pretty far back from the street that I was walking on. He pulled off again, but this time, he pulled a little past the area that my car was in and parked 
turning his lights off. If I had to keep walking straight, it would have been hard for me to get by where he was parked. I decided to count to three and run toward my car with everything I had. I had my keys in hand, pushing the unlock button as I ran. I kept my eye on what he was doing as well. He pulled toward me, slowly, but I think he was wondering what in the world I was doing running into a closed, dark parking lot. As I reached my car and jumped in, he pulled right in front of it. As I was locking the door, we made eye contact. He looked shocked that I had a car. I backed out and took off. I watched behind me, making sure that he wasn't following me. After I got home, I debated on calling the cops, but I thought nothing would come of it, so, regrettably, I didn't. It was about a year later, while watching the news, that I saw him and his van again. He had kidnapped and murdered a young woman. They actually believe he killed more than just her, though. I was devastated. I'm not sure if I had called the police if anything would have changed, but at least it would have been on record. I learned that people looking for victims will often drive around to bars at closing time, hoping to find a drunk woman walking home alone. I really do believe that not drinking that night saved my life. I live outside of Melbourne, Australia. This is the crazy experience that I just had recently. I was outside on my deck having a smoke, and I looked up at the sky. Suddenly, two stars appeared directly on top of each other, evenly spaced. Then a third star appeared directly under the second star, again evenly spaced. Another star appeared blinking and moving toward the first star, then went down toward the second, then down to the third, and then away. It was moving very slowly, and each star was blinking in a pattern. I called my partner outside to verify what I saw, and he confirmed that I wasn't crazy, and witnessed the moving stars slowly move in patterns that normal craft or satellites couldn't move in. It was going up and down and away and then back, at a consistent slow speed. Something clearly had control over it. It was remarkable. We checked again a little bit later and all three stars were gone. I chatted to my housemate about it. Sadly, he was in his room at the time and didn't witness it. He said that my friend and her partner that live about 15 minutes away witnessed the exact same thing months ago. I called my friend and she confirmed that they saw the exact same thing and then her partner confirmed it as well. They even confirmed the direction they had seen it in from local landmarks and buildings, which completely matched the direction that we had seen it in. So four people have witnessed something similar in a space of like three months in our small town. Super weird. A few years ago, I temporarily lived in a cabin out in the woods with my friend due to some unexpected life circumstances. One night, we had another friend over, and all three of us had a smoke session in the backyard at about 3 a.m. That was when we started to hear a strange noise in the woods. It kind of sounded like a humming engine coming closer to us. Suddenly, my friend shouts in confusion as he explains that he briefly got blinded by a distant light. A few seconds later, my other friend notices a flying object near the treetops, about 40 meters away. When he points out that the object is see-through and that you can actually see the outlines of the treetops behind it, we are all just stunned and we just look in awe, in complete silence, until the object spirals away super fast up toward the sky in a manner that is certainly not possible with any known technology we have. Then it disappeared. We rushed inside 
and my friend had the brilliant idea to have everybody draw what they had seen simultaneously without looking at each other's to confirm what we saw. We all showed our pictures at the same time, and we all drew the exact same thing. We kicked ourselves over not recording the event for proof, but later realized that all of us had left our phones inside while going out to smoke. We joked about the light scanning us to see if we had any recording devices on us. We all went to bed, with both of them sleeping upstairs, and with myself being downstairs, alone. As I lay down, pondering over the experience and feeling a bit uneasy, I suddenly see two orbs floating around the room. One was red, and one was blue. I get a bit freaked out and pretend to be asleep while I watch these orbs float around for about five minutes, then they disappeared. Eventually, I fell asleep, and when I woke up the next day, I was eager to share my experience. They informed me that when they woke up and went outside, the door handle crumbled in their hands, like all of the components of the door handle had been dismantled. It was a very surreal experience overall. Aliens, advanced technology not known to the public, I don't know, but it certainly gives me this childlike hope that there's more to this life than the dull reality we live in. This happened a few months ago, and it's really been bugging me. I was out hiking and rappelling with a friend in the hills area near Tombstone. I want to mention that I have spent quite a bit of time solo hiking and camping. I'm used to hearing noises and brushing it off. Anyway, it's late afternoon, and I'm the first one to rappel down. I got to the bottom, and while my partner was getting ready to follow, we heard this noise that I would describe most like a growl or a snarl. It sounded like it was coming from the ridge above both of us. If facing the cliff, it sounded like it was coming from the right side. We both looked around, but didn't see anything. I encouraged him to come down, and I even half joked that it was probably just a bear or a mountain lion. At that point, I wasn't even feeling that nervous. I figured that once the two of us were together again, we would be pretty intimidating to an animal. While he rappelled down, I heard a loud crash to what seemed to be parallel to me on my left. By this point, I'm starting to get pretty scared because this sound was getting closer and closer. Somehow it had gone from right to left on an exposed cliff face without either of us seeing it. He successfully rappelled down and we both agreed we needed to get out of there. We still had a steep downhill climb to the car. We packed up the gear as fast as we could. As we get our packs back on, we heard what sounded to me like a howler monkey. The noise was close and we still couldn't see what was making it. Of course, it was from the direction that we needed to go. We hauled butt down that mountain and got in the car. I know that it can be pretty easy to let the mind play tricks, but we have the exact same account of what happened. Both of us are really familiar with what's out there, and we've never heard anything like it. Now this is the part that I hesitate to tell, because I know it sounds even more insane. But we both heard whispering and giggling, like it was right next to us, but we still couldn't see anything. I keep trying to explain to myself that our minds just played a trick. The same trick, but a trick. The first noise I would chalk up to maybe a bear or a mountain lion. Animals are stealthy. They could run in front of us without us noticing, I guess. Something else could have fallen to the right side. What made that monkey noise though? I don't know. And why do we both say we heard whispering? I don't know. I don't know if anybody else has creepy experiences in Arizona. I want to believe somebody was just pranking us, but there wasn't a single other car in the parking area. My friend believes that we experienced something supernatural. I honestly have no idea what to think.
I will start by saying I was a devout skeptic before this experience. It has changed me. It was the summer of 2016, a few months after my sister was born, and my family and I had some old family friends over at our house. We'd been hanging out nearly all day, and it was getting to be around the time of sunset. My friend and I, who I'll refer to as Adam, went on a walk to the ponds in my neighborhood and stayed there for what I remember being about 30 to 45 minutes, just enough time for it to become dark enough to see the stars. At this point, we begin the short walk back to my house when I noticed a star in the sky, which appeared to be moving. I tell Adam this, and he says that he too can see it. At this point, we're standing at the end of my driveway, looking up at the sky. We watch the star for roughly five minutes, when we notice two other stars, all of which are moving toward each other at around the same speed. Now this is where it begins to get really weird. Adam pulls out his phone and attempts to record it, but it ends up being too dimly lit for his phone's camera to see, sadly. Nearly immediately after Adam had put his phone away, all of the stars had stopped in a blank patch of sky, devoid of all other lights and stars, and formed a large triangle. These lights then began moving as one unit and turning clockwise in the sky. They remained in this formation and movement for nearly five minutes before stopping, then proceeded to move at a speed which I've never seen before, away from each other, and disappeared into the night. Based on the reactions of people back at the house, both Adam and I were visibly shaken up. When we tried to explain what had happened, they shrugged it off, as us just not knowing what we saw. I know what I saw, and so does Adam. Green Cove Springs has a history of military and government establishments and compounds, none of which are currently active. However, there is a significant amount of military infrastructure still in use as housing and places of business. It makes me wonder if this had something to do with some sort of test flight. Either way, we saw what we saw, even if we don't know what it is. I wanted to share a few UFO encounters that I've had. The first was when I was about 11. I was riding home with my dad in the car. I looked out the window and saw a ship. It was shaped more like a small city, black with multiple spires. I told my dad and he saw it as well and gunned it home. The odd part was his reaction, which is connected to the next encounter. I asked about the ship and he went ape shit, started screaming about nothing being there and that we never saw anything, even though he described it when I pointed it out. Fast forward to about four years ago, which makes me around 34 years old at the time. I was at work at the hotel and the housekeeper calls me over. It's Veterans Day, so I figure she wants me to check out the parade. Instead, she points out a white sphere in the sky. We stare at it, and it moves at an insane speed, then splits into six smaller spheres. I tell her, congratulations on your first UFO sighting. It keeps moving around the parade, and I tell her not to worry. It's probably just observing. The thing is, when I asked her later if any more weird stuff came out, I got the same reaction. Total freak out screaming about not seeing anything and it not being real. It was like the mind couldn't handle the situation and completely melted down. This final one is a bit more interesting. I had let my dogs out at night for a potty break, then a head count as they came back inside. Before I went in, I noticed a star bigger than the others. Not being a runner, I stayed put. It got closer and I got a better look. It was a four-pointed star with mini points about the size of a pressure cooker, all pulsating different colors. I decided to try some telepathy. 
I mean, I didn't do anything fancy like cross my legs and say om. I just thought in my head, like you do when you have a grocery list. I asked it if it meant any harm. Give me red for no and green for yes. I got a red for no. I asked if it came from the stars. It turned green. I asked if it was just here for recon. Again, green. Finally, I thought, okay, you can be on your way. And it flew higher and farther. My point on the last one is to try to stay calm. It might scare you, but it's the best way to remember what you saw. I didn't get any missing time or the usual stuff like strange markings. It was just an odd encounter. In my life, I think I have seen a UFO twice. I just want to know what everybody thinks. Number one, I was 14 and I was in Spain. I was looking up at the night sky when suddenly this kind of round thing flew low overhead. From what I remember, it was round with yellow and small white lights around the underside. It was really odd. I remember seeing it, but my family says it never happened but I know what I saw. Number two. This one originally looked like a star sitting outside the back of our house one night. We were all looking up and we saw this star moving across the sky. We were all like, oh look, a satellite. We were tracking it going west. But then things got strange. It stopped and started going west. You might say, oh, well, perhaps it was a plane. Planes don't move like that. It stopped again, then went north, and then it just disappeared. Just blinked out. Did I see a UFO? Ever since I was 13, in 2008, I've developed an interest in aliens and UFOs. I've grown enough of an interest to actually create a scrapbook of pictures of UFOs, declassified government documents, newspaper clippings, and things like that. All of these things were available from Google. I even recorded my own UFO sightings here and there, but I eventually threw them out because I was worried that I was sticking my nose where it didn't belong. In any case, this is one of my UFO experiences. It was somewhere between 2009 and 2011. I was around 14 to 16. It was around 8 or 9 p.m. and I was looking into the sky to see if I might get lucky and find a UFO. I noticed a large triangular shaped silhouette facing west into my backyard. It was huge and it had a red light at the center. Parts of the craft warped into a boomerang shape. One part was invisible at times and the other part wasn't. It was as if it had some invisible shield that was on and then off. It was able to change its shape from a boomerang and then into a triangle and then just disappear. In the past, I've had other UFO experiences but this one was the most convincing one of my whole life. Does anyone else have any UFO experiences? If you do, I'd love to hear them. So recently, I've been having really weird things happen at my house. Not only somewhat ghost related, but also UFO sightings at the same time. I just wanted to tell a couple of stories about my first ever UFO encounter. So I was lying in bed. It was around 1130 at night and I'm leaning to the side of the patio door from my bedroom. 
I'm thinking for a while when I look through the blinds to see what looked to be a glowing object hovering above my neighbor's house. On the rim of this craft, there seemed to be a color changing rainbow and then a few lights around it blinking. My neighbor has this really rich friend that sometimes comes to visit in his helicopter. And that's what I thought it was at first, but I swear there was absolutely no sound. I also suspected that maybe it could be a star that flashes, but it was way too close. If it was a drone, it would have made some sound, especially that close. I was amazed at this craft and I didn't know what to think. Once I got back in bed, I heard what sounded like a plane circling my house. I didn't see it, but I heard it. I thought it could be a plane, but it sounded almost fake. I'm guessing if it was the UFO, they were trying to mask the sound of it or make themselves appear like something normal. When I took a look back at my neighbor's property, the craft was gone. Another story happened about the same time that I saw this other thing. Again, it was around 1130 at night. And again, I was lying in bed, looking out the window and just sort of daydreaming. Again, I could see a light. It was glowing really white and almost pulsating. I didn't want to go see what it was in fear that it could be ETs. From these experiences, I've decided to see what it is and investigate it. I really want to go confront them. I really want to go see what they are. My mom is very religious and no nonsense. She grew up brethren, which is basically an old form of Baptist that doesn't really exist anymore. Despite her upbringing, she's always been interested in aliens. I think it's because her dad also had an obsession with them, but I don't know why. Maybe he saw something during his trucking and military days. As a kid, I always caught my mom watching those alien and UFO shows. She really wanted to see a UFO for herself. One night she was traveling down the Appalachian Mountains in Western North Carolina, coming from a festival in Eastern Tennessee. It was fall, so the leaves were beginning to become bare and you could see through them. She was driving along with my sister and my grandmother when she sees what looks like three to five lights in a circular shape. It's getting really close. My sister and grandmother notice it too. Soon it appears to be behind them, very low to the ground. My mom opens the sunroof and windows, but there's not a sound coming from anywhere. Then something my mom describes as an opaque white column comes down onto the road behind her car and is following. Like the distance between the white column and the car never changes. My mom went from curious to freaked and guns it. I think the total time it followed was probably less than a minute. Eventually, it went away without a trace. When my mom finally got home that night and told me about it, I thought she would be excited, but it nearly scared her to death. She said she had always wanted to see a UFO but that once she did, the experience left her terrified. I remember she complained about being unable to sleep for the next few nights. This was 10 or so years ago, but she still doesn't seem to talk about aliens with such frequency anymore. About two months ago, I was driving home from my parents' house late at night on a route that connects New York to Connecticut. My town in Connecticut directly borders New York State. The town has some serious hills bordering on small mountains. At one point on the route, the trees thin out to the left, revealing a large hill or small mountain, which can be seen pretty clearly from different perspectives for about two minutes. 
As I was driving on this particular night, I noticed two large, slow blinking and slow moving rectangular lights low in the sky. I couldn't see any specific features of any craft surrounding these lights, so my perspective could be off, but it seemed to me to be only about 20 meters higher than the top of the hill. I'm guessing the distance or height by how fuzzy the edges of the lights seem to be and by how large they appear to be, in addition to the multiple perspectives provided by my consistent 40 miles per hour speed on the road. When I spotted it, it was nearly directly forward in my line of sight, off to the left just a bit. In the two minutes that I watched it, it moved maybe a half a mile farther to my left. For reference, the top of the hill that I mentioned is about a mile from that road in the same direction to the left. That would mean a speed of about 15 miles per hour. The lights were blinking too slowly to be standard aircraft strobes, on for about two seconds, off for another two, in a regular rhythm. They were moving and blinking in unison, which implies that they were both part of one larger thing. They seemed to be set about 30 to 40 yards apart from one another. There was no noticeable sound, and no witnesses aside from myself that I know of. I had always thought that if I saw a UFO, I would love to follow it. But I was too freaked out, and I didn't do that. I felt like an instinctive horror. I couldn't bring myself to deliberately get closer. If there is a next time, I will try harder to overcome that. I saw a UFO, and I just want to know if there's some kind of explanation for what I saw. I didn't have my phone with me, so I don't have any evidence. But I did see a UFO. At first I thought it was a glare, but the moon was behind me and I was seeing Orion's belt and some other stars in front of me. The first one I saw was on the left. Then I realized it was moving in one direction, so it couldn't be a glare. It was going northward. I also don't think that it was a plane because of the lockdown. Planes weren't really allowed to fly, and if they were, it was really limited. I definitely know what a plane looks and sounds like, and this was not it. The thing that I saw was just silently cruising in the sky. Seconds later, I saw one to the right. I saw small dots emitting light. It was as small as what stars look like at night, but they weren't twinkling, and the lighted dots were aligned in a constant position. I also saw that it changed its angle a bit after I saw the lighted dots. I asked myself if they could have been birds, migrating or passing by, because sometimes flocks of birds fly in a V-shape, but that doesn't explain the glow. I'm not sure how high it was exactly in the sky, but it was definitely in the zone where a plane might fly, but it was way too big to be a plane. It was cruising for a good few seconds until it literally just vanished. Would there be any other explanation? Is that what a stealth bomber looks like at night? It was definitely a UFO because it was an object flying in the sky and I didn't know what it was. So it was an unidentified flying object. I just want to know if it was alien or not. It started on my commute home from work. I got about halfway through the 20 minute walk and at roughly 10.10, I saw these two flying objects that were blinking red and white. I didn't think much of it, being as I live near an airport. That is, until I saw them fly toward each other, hover for a moment, and then depart in opposite directions. It's something that I've never seen drones or planes do before, and it got me really suspicious. I began following one of them, and it kept variating between moving very quickly, slowing down, 
and hovering in midair. I kept on the trail of that one up until I saw two more on the opposite end of the horizon. I began chasing them down, one by one, trying to get videos and keeping notes on what I'd seen. The main thing that spooked me, aside from the weird movements, was the oblong shape of them. They were just far enough visually that I could only really see the shape through the horizontal row of blinking lights, of which there were three on each flying object. Each one would blink the same pattern, the red lights flashing one after another, and then a white flash at the end, occurring uniformly every few seconds. I only saw them do bizarre movements a handful of times, otherwise I was just chasing them as they sped by. There were at least five of them throughout my entire voyage, all around the town. I would truly love to believe that they were just regular aircraft, but every single thing about them was weird. I took a couple of videos, but they didn't really come out. My camera can't shoot that well in the dark. If anybody can point me in the direction of what these things might be, or what the light patterns might mean, or really anything at all, let me know. It's been haunting me all night. This happened three to four years ago, and I've been thinking about it recently. It was late one night, around 11.30 p.m., and I was driving home from my job at Sonic. I was taking U.S. Route 64 home, which is a fairly desolate stretch of road, with houses and farmland on either side. I was in my 99 Ford Explorer, and I was just driving along, around 65 to 70 miles per hour, with the radio on low volume. As I'm driving, through the sunroof comes a bright green ray of light that envelops the interior of my vehicle. This lasts for about two to three seconds. Then, it disappears without a trace. After that happened, I just sped up and got home as quickly as possible. I was only about five minutes away. That's really about all there was to it, but I was really freaked out. I have pondered and pondered, but I have no clue what that could have been. I wasn't tired because I woke up at around five or six that day, and I have no history of any illnesses that could have caused this. I wasn't on any medications. I've told a few people, and I don't think that they believe I'm lying. I've never been the kind to lie about that kind of thing, but no one can give me a solid answer either. Some have said maybe it was a laser, but I don't think there's any way a laser could completely cover my vehicle in green light like that. There was a farm that I was passing by, but it wasn't lit and there were no street lights. I have no idea what it was that I encountered. On the evening of September 7th, 2006, my friend Jen and I were driving home from a friend's house near to where the Big Air Radio Observatory used to be. It was somewhere around 10 p.m., near the corner of Cheshire Road and Route 23 between Delaware, Ohio, and Lewis Center, Ohio. We were driving down Route 23, heading south toward Lewis Center, when Jen saw a bright light very distant in the sky. We both jokingly said, it's probably a UFO. So we keep driving and we eventually lose sight and forget about the distant object in the sky. Then, as we're coming over the precipice of a hill, just beyond where the golf course is now, where the telescope once stood there, was an enormous glowing football-shaped UFO hanging right above our heads, steadily moving over top of Route 23, heading toward Lewis Center. It was the most frightening and awe-inspiring thing I have ever witnessed. We stopped on the side of the highway and got out of the car. It was the largest thing I've ever seen. I felt like an ant beneath the giant glowing boot. The object looked like it was engulfed in some orangish-reddish plasma, 
almost like what the surface of the sun looks like close up from space. It looked as though it had flames bubbling and churning within it. I tried to take a video with my Motorola Razor, but the phone just would not pick it up at all, even though it had been working just fine and had nearly a full charge. It slowly begins to back away from us a bit and begins floating toward the town of Lewis Center. We follow it back to Lewis Center, where my friends and I watch it for nearly an hour, and eventually it begins to gain altitude in a dizzying display of lights. Then it flashes and blasts it away in the blink of an eye, leaving behind a wispy blue teal vapor trail. I found out later on that the Big Ear Radio Observatory in Delaware, Ohio, was where they had received the WOW signal in 1977. This object took up a large portion of the visible sky as we came upon it. I'm an airman. I have been trained to observe and identify aircraft. I would estimate the object to be the size of an NFL football stadium, just floating above the tree line highway and houses and buildings. The object was witnessed by at least five people other than myself. As it was gaining altitude, glowing bluish purplish orbs began to cascade out of the main shaped object, one after the other. Each time they would appear, they would revolve around the main object, intensify until all I could see was a spinning blue glow around that main football stadium object. And then in the blink of an eye, it shot off into a flash of light in front of it, like the Enterprise going to warp speed leaving only a bluish trailing haze behind. The whole experience was the most profound thing to have ever happened to me in my lifetime up till that point. Thank you for hearing my account of what occurred. I thought I'd share a few stories that I heard from my ex-boyfriend's mom that I thought were pretty fascinating. We're all from the same reservation, so I can explain the setting pretty well. Basically, there's this one bush road that takes you from the reserve deep into the woods until you get to another town. But that stretch of dirt road goes on for about 45 minutes. I think it was an old logging road once, but now we just call it the limit. And we use that area of the forest for camping, fishing, ski-doo riding, and four-wheeler riding, stuff like that. It's also just a chill road to drive down with your friends. If you're from a small town, you know how it is. Anyway, she had two paranormal experiences on this particular road, which isn't entirely out of the ordinary. My dad has even had an experience on this road too. It's kind of known for all sorts of strange things happening, but it's fine. Nobody's scared of it. I still go drive down it to watch pretty sunsets. It's just chill like that. The first story is about a weird time loop. She and her cousin were driving down this road to go get some water, since there was also a natural spring around there. On their way back, their car stalls out and just won't start up again. This happened back in the 80s, so there weren't any cell phones you could use to call for help. So they started walking. They weren't too far, and they had plenty of daylight left, so it was fine. But as they're walking, they see another car stopped in the distance. They think, oh cool, we can get a ride from these guys. But as they get closer, they see that it's the same make and model of their car. They get even closer, and they realize that no, it's the same car. They're confused as heck, but can completely verify that it is their car by looking in the windows. The sweater she left in the back seat, the empty pop can her cousin was drinking out of. Everything inside was exactly as they had left it. And honestly, they just didn't know what to do. They hadn't turned off that dirt road at all. They hadn't even walked far enough to make it to another trail that they could turn off on. They thought it was weird, but figured they should just keep walking, as it's all they could do. They keep going, and sure enough, up ahead, down the road, 
there's a parked car, the same as before. This time, they are tripping out, and they run up to it, and yep, it is 100% their car again. Her cousin gets a stick from the woods and leaves it on the hood of the car, saying that if they keep walking and the same things happen, at least they can see if the stick would have been moved. They take off walking and it happens again. This time, the stick is gone. She described the feeling of being afraid that the time loop would just go on forever, but it didn't. The next time they walked down the road, they realized they were able to walk farther, and eventually they made it back to the reservation. They got help and towed the car, but never got an explanation or figured out what happened with the car and the time loop. She has no idea why the stick that they left on the hood of the car disappeared, and I don't have any idea either. The second story is about a UFO sighting she had with some friends on that same road. This happened years later, after the first incident, maybe in the early 90s, and it was during the summertime. She and her friends were riding around in a car, having a few beers, not the driver obviously, and listening to music. One of their friends commented that there must be a four-wheeler in the woods, but that it's weird since there were no trails there. They look over to see what he's talking about, and all they can see are these white lights emanating from deep in the woods. They could see that there's a source of light, but they couldn't see the object itself through the trees. The driver slows down and turns down the music. She says that there wasn't anything too alarming about what they were seeing at that point, but that there was just this feeling that something wasn't right. And she said that everyone felt it because all of them got quiet as they looked out the windows, which were wide open. When things got quiet, they were able to hear a low humming. She had a hard time describing the humming, just that it was very low, but that it almost felt like ringing in the ears. They all heard it. They were silent looking at the lights, but then whatever it was shot up directly into the sky and they saw a UFO. This was so long ago that she told me about it and that it happened that I wish I could describe more about how it looked but she did say that the second it shot into the sky, it changed into all sorts of colors that seemed to rotate around the craft. It paused right above the tree line for a few seconds, and then it just took off right into the horizon, lights changing again when it moved. Those are her experiences. It's weird too, that everyone's experiences on this road are so vastly different. There are some sightings of creatures from our Algonquin folklore. There's Bigfoot sightings, UFO sightings, time loops. And then I have other friends who just heard really creepy singing that got closer and closer with no source. We also just found out that our entire reservation is sitting atop a huge uranium deposit. Apparently it's the largest in our province, but I'm not sure. Nuclear mining companies keep trying to build mines and we keep refusing. I'm wondering if that has something to do with it, because the amount of paranormal things that happened around here is pretty wild. This Sunday gone, my girlfriend and I, who live in Adelaide, Australia, had just gone on a dinner date. She is a 26-year-old female and I am a 24-year-old female. We went to her house to drop off her doggy bag. Then we drove back toward my house, southward. About halfway between our houses, I noticed three lights in the sky in a perfect triangle. It was very odd and the lights were fairly obvious in the dark sky, especially because there were also stars visible, so the lights were very visibly different. They were a lot brighter and bigger, though not by much. I pointed it out to her, and immediately she said, holy cow, what the heck is that? At first I thought I might be seeing things, but when she reacted, I knew it wasn't just my eyes playing tricks. 
We quickly noticed that the lights were moving at about the same speed we were and had started to flash green and red sporadically. We decided to follow it for as long as we feasibly could. It was a bit of a thrill, if I'm being completely honest, following the mystery lights in the sky, but it also didn't last very long. Maybe five minutes past my house, the lights took a turn, sped up, and just disappeared. We pulled over to see if we could find it again, but we didn't have any luck. We kept talking about how strange and cool the whole thing was. I am telling my story here to see if anyone else has seen something like this, or has any ideas of what it could have been besides a UFO. Our first thought was a helicopter, but there's no realistic way for a perfect triangle of lights to come off of that, and they moved way too quickly. If anyone has ideas, I'd love to hear them. Back in 2011, on a family vacation in Jamaica, my siblings and I were sitting on the beach stargazing. That is, until we noticed this one point of light that was moving unnaturally and without sound. It had the brightest color, and it looked kind of like a dim star, except that it was moving in circular and figure eight type patterns. For perspective, the patterns were no bigger in diameter than the Little Dipper's cup. It was moving with the pattern and speed reminiscent of when one uses a laser pointer to get a cat's attention. 15 to 20 minutes after noticing it, it just faded away. Could this have been a weather balloon? It definitely wasn't a plane, a helicopter, or a satellite. At least, none like the ones I've ever seen. I'm trying to find images of weather balloons from the ground at night, but every image is too close up, or simply doesn't look at all like what I saw. So call me crazy, and I'm sure some people will, that's okay. But I swear this happened to me when I was 16. What's weirder is that it happened on the same night that I had an alien abduction dream. My mom wasn't home. She worked nights looking after the elderly at a nearby retirement home. I lived a normal teenage night playing video games, messaging friends, and watching TV. I went to my room and went to sleep. I had an extremely intense nightmare that I was abducted by aliens. All I remembered is looking up in my dream and seeing my whole field of vision turn completely white as I simultaneously heard this really loud buzzing or humming sound. I wake up drenched in sweat, heart pounding, and it's around 5.30 in the morning. But what's weirder is that I'm not in my bed. Confused as heck, I look around the room and to my surprise, I'm somehow in my mom's room, frozen in fear and confused. I tried to figure out what was going on. After about 20 to 30 minutes, I finally calmed myself down enough to get up. So I get up and when I go downstairs, I can see through the door to our backyard which is made of glass, and I can clearly see that the gate to our backyard is wide open. It's an old-fashioned wooden gate, and it hadn't been opened in years because it was covered in vines and was always left locked. I go to investigate, and as I go to unlock the back door, the door handle goes down with no resistance at all, and I realize, crap, this door is already unlocked, which only added to how shook up I was, to be honest. So, hesitantly, I go into the backyard anyway, and I look at the gate, which is also open. I look for footprints or boot marks, thinking that somebody must have kicked the gate open. Nothing. I look more closely. The old rusty lock to the gate, which hasn't been opened in years, is still there. Not bent. Not damaged. Not broken at all. Just a bit rusty. The same as it's always been. 
I lock that gate back up and look around the yard. Nothing's missing. I go back in the house. I lock the back door and take a real good look around and nothing's missing. I go back to my bedroom and double check that I did get in my bed that night and yep, I definitely did. The bed's still messy. I thought, did I sleepwalk? Did I go into the yard and then somehow go get in my mom's bed? I checked the carpet and floors in the house, which certainly would have been dirty and muddy if I had walked into the yard and then back in. And nothing. I called my mom and explained everything that had happened, and I asked if she had messed with the gate or unlocked it lately. She confirmed that she hadn't, and was just as surprised and confused as I was. To this day, I have no explanation as to what happened that night. Just to confirm, I was very into sports as a teenager. I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't take substances, and I was completely sober. I also remember feeling oddly terrified of the sky as it began to get dark out that evening. I remember sometimes that if I was playing football or soccer with friends after that, and it started getting dark, instead of walking home like I usually would, I'd kind of hustle. I'd constantly look up at the sky, feeling fear, and I remember a number of times where I decided to just run home instead because I was scared, even months later. All of this still confuses me, even to this day. I've had over a week to think about this, and I can't come up with a satisfactory, rational explanation. I live in the north coast of Northern Ireland, not far from the Giant's Causeway, just to give some reference that people might know. Just over a week ago, I was sitting watching television with my wife. I sit by one of the windows sometimes because there's a plug-in for my laptop there. My wife was sitting on the other sofa, so she couldn't see out of this particular window. It was around 8.30 and perfectly dark outside. If I looked out, I could see the lights of our local town, Ballymoney. It's tiny, more of a village, really. Just as at the scene, we're about three miles out, surrounded by farmland. Anyway, I'm watching TV and occasionally glancing out the window when suddenly I see this bright light just over the fields. It's multicolored, and it kind of blooms, growing larger. At first I thought it was a firework, which would have been bizarre enough in late March, in the middle of the lockdown. Except it's too slow, if that makes sense. It brightened into maybe three different colors. It was hard to judge distances in the dark, but if I had to guess, I'd say that it was two acres or more away and larger than a family car, hanging maybe 80 to 100 feet up, pretty low. Eventually, it faded and disappeared again, not behaving anything like a firework and far too large to be a flare. I said at the time that I thought I had seen somebody letting off fireworks. A few minutes later, I glanced out again, and there's a smaller light roving around in the same spot, but it vanished almost the moment I looked at it. This light was maybe a third of the size of the original and was moving left to right. I've thought about it ever since. The annual Ballymoney Town firework display is much further away and we can always hear it from home. Yet this was soundless. Helicopters and drones don't have lights like that. And again, if there had been a chopper out there so low and so close, we'd have heard it. A drone still strikes me as most likely. We wouldn't have heard it inside the house, and I guess it might have been rigged with powerful lights, but they would have had to have been incredibly powerful. So, I don't know. I've never, ever seen or heard a drone over that area in the daytime, and I'm out there all the time. Honestly, I think maybe I saw a UFO. No lights in the sky were reported in local news or on social media, though, and I haven't seen anything since, so who knows? I 
can't quite understand this one myself, so maybe you guys can help. This was on the 11th of July, 2019. My boyfriend and I, he's now my husband, were camping in the mountains, very high up. This area is so high up and remote that there is virtually no light pollution, so you can see almost every star in the sky when it's a clear night, like this one was. We were just relaxing, staring at the stars, usual romantic things you do in the mountains, when we started noticing the stars acting very differently. They appeared to zigzag and go upward, almost like they were playing with one another, weaving near each other and away again in circular motions. We were just amazed by it all and couldn't take our eyes off the sky. This went on for about two to three solid hours. That wasn't the strangest part though. Where we were camping, there was a clear view of an opening between two other mountains. At around 2 a.m., maybe three, I noticed this bright light between the two mountains. It was really bright, so I nudged my partner to look over too. We were staring at this massive white yellow looking star go upward quickly, then noticed it was going toward us. My partner is a man that isn't easily scared, and this really scared him, to the point that he nearly broke my nose trying to hide fully in the tent with both of us screaming as this star just stopped right above us. When it was above us, right before we both panicked, it seemed to have a diamond type shape and it was super bright. But that isn't the strangest part. When we were in the tent, the light didn't shine through the tent. This thing didn't make a single noise. So it wasn't a drone or anything like that. It was far too big. And what seemed like seconds later, we were both calm looking at the stars again, like nothing happened until sunrise. If both of us hadn't experienced this, if it was just one of us, I could try to make an excuse for it but we both confirm each other's stories and saw the same exact thing, and I can't explain it. To top it all off, when I'm talking about it, or in this case typing, it feels like I'm lying and my partner feels the same way, like it never happened. It feels like I'm making it up, and the more I try to remember about that night, the more I can't remember. And he feels the same way too. It's like whenever I go to tell my story, something is actively trying to get me to believe that I didn't see what I saw or to stop talking about it. Has anyone else ever experienced anything like this? Does anyone have some answers? I'd love to know. Back when I was a child, I had a weird UFO experience. My dad had bought a new Ford truck after his beloved Bronco had to go. We went on a visit to my grandma's place on the reservation. We picked her up and we all went fishing together and had a really nice picnic. I remember that I had this really cool Disney swimming pool. Anyway, we were all driving home when this huge aircraft of some kind appeared on the way to San Carlos, Arizona. It was not on some secluded dirt or back road. It was on Interstate 70 between Globe and Peridot. It was huge. It was like the size of a Zeppelin. It had lights all along its length, which flashed blue, red, yellow, and green in about one second. We were stunned. It sat there for quite a long time in one spot, we passed an ambulance coming the other way, and also a police officer who pulled over in our lane looking up at this thing. I was very young, but I was there with my parents and my grandma. My grandma has since passed on, but my parents still remember it. My mom calls the lights on the side of the UFO windows 
that to me they just looked like a row of extremely bright lights. It stayed stationary for a long while before suddenly moving south to the top of Mount Turnbull. Then it went straight upwards and disappeared into the sky. The moon was out and the only clouds were above the summit. I think about this experience from time to time and sometimes I doubt myself as to whether or not any of it happened. But there were three adults in the truck who saw it and the police officer on the side of the road too. I wish I could find the other people who saw it and ask if they remember it too. The year was 1976. We were living in the Middle East. My father was in the secret police called Sabak. It was common that a helicopter would land in our backyard and pick my dad up for a mission or something like that. One night, I saw a bright light and it got my attention. I thought it was my dad returning home on the helicopter landing in the backyard, but I guess it wasn't. But I don't remember anything after the light got really close. I woke up in bed the next day. Well, I thought it was the next day but I found out that a few days had actually passed. My father was standing next to my bed with two well-dressed men. One was American, I think, and the other was a translator. He introduced one of them as Mr. John and told me they wanted to talk to me. I was confused and they asked a lot of weird questions. Soon after my dad took me, my brother and sister moved us to the UK. We lived there for three years until my next strange encounter. Once again, one of the original two men, Mr. John, with a new guy, questioned me once more. A few months later, on the 4th of July, 1979, we moved to the US and we have lived here ever since. As time went by, I asked my dad questions about the moving and the men questioning me, but he would never talk about it until recently when he was diagnosed with dementia. The things he said were incredible, too incredible to be true. I thought it was the drugs or the disease. I thought that's pretty cool if it was true, but there's no way. Well, he's in a nursing home here in Laguna Hills, California, and I went to go visit him. When I walked into his room, to my surprise, he had a visitor, a man, not just any man, but the one that had met with me twice before, a face that I'll always remember. The only problem was that the last time I saw him was 35 to 40 years prior, and he hadn't aged a day. I was older than him. He saw me, pulled his cap down to cover his face, and left without a word. I asked my dad who he was, and he said to me, that's Mr. John, and remember, by safe moon. I can't make heads or tails of it to this day. This isn't my story, but it's something that happened to my parents just a bit ago. They live in Western New York, upstate, and are really open to all kinds of supernatural stuff. My dad has reason to believe in aliens for reasons other than this encounter, but that's a story for another day. It might be a good time to add here that my parents do not use drugs or alcohol, and they're very sharp as far as memory, cognizance, and intuition go. I'm going to copy and paste a message that my mom sent me and just read it for you, if that's okay. I just figured I'd put some feelers out there and see if anybody else has experienced something similar or has any sort of explanation. Quote, Last weekend, we were coming back from Jamestown. Dad and I saw a freaking UFO or something. Between Randolph and Steenberg, there was this huge, really bright light blinking on and off in the sky directly in front of us, and it was falling from the sky. 
except it was shooting directly downward. I thought it was a falling star at first, but after it blinked repeatedly, I thought, that is not a falling star. And even though I thought that it might have been a plane, I knew that it was too bright and going too fast to be one. Plus, as far as I know, planes don't make a habit of going straight down. Then, all of a sudden, it was gone. Like, mid-sky. And I thought, well, it must have gone behind a hill or a mountain or into the trees. So, right then, I said, did you see that? And Dad goes, what the F was that? He said that he was thinking the same things that I was. And at the same time, we both noticed there are no hills. There is no mountain. There's nothing for this thing to go behind. It was just cornfields and open space. This thing just disappeared. Next thing you know, it was directly behind us, mid-sky. And it shot directly upward, back up into the sky. I was looking out my rearview mirror and it lit up the whole sky, like an aura all around. But the brightness of it was still really bright white. Dad was turned around watching it, and it started following us. We had that same eerie feeling we had when we saw the Bigfoot that one time, and we were saying, what the F is that? All of a sudden, it just disappeared. They have no idea what it was that they experienced. And yes, they do also have a Bigfoot sighting, but that's a story for another day as well. Either way, they've been trying to figure out what in the world they saw. So I thought I'd share their story and see if anybody else had any ideas. I'll start out by saying that I've seen my fair share of strange things in the skies, but one memory will always stand out amongst the others. I've done the math and I believe it was fall of 2005. I was in sixth grade, outside on the phone with my first boyfriend. I'd say it was between six to eight o'clock Eastern time at night. It was dark outside and only our back porch light was on. I was talking up a storm and I was watching my two dogs roam the backyard. Out of nowhere, it was like somebody turned on a blue light above us, the dogs and I. It was a bright, beautiful electric blue. I immediately looked up and saw what I can best describe as the shape of an eye, but perfectly symmetrical in the same blue color. It was lined with an almost holographic looking light a constantly changing rainbow of colors. I stared for maybe two seconds before it closed up, leaving only the colorful outline. It immediately shot to the left like a shooting star and disappeared. In shock, I told my boyfriend I would call him back and I immediately ran to my parents who were folding clothes in the bedroom. I shouted at them, I just saw aliens. They laughed at first and told me to stop joking, but my father knows my eyes. He saw my panic and quickly changed the subject. I've never forgotten this moment. I can still see it so clearly, even to this day. What did I see? Why did I see it? Can anyone help? I'm going to try to make this short by stating just the simple facts of what I witnessed during two separate incidents. Incident number one. This is going back to the late summer of either 1989 or 1990. I was at work with two co-workers near Rhinebeck, New York. One of my co-workers was outside smoking when he called to me and another co-worker to come outside and see something. When we exited the front door, we saw the classic V-shaped craft hovering above a tree in the front yard. It was directly above the tree, which was just about the height of the building, two stories, so maybe 30 feet. 
I ran up to the tree, which put the craft those same 30 feet above me. It had five to seven white lights, with the largest at the bottom center of the V, with the others running up from it. It made no noise, and even though whatever it was blocked out the sky, I couldn't make out a structure or body. It very slowly and silently started heading across the street and over a hill. My two co-workers went inside, but I remained in case it came back. It did. When it reappeared from behind the hill, the shape had changed. The lights were now in a straight line and were more of an orange color. It headed back toward my location, changing shape as it moved. The light formations just kept shifting. It took on the shape of a diamond, then an X, then back to a V, before it moved directly over the building. It kept going in that direction and then headed south and out of sight. Incident number two. I was at home. Having recently moved into a new apartment, things weren't all organized and my new bed had not arrived, so I fell asleep on the floor. I should also mention here that I am an incredibly heavy sleeper. During the night, I woke up from a sound sleep and sat straight up. This was something that I had never done. Anyway, the corner of the room was lit up with what looked like dozens of very pale, multicolored lights. Staring at them, I noticed a shadow of a figure out of the corner of my right eye. It looked as though it was moving closer, and then, well, that's all I remember. The next day I woke up not immediately remembering what I had seen. All of the clocks in the house were either stopped at or flashing at 3 a.m., even the VCR flashed that time and was also playing even though there was no tape in it. I had to unplug everything that had an electronic clock in the apartment in order to reset and fix things. It wasn't until I was doing that that I remembered what had taken place. I've been told that I should try hypnosis regarding the second incident, but I'm not really sure that I trust the practice. One of my friends is actually a licensed hypnotherapist, or whatever you call them, but I still don't know. In all honesty, I don't know if I want to know. In my life, I've had three UFO experiences. For context, I am a 40-year-old male living in the southeastern United States. I will focus on the second one since it's the most unquestionable event of the three. In 2015, I was living in Lexington, South Carolina, which is right outside of Columbia, the state capital. On October 5th of that year, we experienced a thousand-year flood that shut everything down and caused major damage throughout the Lexington, Columbia area. My job requires me to be at work at 3.30 or 4 in the morning, same job I have now as I had then. My job was shut down on account of the flood, but my great and wonderful company decided that I needed to be there the next day to assess the damage, despite the fact that I would have to drive through a flood. Anyway, I woke up at 2, went downstairs, made some coffee, and per my usual morning routine, I stepped outside onto the back porch to have the coffee and enjoy the stillness of the twilight hours in solitude. It was lightly raining, not enough to mind it, and the sky was totally overcast with low clouds. That's important. We were in the suburbs about two blocks off of one of the main drags through town, Sunset Boulevard, 378. We weren't in the sticks, but we weren't metropolitan either. The sky was a slight orange from the streetlights reflecting off of the cloudy sky. Our house was at the end of a cul-de-sac. There were tall, lined trees lining the back and sides of the property. So I'm drinking my coffee, leaning on the banister of the deck, and in front of me in the sky, I can see something moving in my direction. My first thought was, oh, it's an owl, or some kind of large bird, judging by the shape. But slowly, 
As the shape got bigger and bigger, I realized that it looked smaller because it was far away, and once it was overhead, it came into clear view. It moved slowly, but it all happened so fast at the same time. It was overhead, over the house, over the pine trees, but under the clouds. It was a black triangle with a textured pattern on the bottom, the only side I could see. The texture is difficult to describe. Adidas makes this soccer shoe called the Nemesis. If you Google it, that's kind of how it looked. Embossed lines, perfectly black. The trees were probably about 40 to 50 feet tall, so I estimate that this thing was probably 60 to 80 feet off the ground, pretty low. It was about the size of your traditional Walmart parking lot. It made absolutely zero noise whatsoever. There were no lights. It moved as with intention, with no deviation in direction, like an air hockey puck perfectly gliding on a fixed trajectory. It was slow, maybe faster than a bicycle, but slower than a car. I don't know, 20 miles per hour if I had to guess. Once it made it over the house, I chased it through the gate on the side of the house, yelling to myself at 2.30 in the morning, what the F was that? What the F was that? In the front yard, I was just looking at it. It just quietly and discreetly skated off into the darkness, perfectly straight on, totally indifferent. I regret not getting any pictures, it just didn't occur to me. It came and went so quickly. In the moment, I just didn't know what to think. It's like my brain had nothing to reference against what I was seeing. It wasn't a bird. It was definitely not a plane. I thought maybe it was a drone, but it was so big and totally silent. It was difficult to process in the moment, but I know what I saw. There's no question about it. Anything outside of your scope of understanding or knowledge is the definition of alien. If I were to make up a story about seeing a UFO, a black silent triangle is probably the last thing I would have come up with. I wonder if the flood had anything to do with its presence. It seemed too wild for it to not be connected somehow. The third encounter I had in my life was when I was stargazing with my son on the same deck at the same house. We have since moved though. I was playing with the Google Sky app because I'm lame and uh, it took a while to get a smartphone. So I was amazed at all the apps, even though they'd been out forever. Anyway, we were finding stars on a clear night and then identifying them with the app. One particularly bright star stood out to the east of us and I overlaid the phone with the star. The app showed nothing in the sky in that region. We calibrated it as well. As soon as I said, hey, there's no star there, it zoomed across the horizon, stopped, then zoomed up, then blinked out like an old tube TV turning off. Its movements were very smooth and precise. If I were to hold up a yardstick in front of my field of vision with my arms extended, this thing went from one end to the other in a second. I couldn't tell you what that is in actual distance, but it must have been an incredible distance to travel that quickly and to stop on a dime and then redirect and disappear. My son was too young at the time to think much of it. I had heard from the wacky world of UFO conspiracies that UFOs can tell if you notice them, and I had always thought that that was baloney. But I have to admit, this thing tore off the second I noticed it and said something out loud. Pretty weird stuff. One night while driving home, I saw a huge bright light, probably a little larger than a full moon, straight ahead of me in the sky. It changed colors from green to yellow, red, blue, and then two other similar lights showed up next to it. They changed colors for about 10 to 15 seconds. Then they all became one big white light and completely disappeared. Then they all came back, 
changed colors more and then disappeared for good. I've just never seen anything like this, but I was wondering if anyone else had similar sightings. When I was in middle school, seventh grade to be exact, we lived in this house that had a basement that would not stay locked, even with a bolt lock. Every night, we would lock that basement door, and every morning, we would wake up to find it standing wide open. The basement was a dirt basement, so my mom had in the back of her head that somebody was probably murdered in the house and then buried in the basement. But if that were true, none of us were going to go down there and find out. After all, my mother was a single mother of two young boys. In the room where the basement door was, you would often hear muffled voices, people having conversations, but they were always muffled like they were far away or whispering. However, you could distinctly make out a male voice and a female voice. My mother was a nurse who worked night shifts at the local hospital, so on the weekends I would always have a friend spend the night. On a Saturday night, while myself, my brother, and my friend were sitting in the living room playing Sega, yes, this was ages ago, we heard a woman scream coming from the room with the basement. My mother would go to work at about 3 a.m. and work until about noon the following day, sometimes later. So, when we heard the woman scream, it was about 4.30 a.m. on a weekend night, with just us boys alone in the house. After the scream, we quickly turned off the television and Sega, and ran for my mother's room, where we all decided to sleep on her queen-sized bed while she was at work. The next morning, about 9 a.m., a few hours before my mother got home from work, my friend said that my mom came home last night, even though she was supposed to be at work. According to him, he woke up and saw a woman standing at my mother's bedroom door. After he saw her standing there, she told him, Go back to bed. Everything's okay. About ten years later, during our family Christmas, we were all talking about the same house with the creepy basement and its basement dwellers. Finally, after all those years, my mother revealed to my brother and I that she woke up several times to see someone standing at the doorway of her bedroom. She said she didn't want to tell us because it would scare us. However, according to my mother, she saw several times a woman standing at her bedroom door. It gives me goosebumps to this day. I will never forget this Wednesday night as long as I live. It was the summer before seventh grade, sometime in July. It was Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. The evening before, my family had watched the old school show Unsolved Mysteries. I awoke in the night, lying on my right side, awake but my eyes still shut, completely silent. None of us ran fans back then to aid in sleep. I was awake and basically waiting to fall back asleep again. However, I decided to open my eyes. On the right side of my bed, right there, was a being seemingly fixated on a plush bear that I kept in bed with me. And this being fit all of the descriptions that I've always heard or watched on television of an alien. Shorter, pale gray skin, and those awful eyes, huge, black, and slanted, staring at my bear, right by my bed. Honestly, I cannot put into words how I felt right at that moment. I was only just about 12. 
At some point, I pulled my covers over my head and felt an awful rushing through my body of super warm, then cool, then warm again. Only later in my life did I understand that I was most likely feeling shock. I couldn't scream. I felt frozen. Too scared to scream, maybe. What if I did scream? My mother and stepfather and two brothers would hear me. What the heck would they do if they came running into my room and saw this thing? What would it do? Is it going to kill me? Abduct me? What if it already had and it was returning me? All of these thoughts plus a million more just raced through my young mind. It's awful just recounting it all. Again, how could I ever forget something traumatic like this? So, being such a brave 11-year-old, and after what felt like 12 hours, I decided to try and scare it. I decided that I would thrash my legs up and down from under my covers as hard as I could. I know, horrifying, right? I was so petrified, though. So, I did this, and then remained under my covers, just waiting. Nothing happened. So I stayed under the covers. This had to be at least close to going on two hours from when I first opened my eyes and saw this thing. As I lay wide awake, I heard a noise. To this day, I still can't explain exactly how it sounded. The sound felt as if it surrounded me and was coming from outside. It was crisp, clean sounding, maybe mechanical, but maybe not lasting only about two seconds, a sound that I had definitely never heard before and have never heard since. As soon as I heard the sound, something in my mind told me, oh, they're gone. As crazy as it sounds, I firmly believed that the sound was their transportation leaving. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of the night or early morning. It took me so long to confide in my family about this terribly scary incident. Of course, they did not believe me. However, now, from time to time, my mother will mention it and suggest that maybe that's why I suffer from insomnia now. Very well could be. This is the first time that I've shared this story publicly, though, and it would be reassuring to hear any other stories of similar happenings. I was 10 years old. My brother and I were the last ones off the bus from school every day. We were nearing my house, which is in the Midwest countryside. Lots of cows and trees and fields, stuff like that. Anyway, about a mile away from my house, I look out the window and I see an orange blimp in the sky. Standard American football shaped blimp. Surprisingly, I didn't think anything of it. Because a day or so before that, a bunch of kids and I at recess saw a blue blimp in the sky. I watched it, thought it was cool to see a blimp this far outside of town, especially near my house, and wasn't about to think another thing of it. After a few seconds, the blimp shifted from a football shape to a star, literally just shrunk before my eyes into a tiny, shiny dot that resembled a star in the night sky. Except it wasn't a star. It was just a blimp a second ago. Not even two seconds after it shifted, it launched even farther into the sky, shot down to its original height, and then shot completely off into space. It was the most bizarre thing I had ever experienced. I was a quiet kid, but being the last kid on the bus besides my brother, I shouted about it. When I got off the bus, I ran to my mother to tell her, like a crazy old man yelling about the end times. My mother said that I was crazy, naturally, and I never told my dad, because my mom shut me down pretty hard and it killed my mood. Fast forward years later, shortly after I turned 22, my dad and I took a short road trip to go pick up a car he bought halfway across the state. 
We talked about a lot and somehow got on the topic of UFOs. He told me that when he was 12 or 13, he and his brothers were playing down by a creek near their house, which by the way, was only a few miles away from our house. They saw an orange football shaped object in the sky. I was absolutely blown away when he said that. My father is skeptical and doesn't believe in this kind of stuff, ever. But when I shared my story, he paused and said that it was very odd to have seen the exact same thing behave the exact same way more than 30 years apart. My first ever encounter was when I was around seven and my family was all around the table. I will never forget the order we sat in, nor what happened. My mother sat in front of me while my sister was beside me. Father was next to mom and my back was turned to the kitchen. My brother sat next to my mom in front of my sister, a family of five. We were eating and then the window straight across from my dad at the right of my direction shone with a very bright light. Everyone seemed frozen, but my mom and I. My mom told me to run, run and hide. My mind was blanked out and I didn't think at all. I just got up and ran to my mother's room where I felt my mind was telling me would be the safest place. Once I entered my mom's room, I went straight to her king size bed with a huge light underneath. There was nothing under my mom's bed because she kept everything in bins at the foot of her bed and closet. The foot of my mother's bed was facing the door while the head was against a wall next to two big windows. Then it was her closet across from where you were laying so you could see it. Then the bathroom was right next to that. Once I got under the bed, I saw that the light was still on. I looked through the cracks and it was quiet. And then I saw about six sets of feet that were not human. Then I felt them start to surround me. One almost touched me by getting on the bed and reaching down through the crack. There were two through the crack, three in front, not showing their faces, but trying to reach further under. One was at the foot of the bed. Then I looked near me and saw a face that was gray and had huge eyes. I felt like I couldn't move, but when I looked closer, I saw a whole galaxy in its eyes. It was so pretty how the colors merged like a sunset, and for a second I almost forgot it was an eye. Then it moved or flinched and I came to my senses. I looked around and they were still moving to get me while the one that I looked at was staying still and looking at the closet. Then I heard the closet door opened and I saw Nega. Nega was my childhood imaginary friend that taught me the greater lessons than what is now being slowly forgotten. After seeing her, I relaxed and I saw them try to fight. And then the tall, gray-like humanoids were gone. I looked at Nega and then I looked at the bathroom to see another creature that had orange eyes that I know commonly stays in my mother's bathroom. Nega hushed me and then I seemed to have forgotten what had happened until I turned 14. After this, I just carried on with life. I never saw my imaginary friend again, but old friend still lingers from time to time in my memories.